to do yet. And we typically oversubscribe the telescope because we don't want any downtime. So we'll award, we will award around four times the amount of telescope time that we actually have available. Proposals are given a ranking where a priority is the highest and means we'll try as hard as we can to run your observations. And the lowest C is basically filler time if the conditions are too poor for a high priority or there's gaps in the schedule. So if you are awarded time on the VLA, you'll then work with one of our data analysts to write a script, which is a set of computer instructions that automatically tell the dishes how to move and when and where. Then the script goes into a queue and our schedulers and algorithms arrange the observations based on the time of day and year, so which targets are above the horizon and by the configuration and by weather considerations like wind speed. And this is called dynamic scheduling as opposed to fixed scheduling, which is what we did for roughly the first 30 years of the VLA's operation. This would be where you would observe uh, where your observation is scheduled for a specific day at a specific time. And if something goes wrong, well, you're out of luck. But ultimately the operators make the final decision on which operations get run. And you'll get a chance to ask Sylvia, one of our operators, questions in a few minutes. So once your data is taken, within minutes, it's sent to our offices in Socorro, where it's checked by our data analysts, who are our last line of defense to ensure that the data is of the highest quality before it gets sent to the astronomers who propose for it. And once it's set to the astronomers, they own those data. It's proprietary for one year. And then those astronomers can do their analysis and write their journal papers without anyone else seeing. But after one year, that data goes into a public archive, and it's fair game for anyone who wants to use it. So all of the data ever collected by the VLA that's older than one year is publicly available on our website. So even if you weren't awarded time on the VLA and you can still look in our archives and see if someone in the past observed what you're interested in, maybe miss something. And that is one of the great benefits of public science. So does anybody have any questions? We are going to go through the Q&A window um, and uh, we'll probably pick some of the higher voted questions. Just a reminder to folks um, to, to keep the Q&A window for questions, uh, keep your shout outs and your alternate theories of gravity in the chat window. Um, and uh, I guess let's go through and uh, pick out some questions. All right, so um, one question we have is how does the resolution compare to telescopes in orbit? So that's a pretty good question. So a lot of times when we can, we do build telescopes out in space because the atmosphere of the earth does interfere with the light that we're getting from space uh, to some degree, even if we try to lessen that as much as we can. But obviously the best way to lessen it is to not have the telescopes be on earth. Luckily, radio telescopes don't have that problem as much as some others do. So we can still, have the radio telescopes here on uh, the surface of the earth. We try to build them in high elevation uh, locations so that where the atmosphere is a little bit thinner so we can lessen that problem and also in dry locations on the earth so we can minimize that problem some more because moisture in the air can interfere with the light coming from space. So um, we it still does cause um, some issues, but, and it's probably not quite as good as if we had it out in space, but with radio telescopes, we can still make it work pretty well. Really the worst problem that we have is if it gets really cloudy, there are certain wavelengths or frequencies that we don't want to use because that's where uh, the interference would be worse. That's right. Uh, in, uh, in optical astronomy, uh, visible light astronomy, we would say that our observations are seeing limited, which means we are limited by the conditions of the atmosphere. But in radio astronomy, we are diffraction limited, which means we are limited by the optics of our telescope. And we are limited by the distance between our two furthest antennas or by our longest baseline. What else do we have here? Another upvoted one here. The amount of data the VLA receives is clearly uh, enormous. I assure you, I assume you store the data stream for future reference, but that would take an astronomical storage system. The question then is how much storage do you currently use and plan for in the future? Yeah, that is a really, really good question. Um, so the, the computational power of our correlator 
is is pretty massive. It's about ten trillion. Oh, I think uh, the video got cut off. Um, <laughs> floating point operations for sec per second. Uh, Tyler, you got muted. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Tyler, Tyler, you're muted. You want to unmute? I don't know how that that happened, but um, it keeps saying go. the host has muted me. Why do you keep muting me? <laughs> oh, hmm. uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, all right. Um, in terms of the like daily amount of data that we actually get, um, it would fill uh, like a thousands of iPhones. Um, you can think of it that way um, in a single day in terms of the amount of data we store. We measure it in terabytes, trillions of bytes. Um, it's pretty massive data stored on hard drives or magnetic tapes, um, but uh, we, we store it, we keep it in our archives um, for, for the, the astronomy community to, to use it. Okay, and so um, then what was the frequency range and, uh, and bandwidth? So the, the range of frequencies is uh, 1 to 50 gigahertz, which in wavelengths of 1 gigahertz is uh, uh, th six uh, or three uh, centimeters, and uh, 50 gigahertz is six millimeters. And we then actually do, we do go... I just had one thing to add. We actually do go a little bit lower than one gigahertz. Um, we, we go down to about 50 megahertz. If you look at the, the picture of the VLA antennas that's shown under there uh, on the screen there, um, under the primary focus where there's this sort of spherical reflector um, at, at the top point of the antennas, there are two, um, there are two feeds there. One is a center fed dipole and one is a end-fed J-pole um, feed that, that measures the low frequencies. Um, you have to use a different type of optics, which is basically just wires at the very, very low frequencies. So we actually can go down to about 50 megahertz. And then uh, how do you deal with interference from satellites? <laughs> I'm gonna take that one or shall I? <laughs> um, well, honestly, one answer is we we sort of do and sort of don't. <laughs> honestly, we um, there's nothing we can really do in terms of the satellites uh, broadcasting at certain frequencies. Like we can't um, we can't quite so much as get rid of it as much as we just block it out. So we throw out the the data, we know exactly which frequencies these different satellites broadcast in. So we know like, okay, that huge spike that, that we're getting at um, whatever this frequency is, X gigahertz, this is coming from a satellite. So this isn't real data. And so we know to just toss that data out and not actually use it. So unfortunately that does mean that there are some frequencies that are just harder to observe in <laughs> because we have, uh, where the we they're constantly being drowned out by uh, by the satellites, and it's unfortunately uh, not going to be getting any better with all of these SpaceX launches lately. But I mean, we are in discussion with some of the satellite companies uh, to agree on ways to mitigate um, the harm their transmissions can cause, um, and some of them, uh, like SpaceX, for example, has has agreed to cooperate, and so they've signed some memorandum of understanding with us um, that they, you know, might turn off their satellite transmissions when the satellite is over a radio observatory. Um, but there are also some protected uh, radio frequencies, like for example, um, uh, around 1421 megahertz, where the uh, molecular hydrogen spectral line is. That is very, very important to astronomers mapping structure in our galaxy and in others. So that is protected by uh, by the U.S. government for specifically for radio astronomy. Oh, here's another good one too. What type of conditions prevent observations like wind speed, electrical storms, uh, geomagnetic storms? So yeah, wind speeds are uh, one condition for sure that can affect um, our 
observations, if we have wind speeds of 35 miles per hour or higher, and not just a gust, but consistently like for going on for several minutes, the antennas are programmed to stop observing and stow themselves. What you see in this picture is what the antennas look like when they're stowed, they're in the bird bath position and they're pointed straight up. So uh, that means that the antenna is currently not taking observations. So if it gets windy enough, uh, they will automatically do that. They each have um, two anemometers which measure wind speeds on opposite sides of the dishes. And what can be interesting too is when we're in our larger configurations and the antennas are spread further apart, some of them may be experiencing higher wind speeds than other because they're spread out by miles. So there might be some that have to stop observing and stow themselves and then others that continue chugging along and running. So that looks pretty interesting when that happens because you see some of them start to stow and the others are just still pointing at their objects. Okay, um, so we've got a few questions. Yeah, so what are the top three discoveries made? Like just what are some of the biggest discoveries that the VLA has made? One of the, one of the big, I mean, one of the main things that, that the VLA has been used to study is, is radio galaxies um, and, and looking at um, quasars, active galactic nuclei, um, jets powered in uh, in other galaxies by uh, a central black hole emitting, you know, pow powering uh, a, a, a jet that outshines the galaxy itself by, by thousands and thousands of times. Um, so that's one, that's one thing that, that the VLA has certainly been used for. Recently, I believe it was in 2015, the VLA uh, was part of a group of observatories um, across the electromagnetic spectrum that observed the radio afterglow um, from a double neutron star merger. Um, so that was, that, that was pretty special um, because that was the first time that a, a um, collision, not only between two neutron stars, but between any two objects had been detected in both gravitational waves and in electromagnetic light. And that um, here's another one. Do you use masers? So yes, we do. And so um, for those who aren't uh, familiar, we a maser is like a really, really, really super accurate clock. And uh, it's we have it for multiple reasons. For one thing, it's really important to keep the most precise time of when we're getting all of our data from our antennas as possible. So you know, we observe this data point at this exact time. And then also because the antennas are spread out on this array and they're different distances away from our control building where our correlator is, where we get all of our data, the, it's going to take an ever so slightly different amount of time from the data to travel from say the closest antenna to the building as opposed to the furthest antenna from the building. So another thing that the maser does is correct those very, very small time differences to be like, okay, this data from this antenna came in a little bit later than it did from this other antenna, but they actually observed the same thing at the same time. So we, we have both our, our correlator and our maser are at our control building, which are, is at the VLA site. Uh, is let's see what kinds of questions has this array been used to answer in the past honestly lots of different questions <laughs> so sometimes like what's great too about um, having an observatory and doing this kind of astronomy is sometimes we have questions about what uh, we're looking for like say maybe what is the nature of this planetary atmosphere that we're looking at or what is uh go what kind of invisible stuff is going on with these two galaxies and black holes that are merging together so sometimes scientists go into it with a specific question that they want uh answered and then they find what they're what the answer they're looking for or oftentimes that leads to having even more questions but then other times we find answers to questions we didn't even ask or know that we had. So we might, um, 
we might just be looking at an object just because we want to learn more about it and we don't quite know what we're going to find. And then it's like, oh, wow, we actually <laughs> learned way more than we ever expected to about galaxies or about this particular uh, group the like group of stars or this forming star region and we didn't know what we were going to find there but what we found uh helped us learn a lot more about how those types of objects work let's see we can probably take one or two more questions and then we want to make sure that you get to hear from our operator today um do you see any that you want to answer? Um, let's see. There, uh, somebody, uh, Vivek asks, how fast can the VLA respond to an event, say a black hole or a neutron star merger was observed by LIGO or Virgo? How soon can the VLA be reconfigured to view any radio aftergo? Pretty quickly. I don't know what the you know, exact period of time would be in order for, I, I do know that, you know, the participating observatories are, have some sort of alert system so that they know almost immediately and they can basically use director's discretionary time um, to go and, and observe the source. Um, I would think it really only takes as much time as, as it would to s just slew the telescope from wherever they're pointing to, to the source. Um, so pretty damn quickly. And that's, that is what happened in 2015. Um, we were, we were notified of this and within the days after the VLA continued to observe that radio afterglow. Oh, and then here's one. Uh, why do you use uh, many antennas? So um, basically with uh, wavelengths that are as long and as low energy as radio light, we want to make sure that we have uh, as large of an eye as we can to be able to look at it. So the eyes on our face are way too small to be able to process radio light, which is why our dishes are as large as they are because they are better capable of looking at that light. But if we have multiple different antennas, we can combine their data together, multiply it all together, and they act like one large eye. So the more of these antennas that we have and hook up together and multiply all together, basically the larger eye that we're pretending we have uh, with, with the antennas. The reason we don't have more, honestly, because out at the site we have room for um, 72 different antennas, but we only have... 28 of them because we that was what we could afford to build basically but um it works way better for being able to resolve the objects that we're looking at to have this many than it would if we just had one or even a couple all right so now um so thanks so much for your questions and we will have more uh, time to answer more questions at the end but we are going to move on to uh, talking to our operator. And so today's operator is Sylvia Kowalski. And so the operator out at the site sort of acts like the site manager. And they have a lot of different things that they do. As this picture shows you here, they have a ton of computer monitors that they have to be looking at at any given time that tells them different things about what's going on with the antennas. And during the week, we have uh, quite a bit of our maintenance crew who will be out working on the antennas at any given time doing maintenance on them. So they coordinate throughout that process with uh, the operator on duty. And uh, they're in charge of uh, the safety of the site too. So if there's wildlife located somewhere where it shouldn't be, or if there's a lightning storm going on, then they will go through the, they'll let the proper people know, they'll either tell everybody to come inside or they'll call somebody on the site to take care of things that need to be taken care of. And uh, they also uh, participate in outreach occasionally, like when we have tours like this. So they are our rock stars here. And, um, <laughs> and we, uh, have an operator on site 24-7, 363 days a year, or if it's a leap year like this year, then 364 days, all the operators get Thanksgiving and Christmas off. So <laughs> but, uh, other than that, we do have uh, someone on site and they 
work out at the site for eight hours in uh, three different shifts. There's a morning shift of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., evening shift 4 p.m. to midnight, and graveyard shift of midnight to 8 a.m. And Ooh. they come, uh, they drive from our office building here where we're located today, an hour out to the VLA site, and then they work there for eight hours, and then they come back uh, here, and that takes another hour. So they work 10-hour days. But that also means that they only have to work four days a week and get three days off. So that is pretty nice. Pretty great. <laughs> and um, so, Sylvia, would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Faith. Um, welcome, everyone. Hello. We're so happy that you are here to celebrate uh, the 40th birthday of the VLA. Um, Faith, I feel like you know so much about our jobs as operators. Anytime you want to work as an operator, just come on over. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Faith got it absolutely right. Um, our jobs are very, very diverse. And that's actually one of the things that I love about uh, my job is that I go into work and I have literally no idea what's going to happen. Maybe it's a day shift and we're doing a lot of maintenance on the telescopes and it's really, really bananas in the control room. And I'm logging where everyone is going. I'm logging every single maintenance task that's happening on every single telescope and it's really, really busy. Or maybe it's a, a midnight shift and I come in and it's really calm. I'm picking the best observations for whatever weather conditions are occurring at the time. And miraculously, all antennas and all of their subsystems are doing uh, exactly um, what they're supposed to do. So it's really, really calm. <laughs> so we really never know what's going to happen. And like I said, that's why I really like my job. Um, also, not only is it really diverse, but we need to be the operators are people who are both very um, excited about um, engineering and technology. We have to understand the entire VLA system so that we can fix problems when they're occurring, when we're taking data. But we also have to be very people oriented. Um, there's people who come through when we're not during COVID, uh, people who come through the VLA control room on tours. We're also managing a lot of people, leading the VLA site through routine situations or also um, emergency situations, like Faith said. Um, so I really like it because of that. Um, yeah, it's a really, really fun job. Um, a little about my background and how I got here. Um, I actually grew up in uh, Seattle, Washington, a lot more rain and a lot more clouds than we have here in New Mexico. Um, and I first got interested in astronomy actually in high school when I took an astronomy class um, at Shorecrest High School. Thank you, Mr. Santo Pietro for inspiring me to love astronomy. Uh, because of that, I then went to the University of of Washington and I studied astronomy and physics and also drama <laughs> and um, I have degrees in all of those. Um, while I was in college I learned that I love I really loved working with astronomy instrumentation and telescopes um, but at the same time I also really really loved um, astronomy education and outreach so that's kind of been the two um, areas that I have been pursuing since graduation. Um, I've had the opportunity to work at Gemini Observatory, Gemini North in Hawaii, and spend some time as an astronomy ranger in Bryce Canyon National Park, which was amazing. Um, and then I started working as an operator uh, about, wow, I think it's been about two and a half years now. Uh, I moved to New Mexico to be an operator, and it's by far the coolest job I have ever had. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh, Faith, I, I'm super jazzed to answer all the questions, but there were a couple that I noticed that I would love to point out. Um, the first one was from a John. I forgot. I didn't write down your last name. I'm sorry. But John asked, is there a Jodie Foster picture in the control room? Great question. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Contact based on the book written by Carl Sagan. Um, part of that movie was filmed at the VLA and uh, the main character was played by Jodie Foster. We actually do have a picture of Jodie 
foster um, in our control room and it is signed and I do wave hello at it every day just for luck. <laughs> so great question, John. Um, there was also a question from a Jessica Barton um, who said that Jessica's son, Joe, who is eight years old, is watching today. Hi, Joe! And Jessica wondered, what do you have to do to get a job in this sort of field if you're interested in it? And I will say, first of all, Joe, the fact that you're so interested in astronomy and you're only eight years old, that's amazing. Um, but if you wanted to be a telescope operator, we look for people who are really interested in learning about science, technology, engineering, and math. So continue to learn about those and astronomy. And I'm very excited to see you at the VLA as an operator in just a couple years. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, and like Sylvia was saying in her background, you don't need to have um, like a PhD or a high degree, like, and nope. you don't even have to have an astronomy background. That's a lot. I think a lot of you, a lot of the operators do, but you That's don't. Have to. Yeah. 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 I mean, because yes, we have to know about astronomy, but we also have to know a lot about um, engineering and electronics. We also have to be people who are generally pretty comfortable with situations that are maybe high stress um, because if there's a problem we need to be able to bound to the rescue and, and try and fix it even if it's at 3 a.m. Um, so if, if that's kind of your personality type you're on a great path to telescope operations. <laughs> All right oh another one that you marked as uh, wanting to answer is how did the VLA operators keep their sense of humor while we're <laughs> such long hours? <laughs> that is such a good question. I will let everyone in on a secret. A lot of coffee. <laughs> um, but in addition to a lot of coffee, actually, not all of our telescopes drink, uh, not of our, <laughs> none of our telescopes drink coffee. <laughs> I mean, our telescope operators, some of them don't drink coffee. And it's amazing to me. Um, but I think it, it definitely takes a particular type of person. All of us who are operators are just super passionate about being a part of this scientific quest to discover new things about our universe. To me, that is like the most exciting thing any person can do. So that really fuels me. Um, but we also just have a lot of fun. And I think, um, like, as you can see, our goofy decorations behind uh, me right now, we decorate our control room and we have a good rapport with all of our operators. So a lot of passion and just a lot of really neat people, um, I would say, is my answer. <laughs> Great question. Awesome. So yes, also everyone, please feel free to continue uh, submitting questions specifically for Sylvia to and about the operator experience. Oh, there's one good one here, including weather and planned and unplanned maintenance. Yes. What percent of uptime uh, do you get on the telescope? Uh, what was the last part of the question, Faith? Sorry. Oh yeah, no worries. So like if you count everything like weather and planned and unplanned maintenance that puts you in downtime about what a uh, percentage of it is uptime. Oh, that's time. a that's a great question. So I'll say just for our our general week, we set aside one really really long day for maintenance of the antennas. As you know, we have 20 28 of them, but we're typically only using 27 at a time. Um, but there's so many subsystems inside each of antenna, each of the antennas. So a lot of maintenance has to happen. So we reserve one really long day for that. Um, typically from like, you know, 6 a.m. to maybe 6 p.m. Uh, that's a really tough day. Um, and then we set aside roughly two days a week for testing the software. Hardware is obviously really, really important, but we have so many different types of software um, that run on various systems and have various jobs that we need to test. So we typically set aside about two days workday hours for that. Um, and then weather downtime, you know, it really depends. In the dead of winter, if it's getting really, really, really cold, we do have to stow the antennas and we can't use them. Um, because of safety reasons. During windy season in New Mexico, there's a lot of parking and waiting because the winds are at a wild 60 miles per hour. Um, but there's not a lot of that uh, weather downtime. So apart from those scheduled um, maintenance and software testing days, 
we are usually doing uh, science. We're usually observing science projects for astronomers from around the world. Um, and something that I didn't know until I started working as an operator, we schedule them so tightly that there is usually only one second between science project A and science project B, because we are um, what we call over uh, subscribed by two to three times. So we have so much science that we want to complete. We can't have any just casual 15 minute breaks between science observations. Uh, we really, really need to make sure that they are happening one after another. Um, so a lot of uptime. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Oh, here's a good one. Um, what's the craziest situation you've ever had to deal with? Uh, like the oh. craziest, typical situation with an operator. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is such a good question. Well, first I will say, if it's your midnight shift, things that are normal sometimes feel bananas. Um, <laughs> but probably one of the biggest things that happen are power glitches and power outages. Um, we use a lot of electricity and so many of our systems, if they were to turn off and then turn back on again, they're not ready to observe because they have to be synchronized. Um, as Faith and Tyler were talking about the maser, uh, we have to do a lot of very exact timing so that we can collect this data and then our supercomputer can correlate it and it's all organized to the right time. Um, so anything related to um, power is kind of wild. So that's really bonkers. Um, obviously, if there's any type of emergency situation, that's really scary because we are, um, you know, your staff members or public members of the public, we are in charge of um, getting the appropriate EMS staff on site at the correct time and the correct place to respond to that. So anything with emergencies, that's really, really wild. Um, and or if you just forget to bring coffee, <laughs> that's kind of wild. <laughs> yeah, great question. And then um, a couple different people ask like about how many operators uh, will be working uh during uh during one shift that is a really good question um we have for the vla i believe we have seven operators eight seven i think it's seven um and we actually only have one operator operating the vla at a time at the very beginning of your shift you have 15 minutes of open overlap with the previous operator so you can chat about you know the science plan for the day which antennas are being really goofy uh which antennas maybe have a component that needs to be fixed so we can't use it um that's what we call handoff and that happens at the beginning of your shift and then also at the end of your shift when the operator who is following you comes in to get kind of you know the lay of the land for their shift um, so we are working alone actually for most of our um, shift which if things are really calm it's fine but when things are wild uh, it's pretty bananas um, but one good thing I will say is that you know during COVID we don't want to be working in close proximity to anybody so for an operator our jobs are actually incredibly safe and that's in addition to a ton of really amazing work by our entire staff and management is just one of the reasons that we've been able to keep observing during the pandemic, um, which is really amazing. So, yeah. And then I think also when you hire a new operator, right, they oh, train yes. with a new, <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a new operator in training, then they'll be um, on the shift with a uh, fully trained uh, operator and they work together. And is that eight weeks, something along those lines for how long that takes? Yeah, it's typically about two months, but you know, give or take depending on the person's background or maybe, you know, maybe you've shadowed for two months and you still haven't um, experienced some type of event that you need to learn how to respond to. So you'll read about it and you'll study, um, but then maybe, you know, You'll shadow another person during maybe a reconfiguration where we we physically pick up the telescopes on this really amazing um, transporter and we roll them um, down our railroad tracks. And as an operator, there's a lot of stuff to manage. So, yeah, two months, give or take. 
And then uh, can more than one VLA observation be made during a shift? Oh, that is a great question. Absolutely. So when someone is awarded time on the VLA, let's say Faith, you wrote an amazing proposal and you're awarded 10 hours. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, you. Um, you will, of course, with the help of the data analyst, you'll write your script. You have the choice whether you want to clump all those 10 hours into one big chunk or if you want to break them up. And depending on the science that's happening that you are studying, you know, maybe you want to do 10 hours all at once, or maybe you just want to do one hour here, one hour there. Um, during our eight hour shifts, it really depends. Sometimes we do have observations that are as long as like 12 hours, but that's pretty rare. Um, typically I would say they're about one to three or four hours long is one chunk or we call a scheduling block of science observation time. Yeah, so then your shift obviously would have several of those, assuming the weather is cooperating. <laughs> that is correct. And everyone is behaving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then what, is a, what does a work day look like as an operator? Oh my gosh. I mean, it, it like I said, it really, really depends. Um, but let's say I'm, I'm coming to work on um, a day shift and uh, I'll get there about eight. If it's a day that maybe we're doing some maintenance or some software testing, maybe uh, the last couple hours of my shift are going to be um, taking science observations. Um, and of course, this is after I come into the Socorro office, grab the keys to the government vehicle, drive up to the VLA, the beautiful one hour drive. Um, and then again, get there at uh, 7.45, eight. I would do handoff with the previous operator, maybe do a couple hours of science observation. And then maybe I'd hand it off to the folks that were testing for maintenance or software. Um, and then after their testing was done, they would hand the array back, we call it. Um, and then I would probably run some checks just to make sure that all of the equipment, the antennas and the software is still working. Um, and then I might dive back into science observing. Um, like uh, Tyler and Faith said, because we do what's called um, dynamic observing, we don't have to run a particular observation at a particular time. I use a software called the OST, Operator Scheduling Tool, to help me pick what observation would be best suited for the time of day, uh, the season, the wind speed, the cloud cover, the atmospheric uh, stability. Um, so because of that, we can really pop in and out of science when we need to. So it's, it's very uh, dynamic, I guess, as the name suggests. Awesome. And then um, what programming language does um, do you guys use and does the supercomputer use? I heard it's a, um, a hybrid of Java and Python. Is that correct? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different languages that are used for lots of different things. But yeah, one of our really important software components is a Jython. I didn't know that you could smush those two together. A uh, <laughs> combination of Java and Python. Um, when I'm in the control room and I'm looking at my lots of computers, monitors. I'm using um, what are called GUIs, um, graphical user interfaces, um, which means that I can interact with buttons and push things and type things in. Um, and those are created with Java Swing. Um, so that's the thing that I'm looking at. But yeah, a lot of different types of um, programming languages are used to make the very complex VLA work. Awesome. Uh, we probably have time uh, for one more, I'd say. is uh, How often are the dishes physically damaged? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so the dishes themselves, the, the round... Oh, I brought my hat particularly for this reason. So you could call the dish this whole thing. We typically call this whole thing an antenna. And then we call the dish, the main dish, this part, which is where the radio light first bounces off of. These dishes themselves are pretty hardy, um, so not a ton of damage. However, there is a lot of um, hail that occasionally uh, occurs 
in New Mexico. Thankfully, we haven't had a huge hailstorm in a really long time. But something like really massive hailstones, that could do some damage to the um, dish itself. However, it's not going to break the surface. Um, there may be some, you know, small indentations. I don't know the frequency that we replace the panels that make up the dish. That's a really good question. Would be for there was a time like a, a while ago where one of them like <laughs> kind of fell off on one of the dishes. Oh my gosh, which antenna was that? Yes, I think it was, was antenna twenty, like twenty or twenty. One of the one of the twenties. I think it was antenna twenty. Yeah, that. So really, really high winds can sometimes pick up a piece of the dish. That was incredibly startling. Thankfully, our antenna mechanic swooped in like the rock stars that they are and bolted it back down. Um, but yeah, lots of wild things can happen. Um, and this far as just damage to the antennas themselves, like I said, every week we do uh, maintenance and we're working on lots of different components of the antennas. So it's a never ending job, but the folks that are on the maintenance teams are amazing. And they've been struck by lightning a few times from what I understand, but that mm -hmm. doesn't like seriously permanently damage them or anything. Thankfully, no. They have lightning rods and they're grounded. Um, though that is a really important part of my job as an operator is using our um, Lightning 2000 computer to monitor the uh, lightning on the array because the last thing you want is to have maintenance crews out in a giant plane as a lightning storm comes through. So that's actually a really important part of keeping the people safe, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, well, thank you so much, Sylvia, for being yeah. here to answer our questions today. And of it's course, thank you. Have you here? And thank uh, you so much. I've been getting a lot of compliments. So <laughs> thank you, everyone. And please stick around. We have so many amazing uh, lectures and activities the rest of the day. Thanks, Faith. Yes, we do. And um, so our next. Um, next time in terms of after today our next virtual vla tour is going to be saturday november 7th and that'll be at 1 to 2 p.m uh, mountain time but even then uh like, like sylvia and like we've said we have a lot of stuff going on today so we'll have another virtual vla tour like this one later today at 3 30 mountain time and uh several guest speakers in between so thank you so much for coming today. And since um, the speaker and everything else is all just going to be part of the same Zoom webinar, even if we didn't have time to answer your question during the Q&A sessions, we'll still uh, spend the next several minutes answering them uh, just in the Q&A box. So thank you, everyone.
Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome to the VLA 40th anniversary celebration. For those of you that were with us this morning, welcome back. Uh, my name is Melissa, and I will be our, the moderator today for all of our special guests. Um, just to give you a quick background on me, I am a data analyst at the NRAO. So if you were here earlier and you heard Sylvia talk, she is an operator and kind of works on that side of the data. I work on the data after it has come out through the telescope into processing into the hands of the scientists. So I will be introducing our speakers today and asking them your questions after their talks. I just have a few quick things before we get started with our first panelist. First of all, please put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. If you have any technical difficulties, um, you can put your question or you can put your problems in the chat, but definitely put questions in the Q&A. We want to be able to answer as many questions as possible uh, as time permits, and this will allow us to do that most efficiently. Next, if you see a question you have that's already been asked, please upvote it. Just like with social media, we'll be looking for questions that have a lot of upvotes and try to prioritize them so we'll know they're popular. All right. Um, I am now going to tell you a little bit about our first speaker. Dave Finley has been a public information officer for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory since 1992. A former science medicine editor for the Miami Herald, he has lectured at universities, observatories, star parties, clubs, and aboard cruise ships. That sounds awesome, Dave. He taught astronomy and geology at Florida International University and is a past president of the Albuquerque Astronomical Society. He is a veteran of US Marine Corps, a, pri a pri private pilot, an amateur radio operator, and currently serves as a historian for the six state Southwest region of Civil Air Patrol. We're gonna get to his talk in just a second. Remember one more time, everybody, questions in the Q&A, any technical trouble in the chat, and let's get to Dave. Welcome to our celebration of the VLA's 40th anniversary. Certainly glad everyone could join us today and we hope you enjoy our program. Today, I want to talk about how we got to where we are today. Why did we get the VLA? How did we get the VLA? What has it done in these four decades? We'll start with pre-VLA radio astronomy, what happened before the VLA, move into the design and construction of the VLA, which carries us to the, what I call the classic VLA and a lot of the science that it produced over the years leading up to the expansion of the VLA, improving the technical capabilities of this system and making it into a dramatically new scientific instrument and some of the science that that enabled. And we'll conclude with a look at the future, the next generation VLA, which we're designing to fill the needs of science in the coming decades. But I wanna start with what we might call the bottom line, just the tail in the numbers. Over the past four decades, the Very Large Array has served more than 5,000 astronomers for more than 14,000 observing projects that have covered the entire breadth of astronomical specialties. And it has provided the data for more than 500 PhD dissertations, ensuring that we're helping the education of the future generations of researchers. The VLA has become the most scientifically productive ground-based telescope in the history of astronomy. So let's start out at the very beginning. In the 1920s, shortwave radio was one of the hot technologies of the era. It was seen as a very cost-effective way of communicating over very large distances across oceans, across continents. And one potential use was seen by the telephone company for carrying telephone conversations across the oceans 
and avoiding the cost of laying thousands of miles of cable on the ocean floor. So in 1928, Bell Telephone Laboratories hired a young electrical engineer named Carl Jansky and gave him the job of finding the sources of noise and static on shortwave radio. As any ham radio operator or shortwave listener knows, you do get a fair amount of noise and static on those frequencies that are three to 30 megahertz. And the telephone company wanted to improve the quality of any conversations that they were able to carry that way. So they gave Jansky the job of finding where this stuff was coming from. He built that antenna that you see in this pictures and you notice that it's got wheels. Those are Model T Ford wheels and it was highly directional. It could point in any direction, and that was the way he wanted to be able to locate the origin of some of this noise. Ultimately, he found three basic sources of noise. He found that local thunderstorms cause noise in shortwave, just as they do in your AM radio. He also found that because shortwave carries signals for large distances, that he could also detect distant thunderstorms. But there was another source of noise that he found, and oddly, he found it raised, or it appeared, four minutes earlier every day. Now, astronomers know that that means that's something out in the universe. It's not on the Earth. That, uh, that four minutes earlier every day is caused by the Earth's orbit around the sun. Jansky recognized this, and he ultimately showed that this source of noise that he was finding was actually coming from the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, today, we still study that area with the VLA on a routine basis because the source of that noise really is the region uh, surrounding a supermassive black hole at the core of our galaxy. That black hole is about four million times more massive than the sun. Rujansky made this discovery in 1932, and in 1933, when he made his formal announcement, it made page one of the New York Times. But Jansky wasn't being paid to do astronomy, he went on to do other engineering things. But in Wheaton, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, another young radio engineer named Grote Reber uh, read about what Jansky has done and became very excited. Now Reber was a ham radio operator and he had made two-way contacts with other hams in every other continent of the earth. And he later wrote that he felt that there were no more worlds to conquer in ham radio. But then he read about what Jansky had discovered and decided this was something that he wanted to explore further. So he applied his engineering skills, decided that what he needed was a parabolic dish antenna, uh, same basic design that we have uh, out there at the VLA. Uh, he built this dish antenna that you see in the picture at the right, in his yard in Wheaton, Illinois. And besides attracting the attention of the neighbors, he was able to make the very first map of the sky as seen at radio wavelengths. He was the first on purpose radio astronomer. He did some landmark work and he got his work published in both engineering and in scientific journals. But as he was doing that work, World War II came about, interrupted any particular interest that uh, professional astronomers uh, might have in what he had discovered. But after World War II was over, there was a lot of surplus radar equipment left over. And a number of astronomers in Europe, Australia prim primarily, uh, grabbed hold of some of this uh, surplus radar equipment and turned it to studying the sky. And they made some discoveries and they advanced the cause but by the 1960s, when people started thinking about doing something like the VLA, we had some pretty impressive radio telescopes around the world. Uh, here are three examples. Up in the top left is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory's 300-foot telescope at Green Bank, West Virginia. Uh, down below it is the famous 250-foot telescope at Jodrell Bank in England, and over at the right, is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory's 140-foot radio telescope in Green Bank, which has the distinction of being the largest equatorially mounted telescope in the world. But 
All of these magnificent radio telescopes, the single dish types, had a major problem, and that was resolving power. But still, in the 1960s, radio astronomy had made some important discoveries in spite of that. Uh, in 1963, Martin Schmidt at Caltech had uh, suddenly discovered that quasars, these radio bright objects that were somewhat of a mystery, uh, that they were at very, very great distances. The redshift of, of their optical spectral lines was very great, meaning they were traveling away from the Earth at very great speeds and therefore at great distances. In fact, the quasars at that time became the most distant objects uh, known in the universe and uh, expanded our idea of the size of the universe tremendously at that point. Uh, in 1964, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, and now we're back at the Bell Telephone Laboratories again. And once again, we're looking for the source of noise in a communication system, only by this time it's noise in satellite communication systems. Uh, they were wanting to improve that because they were developing the systems of satellite communications that we use today. Uh, but they did find noise, and one of the sources of noise that uh, Penzias and Wilson found was something that didn't rise uh, four minutes earlier every day. It was there anytime you looked, anywhere you looked. It was a faint hiss, and it turns out it's the very faint radio remnant of the radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, that's something that had been predicted back in 1948. And so these two gentlemen, when they actually discovered it, uh, earned the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Then in 1967, uh, some astronomers, including this young lady here at the bottom, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, were looking for something completely different when she noticed a signal uh, from one of the objects they were looking at that repeated very regularly on a frequent basis. It was the first pulsar. Now pulsars uh, are neutron stars with uh, lighthouse-like beams of radio waves. And as the rotating, pulse, as the rotating uh, neutron star swings that beam around through space, if the beam crosses the earth, then we get a pulse of radio waves. And so that's why they were called pulsars. But neutron stars had sort of lingered in the footnotes of the physics books. And this discovery put them uh, out there in the mainstream. This discovery also earned a Nobel Prize, but not for her, for her professor. But back to the resolving power problem, uh, all of those discoveries were made uh, without having tremendous resolving power. In the case of quasars, a nice little workaround by watching the thing blink out when the moon passed it, and that gave the optical people a, a, an idea of where in the sky it really was. But resolving power is the ability to see fine detail. If you have two objects that are very close together, can you actually see them as two objects, or does your telescope glom them all together into a single blob? And radio astronomers are at a significant disadvantage in this area. Uh, because of the equation that describes resolving power, which I have down here at the bottom right, it's the wavelength that you're looking at divided by the diameter of your mirror or your dish antenna. And what you want in terms of resolving power is a small number, meaning a small angle that you can distinguish. And so radio waves are much, much longer than optical uh, visible light waves. And so that means that for radio telescopes to have the same resolving power as the uh, optical people did back in the 1960s, uh, you needed huge, huge radio telescopes. In fact, to match the resolving power of some of the best of the optical observatories of that time at a popular observing frequency for radio astronomy would require an antenna about 20 miles across. And that's certainly an engineering challenge and not something you're going to build anytime soon. Well, there was a workaround of that. 
And in England, led by Sir Martin Ryle, there had been developed techniques using the phenomenon of wave interference. You can separate two antennas by a far distance, combine their signals in such a way that the phenomenon of wave interference will in fact give you the resolving power of a single antenna that's the diameter of the distance between those two antennas. Now, Ryle did a lot of work developing the techniques that would turn this into a practical radio telescope system. And for that work, he too won the Nobel Prize. And this work convinced the radio astronomy community that this was the way to go in the future uh, in order to be able to get the resolving power they needed to advance radio astronomy. And so at Green Bank, which was at that time the headquarters of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, the then director of NRAO, David Heeshan, summoned some of his scientists to a meeting in this memo from 1962 to discuss talking about the criteria and the specifications that should be put forth for what he called the Very Large Telescope. Later in that year, I'm told, Very Large Telescope turned into Very Large Array in common use because it was obvious it would be an array of multiple antennas all working together as a single radio telescope. But this particular memo and the discussion uh, that followed it, uh, in most people's opinion, uh, defines the beginning of the project that ultimately would develop the very large array. This idea caught on, and in fact, a prestigious panel of the National Academy of Sciences uh, endorsed this idea in 1964, saying that a top priority for astronomy should be building a large multi-antenna radio telescope. But they also said that it should be uh, not something built for a single university or a single laboratory, but that it should be a national facility funded by the government and be available to all astronomers. Uh, and so with that endorsement, uh, things moved along. At NRAO, one of the first priorities for trying to build such a telescope and was to find a place to put it. Uh, even early on, it was decided that that valley in Green Bank where the observatory there remains today was probably not going to be where you would put something that you needed to build uh, telescope system that would span a diameter of more than 20 miles. They also wanted to get out west where it was uh, dry and so that you would avoid uh, absorption by water vapor and uh, a few other criteria that they had in mind. And so they were looking basically at the region that you see in this map that is pulled out of one of the early reports uh, and notebooks of the site selection committee for the very large array. That committee began with an initial list of 89 sites in this region that they were looking at. Uh, detailed looks at maps, uh, including topographic maps, uh, narrowed that down to 29 sites. They then uh, hired uh, a series of aerial photographs to be done of a number of these, of all of the 29, and then they all uh, went into small planes and went out there and, and looked over some of the most likely ones. That eliminated another nine and brought it down to 20 sites. Uh, and so then they started walking around, visiting each one of them on the ground and taking detailed notes of everything pertaining to the criteria they were looking for. And they ended up with four finalist sites, two in New Mexico and two in Texas. Uh, the ones in Texas were very close to each other, but the, the first one and, and what one of the members of this committee told me had sort of remained at the top of the list uh, almost the whole time was the site out here on the plains of San Augustine in West Central New Mexico. Meanwhile, in Green Bank, uh, scientists and engineers were working on a prototype for the very large array. 
This is it. It was called the Green Bank Interferometer. This is a photo from 1967. It was three antennas, 85 feet in diameter, close to the same diameter of the current VLA dishes. And uh, these telescopes, a pair of them were on wheels. They could move uh, and, and change the uh, spacing between the antennas. And this system was used by scientists and engineers of the NRAO to develop both the hardware and the software techniques that would then be implemented in the VLA. Uh, they really proved the concept of the VLA with this system and proved that this could be done. Uh, it certainly strengthened the proposals that NRAO could make for building the VLA to have all the groundwork that had been done at the Green Bank Interferometer uh, as support for the idea that this whole grand scheme could be completed and done and it would all work. Out on the plains of San Augustine, it became obvious that this was the place. Uh, this photograph is from the very first visit of NRAO personnel to the very large array site from February of 1966. They are standing near the location of what now is the center of the VLA. Uh, soon after that visit, they made an in initial report that called it an excellent site. And when they made their final recommendation in 1972 for the location of the VLA, uh, this site was what was recommended and ultimately approved. So 1972 saw some important milestones for the beginning of the Very Large Array. The most important was the fact that after the NRAO had put in a proposal to the NSF and the NSF had approved that proposal, then it was also approved and funded by Congress in 1972. And late in that year, the National Science Foundation gave NRAO the authorization to go ahead and proceed with this project, meaning that they could start spending money. Uh, early in 1973, NRAO opened a small office in Magdalena, which is between the current uh, site of the VLA and the city of Socorro. Uh, at the end of 1973, NRAO had taken possession of the central part of the VLA site, that's the central square mile, which is currently owned by the NSF and where all the buildings of the VLA now reside. So beginning in 1974, they began building everything that you see out there. Uh, it was open range land. There were no buildings uh, other than a couple of windmills and a, a few buildings in, in sight of a few ranch buildings in sight of the current uh, area but they had to build all of the buildings, put in all of the utilities, build the railroad tracks. Uh, the transporters had to be built. The antennas were constructed. What you see here at the far left is the ground that was graded in preparation for laying down the first railroad track. Uh, the VLA was designed to be in the shape of a Y uh, with three arms separated by 120 degrees each. Uh, so that as the earth rotated, the uh, array would rotate with respect to the source being observed and scan basically with the baselines between the antennas uh, covering new territory as the earth rotated. And so the, the railroad tracks meant that we could move the antennas and change the range of resolving power available. Uh, next to the grounded, uh, the graded ground there, you see a VLA antenna in what we now call the barn, also known as the antenna assembly building, being assembled there without its dish. It has its, uh, it, its basic structure there to support the dish, but it's not there yet. But if you look down at the bottom on the right, you see an antenna in that building with the dish substructure and the panels being installed in that dish and the first, uh, first pieces of rail out there extending away from the barn. Some of uh, NRAO's staff moved permanently to New Mexico starting in May of 1975. And 
by October of that year, the first antenna had been completed and the very first astronomical observation uh, was made with the VLA. And that was a galaxy known as M87. And we'll look back at it a couple of times in the next few minutes. By 1976, early, they had completed a second antenna. And so they could make the two of those antennas work as a interferometer pair and begin refining the software that, and the hardware that they were going to use for all the rest. But those were two big milestones, the first observation and the first interferometer fringes. Uh, by 1978, they had built enough antennas that the VLA already was a very impressive imaging interferometer. And at least on a limited basis, they opened it up to science from the general scientific community. The construction era culminated 40 years ago on 10 October, 1980, with a ceremony out there. With this photo of the ceremony, you see the control building uh, out there in the background, the piece of artwork in front of the control building, our flagstaff, and the uh, platform they built for the podium and all the speeches. You can see the list there of all the VIPs who attended that ceremony. Uh, one of the US senators in attendance uh, had walked on the moon a few years previous, and we had 600 guests from the scientific community, from the general public. It was quite a ceremony. And as you can imagine, we did hope to repeat that kind of an event this year, but under the current circumstances with COVID-19, we obviously can't do that. And that's why we're all gathering virtually today. Those who were involved in designing and constructing the very large array are justifiably extremely proud of the record they compiled. This was a major scientific project breaking new technical ground uh, with many technical challenges that they had to overcome during this period. And yet they completed it on budget. The system met the specifications and it was completed a year ahead of schedule. Uh, that is a very impressive record for a project of that magnitude and a project that was as technically challenging as it was. And that's a point of pride, very justifiably for all of those, the scientists, the engineers, the technicians, uh, everybody who worked on that project can be very proud of that achievement. But the scientific impact was what the VLA was built for. And it was tremendous. And an example that illustrates that impact, I think very well, is this radio galaxy called Cygnus A. Uh, up here at the left, what I've labeled a pre-VLA image is just that. It's a radio image of this galaxy. Uh, it's contours, the kind of contours that you see in a topographic map. Each contour line represents a, a line of equal intensity of the radio emission. But you can see that there's something in the center that's fairly bright in radio emission. And then on either side of that something in the center, there are two bright radio lobes of, of emission. And the obvious conclusion to draw was that there is something connecting all of these. Theoreticians said, yes, there probably is, but it had not been seen. But with the VLA up and running, uh, we had some folks who made this magnificent image that you see down at the lower right that shows all kinds of beautiful filamentary detail. But what you see is the bright dot in the middle and you see those lines emerging from the center, feeding out into the lobes. And what we know those are, are the jets of super fast material moving at almost the speed of light ejected by the powerful gravitational force of a supermassive black hole at the core of that galaxy and e emitting all of that energy, ejecting that energy out into those brightly emitting radio lobes. Suddenly we could see the connection between these three different seemingly disconnected things from the previous image. 
And that's why a number of years ago, when space.com wrote an article about some of the landmark radio telescopes, well, some of the landmark telescopes of any kind in all the history of astronomy, they used this quote saying that suddenly because of the VLA, that radio astronomy went from crude images to some of the best images of all. Another way of explaining the scientific impact that I really like is what one of the astronomers from the early era of the VLA said about that time. He said, you could point the thing at anything and learn something no one had known before. And that was really the case. Well, I've talked about the jets and over the years, the VLA has looked at many of these radio galaxies emitting these magnificently beautiful jets. We have huge collections of these images. Here are some of them, and this continues to be a area of active research at the VLA and, of course, of other radio observatories. Uh, we still don't fully understand the physics of these things. There are still details to be learned, some basics to be learned, and this will continue. But we learned some things that the designers never anticipated. In 1987, some astronomers looking for something completely different made this image you see over here on the left of that ring in space. And it turns out they discovered the very first example of an Einstein ring, which is what is called the perfect example of a gravitational lens. Now, Einstein had predicted with his general theory of relativity that uh, gravity of something large, like a large galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, uh, could use its uh, gravitational force to bend light waves or uh, beams of radio waves. And so that if you looked at a background object with one of these large gravitational uh, objects in the, in the middle, that the object in the middle would bend the waves so that you would see multiple objects of the background object. And then somebody also said that if you really had a perfect alignment, you would, instead of just getting multiple images, you would get a ring, you would get almost a circle. Einstein himself said, well, yes, that, that could be, you, that's what you would get, but he predicted that you would never see one because the odds of getting such a perfect alignment were well astronomical. But here it was, the VLA has found the first one, and now we see these fairly regularly in both radio and optical images. Back to what Jansky saw in uh, 1932, the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This has been a continuing subject of study for the VLA from the very beginning. And uh, this image at the right shows a lot of the strange phenomena that we see around this central region of the, of the Milky Way. Now this is a region that is obscured by gas and dust from optical observatories. So visible light people can't see this region because of all that dust. But radio waves go through it and we can study that region uh, with the VLA and this image at the left here, and I'm gonna move my cursor to a spot where you see a bright dot right in the middle of this pinwheel uh, area that you see here. That bright dot is the spot of bright radio emission where the black hole at the center of our galaxy resides. Again, that black hole is about 4 million times more massive than the sun. And so we, we regularly study this region and there still are many mysteries to be unveiled in this region. And some of them we are going to be looking at with a new instrument to come in the coming years. I've talked about the radio galaxies and I talked about Martin Schmidt discovering, micro, uh, discovering quasars in 1963. The quasars uh, have these supermassive black holes and millions or even billions of times more massive than the sun at their cores, drawing in material into a whirling disk surrounding the black hole. 
that disk sends out jets of material and the whole assemblage puts out tremendous amounts of energy powered by the gravitational force of that black hole. But in 1994, some astronomers looked at an object here in our own Milky Way, uh, only about 10,000 light years away. And they saw this sequence, this time series of images that you see at the right uh, of blobs basically separating from each other. And it turns out this is a black hole or possibly a neutron star with one of these disks of materials, the sucking in material uh, from a companion star uh, to that compact neutron star or black hole and doing some of the same things that a quasar in the middle of a galaxy will do, putting out beams of material and generating uh, intense amounts of radiation. And so the image at the right shows blobs of material that were ejected into the jets coming out from both poles of one of these accretion disks uh, heading away from the center of, of this binary object. And uh, this was the first discovery of what we now call a microquasar. And we found several others of these in our Milky Way, and they provide a great laboratory for studying the physics of these systems because we think that the physics in the microquasars is very similar to the physics in their bigger cousins, but the microquasars are both nearer and they have uh, faster moving changes. So they're a little easier to study than their more distant cousins. So this is an ongoing area of research. And in 1997, the VLA uh, in a period of just a matter of weeks, helped resolve what at that time had been one of the great mysteries of astrophysics for almost three decades. And that was gamma ray bursts. Uh, gamma ray bursts were first discovered in 1967 uh, when both the Soviet Union and the United States had put up satellites following the signing of the Atmospheric Nuclear Test Ban Treaty when both sides agreed that we would no longer uh, blow off nuclear weapons uh, above the ground, that any, any test we did would be underground. And so both sides wanted to make sure that the other side wasn't cheating. And one way they decided, both decided to do that, was to put up satellites that would look for bursts of gamma rays. And that is a diagnostic of a, uh, of a nuclear blast uh, you can have a huge blast with conventional explosives and it'll do tremendous amount of damage, but it won't put out any gamma rays. But even a modest sized nuclear weapon will put out a very well detectable burst of gamma rays. And so once these satellites went up in orbit, the operators of the satellites were very surprised to see uh, very frequent gamma ray bursts and they pretty quickly realized, well, the other side can't be cheating that often. And also the seismic detectors didn't find any, uh, any evidence of nuclear bursts. So this became a mystery. And finally, they realized that these bursts of gamma rays were coming from space, not from Earth. But the gamma ray detectors didn't have very much resolving power. So they couldn't tell anyone very, very uh, greatly where these things were in the sky. And so there was not really any way to follow up on these detections of gamma ray bursts and find out if there's some object that we can see that they're coming from. But finally in 1997, a satellite put up by the Dutch and the Italians had in addition to a gamma ray detector, an X-ray detector with better resolving power, they were able to narrow down the location of a gamma ray burst to an area small enough that the VLA could go and look and find a new source of radio waves. Uh, some optical telescopes could do the same thing. And what we found was pretty dramatic. Uh, in the absence of knowing where these gamma ray bursts were coming from, we didn't know their distances. That meant we didn't know exactly how much energy they were putting out. Uh, we, didn't need, we didn't have any of the information we really needed to decipher the physics of what these things were. And that meant that they were, 
theorists were going wild. Uh, at this time in 1997, there were roughly 200 or so theoretical models for what gamma ray bursts were. And these range from everything from objects in the outer parts of our own solar system out to galaxies uh, far distant from us in the universe. But with this detection of a gamma ray burst in 1997, the VLA was able to provide the expansion rate of the fireball from this explosion, was able to find the distance. The optical people also found the distance. And then we were able to trace over a course of a few weeks and months, the uh, fading of the radio emission from this thing. And so we had in a period of a small number of weeks, a lot of the numbers that we needed to narrow down the physics and the physics came down to the two models that we have today. One type of gamma ray burst we strongly believe comes from the explosion of a very massive star that leaves not the neutron star that a normal supernova explosion can leave, but a black hole instead as its remnant. The other type is the collision of two neutron stars. And we'll get back to neutron star collisions in a few minutes. But the point is that this tremendous mystery of astrophysics with 200 models for what they might be, uh, suddenly with the help of the VLA, tremendous help from the VLA, uh, narrowed it down to the two models that we have today. Another surprise came when the VLA was able to detect the, the evidence for molecules in the very early universe out at 12 or 13 billion light years from Earth, uh, roughly a billion or so years after the Big Bang. Uh, one of the key molecules discovered was carbon monoxide. Now, originally the universe consisted only of hydrogen and a small amount of helium, any carbon, any oxygen had to be built in the cores of stars. Then those stars had to explode as supernovas. And then that explosion debris had to go out, carrying the carbon and the oxygen atoms out into empty space and allow it to cool down uh, enough to allow those atoms to eventually combine into molecules of carbon monoxide. And the surprise was that all of this had gone on by that early time in the universe. And so uh, over the past 20 years or so now, we have gone farther and farther back in terms of understanding what, uh, how far back in time galaxies and stars were actually formed and how, how short a time it took after the Big Bang to have all of that go on and produce these, these molecules that were seen by the VLA. And so uh, this sort of work, this type of basic research uh, constantly helps us revise our understanding of how the universe got to be where it is today. With the original VLA, we did two sky surveys. Uh, we wanted to provide uh, maps of the sky, images of the sky, that scientists could refer to without having to write an observing proposal and do an observation themselves if they just really wanted to get a quick look and see what was in a particular region of sky. And the first of these was the NRAO VLA Sky Survey, which covered the entire sky as seen as visible from the location, the latitude of the VLA. Uh, that used almost 3,000 observing hours. Uh, another sky survey at higher resolution uh, looked at a smaller region of the sky, a region of the sky also covered by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at optical wavelengths. And that used about 3,200 observing hours. Both of these uh, sky surveys provided not raw data that had to be processed by the individual researcher, but provided uh, processed images that could be downloaded from the NRAO website and serve as a resource for the community. 
Sky surveys, of course, go back a, a long way, even to William Herschel in the 1700s, but uh, including uh, the sky surveys that were made at Palomar Observatory uh, late in the 1940s. So sky surveys have a long and honored history as good tools for research. And evidence of the value of the NVSS and the first surveys is the fact that by now, uh, the two of them combined have been cited in scientific papers more than 4,500 times. But as this science was progressing, so was technology. And by the mid 1990s, uh, we realized that the original electronics of the very large array that were designed and built back in the 1970s had pretty much become obsolete. And that by replacing those 1970s technologies with modern state-of-the-art technology could in fact tremendously improve the scientific capability of the very large array. And realizing this, we started out by hosting a couple of scientific workshops in which we asked uh, astronomers from a huge variety of specialties to come together and tell us essentially what capabilities they would like to see in an upgraded very large array. And based on all those recommendations and all that input, uh, we put forth a proposal to the uh, US Astronomy Decadal Survey in, in 2000. This is a survey in which the astronomical community comes together and sets priorities for building and funding new instruments over the coming decade. And so with that endorsement from that high level committee, the National Science Foundation approved this project in the year 2001. Funding for this project was international. It came from the National Science Foundation, but it also came from Canada and Mexico. And so this project began in 2002, went through 2012, and it replaced all of the receivers in the VLA. That required some modifications. Uh, we originally covered the area of one to 50 gigahertz, but only in, in individual bands in, in there with a lot of empty space in our coverage in between. With the expanded VLA, we cover continuously one to 50 gigahertz. Uh, we originally used a system of microwave waveguide, a system sort of like pipe for radio waves that could carry a bandwidth of 200 megahertz. Uh, that's sort of like uh, how wide your filter and your camera could be. Uh, with the expanded VLA, we replaced all that with optical fiber, which could carry a bandwidth of 16 gigahertz. That's like uh, taking the filter off and letting all the light come into the camera. Greatly increased our sensitivity. We got a new central supercomputer that we call the correlator. That is the central brain that takes the signals from all 27 antennas of the very large array and combines them in such a way that we can make the whole thing work together as a single uh, high resolution radio telescope. And with all of that, we had to have a new electronic control system to point the antennas, to control the ele electronics, to gather the data, uh, to do everything that you need to do to get the data and be able to provide it to the astronomers. The result of this upgrade of the very large array was to improve the scientific capability of the VLA in every area with at least a 10 times improvement and in some areas uh, an 8,000 times improvement. So this project that cost only a fraction of what it would cost to replace the VLA produced this minimum 10 time improvement and in some cases, thousands of times improvement. This is the new central supercomputer, the correlator of the very large array. Uh, it is what was produced by the Canadians. It was their contribution to the upgrade of the very large array, uh, roughly $20 million contribution. Uh, it is a, a really uh, fantastic instrument. It 
uh, actually took some of our astronomers a while to be able to take advantage of all the capabilities that it would produce. Uh, what you see in the foreground here with the little fence around it is a system of uh, lead acid batteries that won't run this correlator for very long, but will allow us to power it down gently in case we have a power outage out there at the VLA. One statistic I like about the new correlator is that if you're looking for the telltale fingerprints of molecules or atoms out there in the universe, we call these spectral lines. And so you may want to take the uh, range of frequencies that you're looking at and break that down into smaller pieces, what we call spectral bands, to try to detect atoms or molecules. The old correlator we had would allow you to divide your bandwidth into 512 spectral channels. This new correlator allows you to divide your bandwidth into 4 million spectral channels. Well, with all this new capability, this fantastic ability of the expanded VLA, uh, it was decided that we would give the whole thing a new name because the transformation had been so complete, the capabilities were so much greater that we wanted to give the whole thing a new name. One of the things we did was we requested entries to a contest. We opened the contest up to the public uh, and said, we will uh, take entries, give us suggestions for what you think we should name the very large array, and uh, we'll give a prize to whoever wins. We'll have a committee to pick out the, the winning uh, entry here. And we got something like 16,000 entries. And as a member of that committee that had to review all 16,000 entries, I can assure you that we got some very creative entries. But ultimately, we decided to use the occasion to honor Carl Jansky, who was, in fact, the founder of radio astronomy, and also preserve the name Very Large Array that had a tremendous amount of name recognition throughout the world by naming the whole thing now the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array. So we had a rededication ceremony in 2012. You can see the crowd that gathered there in the Antenna Assembly Building with the speaker at the podium. And the lady standing there in the picture down at the bottom in the blue coat is Carl Jansky's daughter. Following the expansion of the Very Large Array, we got some really great science out of it. One thing that had been developing into a mystery somewhat similar to the gamma ray bursts that I mentioned earlier was uh, a series of events called fast radio bursts. Uh, and these were very short, very strong radio bursts lasting only a small number of milliseconds at the most. Uh, once again, they were detected primarily by large single dish radio telescopes that didn't have the kind of resolving power needed to precisely locate them. So for a number of years, they we didn't know what their counterparts were. We didn't know what they were. There was some dispute uh, early on if they were even real. But finally, it was found that one of them repeated. And so we used the VLA and this was in, uh, in 2017, uh, we used the VLA to look at the general region from which this fast radio burst was coming. And it did in fact repeat while the VLA observers were looking at it. And with the resolving power of the very large array, we were able to locate it very, very precisely uh, with our uh, image and our location. Uh, optical observatories were able to find uh, a very faint uh, little non-remarkable non galaxy, and this thing was coming from the outskirts of that galaxy. So once again, we had something that there were a lot of theoretical models for what they might be, but certainly the models that said that they were not from galaxies distant got a lot weaker with this one. The uh, 
whole area of this uh, of fast radio bursts has now developed, and it turns out that uh, they may very well be caused by supermagnetic magnetars, which are uh, pulsars, uh, neutron stars, with incredibly, incredibly powerful magnetic fields. That's not certain yet, but uh, with the VLA being able to find the location of the first one, one that repeated, uh, we were able to advance our understanding of these by a lot. Well, I said we'd talk about neutron star mergers again. And in fact, in 2017, we had with the uh, LIGO and the Virgo gravitational wave detectors, LIGO got a, a, a Nobel Prize for uh, detecting directly the very first gravitational wave. And uh, it, along with the Virgo, uh, found a, new, a neutron star merger uh, with gravitational waves. And it had the waveform of neutron stars that the physicists had said would be what you should expect from a neutron star merger. And it, the overlap of the area from both of those uh, gravitational wave detectors was small enough that other uh, observatories could go looking. And it turns out that area uh, only contained something on the order of about 50 or so galaxies, which were quickly scoured and found one that had a, a new bright area in it. And the VLA was able to observe this thing uh, over quite a long period of time and resolve a number of questions about the blast wave, the, uh, the fireball, the uh, all kinds of aspects of the aftermath of this, including a, a jet of material that ultimately emerged from uh, a, a cocoon of material coming out of uh, a, a sphere of ejecta. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about what this aftermath would look like and the VLA along with our very long baseline array, a continent-wide uh, assemblage of radio telescopes uh, observed for a long time and were able to resolve many of these. And the bottom line here is that, uh, yes, indeed, it looks like uh, what we're seeing here is the aftermath of a neutron star merger and uh, the same sort of phenomenon that creates what are called the short duration gamma ray bursts. But this was uh, a, uh, a really big deal in finding the uh, gravitational waves from this merger. And then observatories around the world, not just the VLA, but uh, every wavelength, uh, every continent basically was looking at, at this object and the VLA was able to contribute a large amount to our understanding of this. So once again, we're at the frontier of physics. And just last year, uh, looking back at Cygnus A, that radio galaxy that I showed the pre-VLA uh, image of and the magnificent VLA image with all the filamentary structure, the same people who made that image back in the 1980s went looking at Cygnus A with the new capabilities of the expanded VLA and got the image at the right and got the first uh, observational evidence for a phenomenon that everybody thought existed since the 1980s, but nobody had ever seen. And that is this torus or donut-like ring of dust surrounding quasars. Uh, if you see the diagram on the left, you can see the beams coming out from a disk surrounding the black hole in the middle and a cutaway there. So you can see that the artist showed this dusty disk surrounding that whole thing. Uh, that torus, that disk of uh, donut like disk of material surrounding that engine, we call it, with the black hole and the accretion disk and, and the jets, uh, the torus was necessary to explain the fact that if you look at the same sort of phenomenon from different angles, you see widely different phenomena, that you don't see the central part if it's all hidden by the torus. But if you're looking down the pipe of the jets, yes, you see 
something different from if you're looking from over at the side. And so pretty much everyone believed or understood that this phenomenon of the Taurus had to exist. But finally, in 2019, just last year, uh, a, a VLA image with the newly upgraded VLA showed that Taurus, that disc, uh, you can see it uh, labeled here as Taurus pointing to this region right around here, uh, finally confirming what the theorists had said again back in the 1980s. But also with the brand new VLA, the uh, fantastically improved VLA, we decided that we wanted to do another sky survey with this new capability. And so we now are going uh, with the VLA sky survey that began in 2017. Uh, we started out with a series of workshops, just like we did with the expansion project, asking scientists uh, from all specialties uh, what sorts of capabilities they would like to see used for this survey. And based on that, we did some prototyping and developed a plan for the sky survey. Over the seven years, starting in 2017, the VLA sky survey will look at the entire sky, as we can see from the VLA location, that's around 80% or so, three different times. And one of the ideas of that will be, is that uh, we're looking for things that either turn off or turn on. Uh, in one or more of these epochs that we're looking at the entire sky. And so we're looking at what we call the transient sky with this. Uh, the VLA Sky Survey will be uh, using more than 5,500 observing hours. We expect it to detect roughly 10 million individual objects. And an illustration of this is down here on the left, uh, the same object, as seen on the left, on the far left, with the NRAO VLA Sky Survey from the 1990s. In the middle is with the higher resolution first survey, also the 1990s. And then over on the right, as the VLAS shows it, uh, basically right now. Uh, there will be, later on today, as we celebrate the VLA 40th anniversary, there will be a talk about the uh, VLA Sky Survey. They will tell you a lot more about this project, but one neat science result from VLAS has been to detect a what we call an orphan gamma ray burst. Uh, we believe, as the diagram on the left shows, that the gamma rays from these things are beamed. And then you see a shell that's cut away here in the artist's conception of the radio radiating ejecta uh, surrounding what was the explosion that started the whole thing. And what we saw in detection from the VLA with VLAS in its first uh, series of observations was an object that then with subsequent study was shown to fade in exactly the same way that the radio emission from a uh, gamma ray burst fades. But no one had ever seen any gamma rays from this thing. So the conclusion was that we were seeing a gamma ray burst whose gamma rays had been beamed away from us so that we couldn't see them, but we were still able with the VLA to detect the radio remnant of it, the radio afterglow. And this opens up the ability to find a lot more of these things, the ones where the uh, gamma rays are not beamed toward us. So we can get a larger sample and study them in more detail and learn more about their physics. But we're not sitting on our laurels. We have a, a great VLA right now. It is still at the forefront of physics and of astrophysics, doing wonderful work, and will continue to do that for some time. But we are looking at, once again, taking advantage of the technology that has emerged and will emerge in the future and build a telescope, a research facility for the next generation. And we call that the next generation very large array. This will be a dramatically different instrument from the current very large array. 
We want to be able to see fainter objects. So the NGVLA will be much more sensitive than the current VLA. We want to have higher resolving power. So it will be spread out much more widely to get at least 10 times the current resolving power of the VLA. Uh, these capabilities will mean we can see more objects. We can see details that we cannot now see. The NGVLA as currently planned will have 244 18 meter diameter antennas. It will have 19 antennas, six meters in diameter. It will cover 1.2 to 116 gigahertz in frequency, continuous. Uh, it will have the ability to be divided into subarrays and observe multiple objects at the same time. And it will also have the specialized software required to study pulsars. These are some maps that show some of the initial ideas of where we will put antennas for the NGVLA. The largest scale is up there at the top. And you see that we will be putting antennas not only in New Mexico, but uh, over in West Texas, down in Southern Mexico. And what you see then over on the left is sort of around the state of New Mexico. Over on the right is sort of closer to the uh, center of, uh, of the VLA uh, of the current site. Uh, don't take these diagrams uh, as gospel. They are concepts. They're the ideas of what will do what we want to do but we certainly haven't picked any actual specific locations. We'll be looking at specific locations for uh, areas free of radio interference, uh, good access to power, uh, access to optical fiber to get the data back, uh, the ability to go service them, things like that. We have a lot of expectations of the kind of science that will come out of the NGVLA. Uh, and again, these expectations came out of the workshops we held to get input on how we should design this new instrument. Some of these very briefly are continuing some of the areas of research that have been mainstays for the VLA for a long time. One is learning how solar systems like our own are formed. VLA has been a, a very important tool in studying the process of star and planet formation for many years. With the capabilities of the NGV, NGVLA, we will be able to do this far better. We will also be able to look and detect the chemical de uh, fingerprints of, of the precursors to life out there, much greater ability than we can do so now. We also know with the, the VLA, with the ALMA telescope, with the Green Bank telescope, with other telescopes around the world, that uh, there are organic chemicals out there in the giant clouds of gas and dust from which new stars and planets are formed. So we know that even before planets are formed, there are some of the basic building blocks that ultimately can be combined into forming uh, life uh, are there. There are simple sugars, there are simple alcohols out there. And so we want to be able to detect and, and find more of these molecules and try to figure out uh, how these molecules form, how they might end up on some of these newly formed planets. And of course, the VLA has studied galaxies from its very beginning, but with the new capabilities of the NGVLA, we'll be able to go deeper and try to figure out some of the things we don't understand now about how are galaxies actually formed? How do they, do they assemble? Uh, how do little ones get to be big ones or do little ones get to be big ones? We think so. Uh, how do their structures evolve? Uh, we know they collide and we know that collisions of galaxies change the structure and form new types of galaxies. All of this is known in general forms but there are so many details, important details to understanding the process fully that we need these new capabilities to answer these questions. We will be able to look back at the uh, central part of our galaxy, the Milky Way, because we know in that area, as some of those images 
that we've made of the central part of that galaxy, of our galaxy, that we have pulsars in there. Pulsars are great uh, timing clocks. Uh, we can use them for studying gravity because these pulsars are there in the region uh, near that supermassive black hole. And so we can study uh, how the gravitational field of that black hole uh, is affecting its surroundings. Uh, general relativity, Einstein has proven a very, very strong theory. Uh, in fact, we've, we've, it has passed every test we've given it so far, but there are still alternative models that suggest that when you look at very, very extreme conditions, uh, it might break down and there might be some other uh, explanation for gravity at those scales or in those conditions at those extremes. So that's a frontier of physics that we want to be looking at. And finally, we will be looking at the formation and evolution of black holes. They continue to be fascinating. They continue to be great laboratories for physics. Uh, and uh, we, we can use them in many ways. And the capabilities of NGVLA uh, will in fact help us to do that. You will hear, by the way, Later on in today's program, a talk about the NGVLA in much more detail than I have given you. So stay tuned, hang on and hear that. But all of these things I have mentioned are things that we think we will discover with the NGVLA. And just as was the case with the VLA and with uh, many of our other instruments and with other instruments throughout astronomy, what we thought that we were going to discover with the VLA ended up not being some of the most exciting science that we got out of the VLA. Uh, when they designed the VLA, they didn't expect to discover the first Einstein ring. They didn't expect to discover microquasars. They didn't expect to be able to locate a fast radio burst. They didn't even know that fast radio bursts existed. Things like that, the surprises that you get. These are the excitement of science. And I'm certain that when the NGVLA is online and in full, uh, full force with all its capabilities uh, able to be used, that we will get surprises that we probably can't even imagine now. And that's why I strongly urge you to hang on watch our website where we put up press releases and announce our new discoveries. Uh, come out and see our visitor center once COVID-19 has passed into history and we can all come and visit visitor centers again uh, and enjoy being part of the great journey of exploration that research astronomy really is. And so with that, I'll say we have covered four decades of frontier science with the original Very Large Array, with the expanded Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array, and we've talked about the promise, the tremendous promise of the NGVLA. That's 40 years at the frontier of science, and we are now poised for a new era of remaining and advancing the frontiers of science. So I thank you very much for hanging with us today and enjoying our celebration of 40 years with the VLA. And with that, I will be happy to take some questions. Thank you again. All right, thanks so much for that talk, Dave. We have a lot of people interested in a lot of different aspects of it. So I am just gonna get right into things. Um, first, how has research from the VLA affected life for non-scientists? Well, just like all astronomy, uh, you start out in history and our very calendar and our timekeeping and our navigation came from astronomy. Uh, the Very Large Array uses processing techniques that have been applied to medical imaging. So when you have a medical problem, they don't have to cut you open to have a look. Uh, they can put you in, in a sensor to see without having to cut you open. Uh, satellite communications has benefited tremendously from the low noise receivers that, uh, that radio astronomers have developed. So there are a whole lot of, uh, of 
very, very important uh, technical developments, spin-offs, you might say, that have come from radio astronomy. Awesome. Um, and a lot of people are interested in the history that you talked about. So how long did the NRAO keep the office in Magdalena? Well, I don't know exactly, but it's probably only a couple years, three years or so, the office moved into Socorro uh, as it needed to get bigger. Awesome. So there's a lot of questions about um, kind of the site of the VLA. So for example, did any railroads assist with the construction of the site? The construction was all done by our NREO personnel. An interesting aspect of the railroad system was that in order to make sure they stayed on budget, all of the rails used in the railroad system for the very large array are recycled rails from old military railroads back east that were going, uh, not being used at that point. Uh, in fact, even, even ties were brought in. So uh, I have personally found a rail out there with a date on it of 1912. Uh, one person on our track crew says that there is a rail out on the North Arm somewhere with a date of 1895. So we have 100 year old plus items of equipment still being used with the VLA. I love it, recycling, it's great for the planet. So is the VLA site seismically active and was that a consideration when choosing the site? I suspect it was a consideration. Uh, the, the VLA site is not seismically active to the best of our knowledge. Now, uh, in the city of Socorro, we have a magma body sitting 19 kilometers underneath us. Socorro itself is the earthquake center of New Mexico, but 50 miles out to the west where the VLA is, uh, no, that's, uh, that's not really a, a big consideration. <laughs> And then in terms of, um, we have some questions about recalibrating the telescope after a move. So how is uh, how are the telescopes recalibrated and the orientation determined after moving the antennas? Well, one, I think, misconception some people have, I know, is that we, that they stay on the railroad tracks. They don't stay on the railroad tracks. Uh, each station where we can put an antenna consists of three concrete piers with the power for the telescope for the antenna and the fiber optic cable to bring the data back into the control building. So we're putting the antenna down on a fixed set of piers that we know the location exactly. We can orient it. We know exactly where north is from that particular uh, set of peers. And then there is a routine, and uh, Sylvia or someone else could probably answer a little better than I can, but when an antenna is put reinstalled on one of the sets of peers, there is a software routine that the operators can go through to uh, bring it up into the array. Awesome. Um, and then uh, a couple people wanted to know um, if you can explain again um, interferometry kind of very basically and how you link together more than one dish to create one image. Um, I think, I know we're kind of talking about that all day, but I think it's worth bearing repeat if people uh, have questions. So your two minute interferometry uh, or 10 second interferometry lesson. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, to start out, it, the techniques are very complex. Every two years, we have a workshop uh, that runs almost two weeks in which we teach people how to reduce data and make their images uh, from the VLA. But the, the VLA works in pairs of antennas. With 27 antennas, we have 351 pairs. And the phenomenon we use is the phenomenon of wave interference. And if you ever took a course in high school physics, they may have had a little pan of water and uh, these, these little arms that make waves in there. And you can see if two waves combine at their peaks, 
then you will get a peak bigger than the, either one of the two. If they combine at their troughs, you will get a trough deeper than either one of the troughs. But if you combine a peak and a trough, they will cancel each other out and you get flat water. And so if you separate two antennas widely and you're looking at the same object, you will get that phenomenon in and out as the angle uh, of observing changes. And the farther apart you put the two images, the smaller the angle it requires to make that uh, interferometer difference. And so what we do is in each of the pairs of antennas uh, has a baseline as we call it between it. In the VLA, every baseline is different from every, every other one either in its orientation or in its spacing. And that means that all 351 baselines give unique pieces of information about the field of view we're looking at. And the analogy I have always used is say a food colander with 351 holes in it. And I beat it out flat and I'm holding it up looking at a picture on the wall through those 351 holes and I get instantaneously 351 pieces of information, unique pieces of information about that picture. And then as the earth rotates it, the same thing as if I'm taking that colander and rotating it. And so every couple minutes or so I am getting another 351 unique pieces of information about the field of view I'm looking at. And so you keep doing that long enough and our software then is going to be capable of reconstructing the image. And so that's the very brief description of how we do all this. And as a data analyst, you know that it's a lot more complicated than that. But I have to say, I have not heard the colander version of that. And that is a really good way to visualize it. Um, and I had not heard that metaphor and I've heard a lot of metaphors for synthesis imaging, so. <laughs> um, okay, let's ask, uh, let's do one or two more questions just so we can give people a break before the next one. But are there currently any satellites that allow interferometry baselines off the earth? Uh, and I think there was a Russian satellite at one point. Says there, there was in fact a, a Russian satellite uh, that worked at times with our very long baseline array, the continent-wide version of the VLA that we have. Uh, its control room is uh, in the city of Socorro. And I forget exactly how long that satellite was up there, but yes, indeed, it, it worked. Uh, instead of a maximum with the VLA 5,000 mile or so baseline and the resolution that could give you, uh, it could give you baselines up to, I believe, around 12,000 miles. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, a lot of people at one point thought that was so far that you couldn't actually get fringes uh, at such distances, but we indeed proved that you could. And so there are people who are thinking of doing that again. Uh, obviously, it's a very expensive proposition, uh, you need a large antenna, then you need to get it up into orbit, and then you need to assemble it, and you probably don't want it in low Earth orbit, uh, because then you're going to have orbital decay, and you're also going to have radio interference from the surface. Uh, we also have people thinking very seriously about uh, going to the far side of the moon where you're shielded from earthly radio transmissions. In fact, NRAO is going to be part of a project where a satellite will go uh, in orbit around the moon and be able to do some radio observations uh, from the far side of the moon, which is the most radio quiet place uh, in our particular celestial region. And actually somebody else asked about the moon. Uh, it was a hypothetical question, but I forget your name person, there's your answer as well. Um, and then I have, okay. uh, I have volunteered to be part of the staff of that first radio astronomy observatory on the far side of the moon. I mean, that's a great cool thing to have your name on, right? I would volunteer to be on that as well. <laughs> uh, 
Um, all right, I'm gonna ask one more quick question because I think it's really interesting and it's one that I thought about when I first started in radio. Um, what types of materials are used to make the telescopes? Metal versus plastics or composite material? And why is one material, material preferable to another? Well, the very large array antennas are all steel except for the panels on the dish, which are aluminum. And that's for structural strength and uh, also trying to avoid as the antenna moves in elevation, you don't want to be distorting the dish. It's supposed to be a, a perfect parabola. Now you can, engineers have found ways to design things so that you can minimize that because gravity will affect parts of the, of the dish differently at different angles. But uh, it's, it's steel and aluminum. Obviously the reflecting surface has to be a metal. Um, uh, I presume that carbon fiber or something like that could be done, but it probably would be a lot more expensive. Uh, when we get to the point of building orbiting radio astronomy antennas, I suspect carbon fiber will be the way you, the way you go with that. But of course, the reflecting surface is still going to have to be aluminum or some other metal. Well, Dave, thank you so much for answering all those questions. Thank you everybody for joining us for Dave's talk. We have another talk coming up at one. So you have a few minutes to stretch your legs, get a cup of coffee, get a snack. And then we are going to hear from Chris Langley. So stay tuned everybody. And I will meet you back here at one. At noon, actually, we've got at one. Noon. Sorry, I'm in a different time zone. That's <laughs> noon mountain time. It's one my or two. Uh, you know what? It's been a day. It's Saturday. I hope everybody's having as good a Saturday as I am. Since the dawn of humankind, we have shared a deep communion with the stars. The universe around us inspires many of our most powerful beliefs about who we are and where we come from. On our journey of cosmic discovery, there have always been sacred places where we go to connect with the heavens. Places that help us make sense of all the wonders we see when we look to the skies above. what we know about our universe comes from large optical telescopes, which capture visible light just as our eyes do. Like our eyes, these telescopes can only see the stars at night. Dawn brings an end to observations, end to this optical astronomer's workday. But there are other telescopes built on a more massive scale that work around the clock gathering invisible light from space. 
The Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array. This vast collection of dishes is among the most accomplished telescopes in history and one of the most recognizable. These radio telescopes, rising like giant flowers from the New Mexico desert, are monuments to human ingenuity. How are you going to convince your people to allow Americans to go on the flight? We are going to get there first, and you have the knowledge. The heavens and the earth. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, for those of you who have been with us, we're going to keep going with our special guest speakers. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the VLA 40th anniversary celebration. Um, just two quick notes that you may have already heard. If you've been here, please ask your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. Let's keep the chat for technical problems. Uh, the Q&A helps us figure out which of your questions we should prioritize because my second point is if your question has already been asked, please upvote it. If you upvote it, it's like likes on social media. We know that's more popular. So we'll try to prioritize that question. Now we are going to move ahead with our next guest speaker, which is Chris Langley. Chris, would you wave hi and say hello to the folks at home so we can get your video centered? Hello, everybody. All right. So happy Chris. to have you here today. Oh, excellent. Chris Langley joined the NRO in 2001 as a digital design engineer on the Alma project. Six years later, he was chosen to leave the back end integrated project product team for the Alma project. In 2010, Chris was appointed project manager to the expanded VLA project, a major upgrade to the telescope. He was promoted in 2018 to deputy assistant director for engineering. Chris, I work with mostly Alma data, so big fan of the Alma representation, but super excited to talk more about some VLA stuff. So it is all you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, whichever the case may be. It's my pleasure today to share with you some of the behind the scenes activities that happen at the VLA. The science is world known. The telescopes themselves are iconic images that many, many people across the planet are familiar with. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there is an awful lot of supporting effort that takes place behind the scenes, not only away from the site, but at the site itself. So today I'm going to take you through the different shops and the different kinds of activities that keep these antennas running on a daily basis. Now, before I get started, I need to uh, post a disclaimer here. Most or all of the photographs and certainly all of the ones depicting people are taken pre-pandemic. During the time of the pandemic, the NRAO, and the VLA have enacted very serious protocols to keep our staff and to keep anybody who comes in contact with our staff safe. So the pictures you see of people, please keep in mind these are pre-pandemic. We have protective equipment that's outlined now that the staff wear and many, many procedures. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, as a brief introduction, the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array 
was constructed mostly in the 1970s, although it was dedicated in 1980, formally dedicated. It's located at an elevation of 7,000 feet, which makes for very clear skies, and uh, this helps radio astronomy to succeed. Uh, imagine if you have dirt or mildew or uh, drops of water or anything like that building up on the windshield of your car. It impairs your vision. Well, the same thing is true for the atmosphere. So by building at altitude, we can essentially clear the windshield for the antennas. There are 27 antennas in the array at any given time, although really that's a misnomer. We have 28 antennas. The reason we have 28 is that at all times, we want one antenna to be undergoing an overhaul. So approximately every two and a half years or so, an antenna is cycled into our antenna barn where, it, where its major systems are stripped apart and put back together again and major maintenance is completed. This is one of the secrets that keeps the VLA operational day in and day out almost every day of the year. These antennas are heavy. They weigh 230 tons each, which has all kinds of implications for our maintenance crews and, uh, and other crews which service the antennas. You've heard me mention the term array. Well, the array refers to the fact there are 27 antennas instead of just one, usually looking at the same spot in the sky. These antennas are reconfigurable. And what I mean by that is we can pack them in very close to within one kilometer or another. Incidentally, that's called D-config, D as in dog. Or we can spread them out to as far as 37 kilometers from end to end. And that's referred to as the A configuration. The difference is when you're in the A configuration, the furthest out, you can actually get higher resolution on an object in space that, we, that you wish to study. If you're further in, as in D configuration, then you get a wider view, although maybe not the resolution that you would get with A configuration. And finally, the very large array relies on a supercomputer to process all the signals coming from the antennas and frankly, to make sense out of them. This is what we refer to as a correlator. So that's what the public thinks of and that's what the public usually sees. But now let me take you behind the scenes. So in the large photograph I've just displayed here, this, uh, thanks to Google Maps, is an aerial view of the site itself and you see there are several buildings and I've annotated the major areas of the site. These are the shops that house the people that keep your VLA running. Uh, starting at the lower left, we have the antenna assembly building and the transporter shop. And if you look in the smaller photograph to the extreme lower left, the tallest building you see is that antenna assembly building. Moving on through the larger photograph, we have a hazardous waste and general storage area. We have an HVAC and trap uh, shops, a firehouse, carpentry shops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that there are a lot of buildings here with a lot of specific functions held within those buildings. So on a typical day, the staff that uh, work in these buildings and at the site uh, go through something that looks kind of like this. Okay, first of all, most of the staff at the VLA work what we refer to as a 410 shift. This means that they are on the site for 10 hours a day and uh, four days a week. That's where they get their usual 40 hours, unless they're working overtime or in cases of emergencies when we can call them in. The staff arrive at the site at 6.30 in the morning and most of them ride a company bus, of which we have two. One bus comes from Socorro, which is about an hour away. So yes, they have to meet the bus in the parking lot at our facility in Socorro and ride out to the VLA at 5.30 in the morning. And don't be late. If you are late, the bus will leave without you and you will have to find other transportation to get to work that day. 
Another bus operates from the town of Magdalena and they get a bit of a break. They don't have to leave until six o'clock in the morning to get to the site. The first thing people do when they get to the site after getting off the bus is, well, they brew coffee and then they drink coffee. But after that, okay, we, uh, we have uh, a series of maintenance tickets to attend to. And these will usually show up in a specific employee's mailbox or in their email, I mean. And once the staff are awake and they've had their coffee after about 15 minutes, they'll review the maintenance tickets. And usually they get started working on those right away. Although at 8.30 in the morning, we do have a formal maintenance meeting every day that's attended primarily by group leads to go over not only the day's tickets, but also any tickets that have yet to be closed yet. So this is very routine and it really keeps us on track and doing the observatory's work. Uh, finally, at the end of the day, at 4.30, the staff get back on the buses and go home. So really, if you're somebody living in and around Socorro, your day is 12 hours either on the bus or at the VLA, plus the time it takes to wake up and get to the bus. So it can mean for a pretty long day for most staff. I'd like to briefly go over the organization of the staff at the site. I'm not gonna go through every single bullet here, but as you can see, there are several large groups or divisions, one of which is engineering services. The folks outlined in here are ones that work at the site and are stationed at the site. They really don't have another a uh, place that they work at unless they're called out for a specific job on perhaps a VLBA site or something like that. But for the most part, they're stationed at the site. And you can see we have facilities staff, we have mechanical engineers, we also have an electrical engineer. We have an electrician's group, a track crew, antenna mechanics, a very fine machine shop and auto shop. And uh, these folks uh, get the job done, what can I say? We also have electronics division personnel at the site, although most of the electronics staff are actually stationed in Socorro, New Mexico, not at the VLA. But you see the 15 or so, whatever it is, electronics staff listed under the header there. Uh, those are actually located at the VLA with other ones coming in from time to time as needed. We have five or so EPO personnel. EPO is what I what I refer to, but it actually means education, public, and outreach. And these are the fine folks putting on this open house today. Uh, five of them are stationed between Socorro and the site. They can be at the site at any given time. Uh, we have ESNS. That's our environmental safety and security folks. We take safety very seriously at the VLA, and there are three permanent full-time staff stationed at the VLA. And we have a warehouse. There's a lot of comings and goings in the shipping department and it takes a full staff to keep us straight in that regard. So moving on to the groups, in array operations, this is probably the most interrupt driven group in the all of NRAO. These are the site operators. They man the radios and the telephones and the computers that keep not only the antennas ready and observing for science, but they also keep track of and approve all of the maintenance activities that take place on the antennas at the VLA. You see a couple of pictures there. One gentleman has his, uh, he's on the phone and another one looks like he might be checking email or some other conditions around an antenna. At any given time, these staff will have to drop what they're doing and attend to something. They can receive a phone call from a scientist off in Socorro. They can be interrupted by an emergency situation out at the site, uh, or a tour group could come in, frankly. So um, they really have to stay on the ball. Array operations is manned 24 seven, not quite 365. We do let the operators out of their cages on Christmas, I believe, and perhaps Thanksgiving too, okay. But other than that, they operate the site, they keep the site going all the time. And boy, this job, if I haven't made it clear, really requires multitasking. The first technical group, 
I would like to describe are the antenna mechanics. Now there's that big barn again, and you can see there's an antenna in the barn in the picture, and you can also see one next to the barn. The one in the barn is undergoing its overhaul, and the one next to the barn is ready for testing after an overhaul and soon to be moved back into the array itself. Notice the size of the truck, let's say, down uh, toward sort of just off left of the center of the picture. That gives you a pretty good idea of how big these antennas are. Remember, they weigh 230 tons. So the antenna mechanics maintain and repair the big pieces of the antenna, which include the mechanical systems, uh, any moving parts on the antenna, uh, the motors, which of which there's four, and they weigh 300 pounds each. Uh, they paint, not only touch up, but full paint on the antennas. There's always welding to do, and there's always greasing to do. So the antennas are the frontline defense to keep the, uh, the VLA antennas operational and in a suitable state. Here's a couple of examples of some of the work they do along with some perspective. In the first picture on the left, if you can make it out, that blue thing in the middle is actually a person who is servicing what we refer to as the elevation gear. The antenna has two gears. It has an elevation gear, which moves the disc up and down, and it has what we call an azimuth gear, which is located inside the antenna, and I'll point that out a little bit clearer later, which moves the dish side to side. So at any given point in the sky, we can push the dish up to meet it and across to meet it. The um, welding shop in the antenna barn also stays very busy. Not only do they repair pieces on the antenna, but around the site, anything that requires welding, and there's always something, they have a backlog. These gentlemen you see in the picture take care of that. And finally, the rightmost picture uh, shows one of our antenna mechanics getting ready to perform a saucer separation on the antenna. So any of you all have ever seen Star Trek Next Generation, I believe it's the first episode, maybe it's the second, I don't know. They actually do a dish separation. Well, we do something kind of similar with the BLA. And we do that when we want to change the azimuth bearing. Now the azimuth, remember, that's the direction where the dish moves from side to side. And it takes a big bearing inside the antenna to allow for that. In the first picture, you see that we have indicated where that bearing is located. So there's a top section of the antenna, a bottom section of the antenna, and the bearing is housed right in between the two. So to perform a bearing change takes the better part of two and a half weeks if things go really well. And it's an all hands on deck activity. It's not just the antenna mechanics that do it. In the second picture, you see one of our transporters, the big orange thing, they weigh about 50 tons, I think, is getting ready to drive underneath the antenna that's in the barn. And what it will do is the transporter will drive under the antenna and then it will use its three hydraulic jacks to lift the antenna up and move it further back into the barn to a special structure where the dish can be separated from the bottom half of the antenna. Uh, once that separation occurs, if you look at the last photograph there, uh, the mechanics can do the job of removing the old bearing and placing the new bearing in. And you can see several of the mechanics are around the periphery of where the bearing is located in that pocket. The antenna barn also houses the transportation group. And the transportation group are the ones who drive the transporters and move the antennas every time. It takes a special individual to do this. There really isn't any training out there. It has The job has to be uh, learned in-house. Nobody else does what we do on the planet. So, so this is quite unique. And the array uh, requires an incredible amount of moves of antennas. I, I included a photograph of this old poster that was dug up out of, uh, frankly, you know, underneath somebody's desk or something. You'll notice the date on it, I believe is uh, 1984, November 5th, and it commemorates the 500th VLA antenna move. So you can imagine if there were 500 antenna moves by 1984, when the array was only dedicated in 1980, 
How many have we done now? Well, uh, we've done a lot, okay? I haven't counted it up, but I think it's fairly obvious that the pieces of equipment that do these moves have to keep working. And, you, and also, I might add, you can't just buy new ones. So that's the next slide. These are the antenna transporters. You can see two of them in the picture here. And these are unique, but not identical. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, they're unique transporters in that they don't exist anywhere else in the world. They had to be specially built by uh, outside companies for the VLA. Now, why aren't they identical? Because back in the day, one was built and then the second was built a few years later. Well, why did this happen? Well, I'm not really sure, but I suspect it went something like this. We were a government tax funded organization. And every time we go out to purchase any object of any size at all, and the general rule of thumb we use is $3,000. Okay, these cost more than $3,000. We have to bid it out. So one transporter was built. And then a few years later, we needed a second transporter. So we had to do the bid process again. And another company won that bid. That is one possible explanation. The other is maybe the first company didn't want to do the job. I don't know. But um, at any rate, we have two of them. They sure look alike. They act a lot alike, but they're not completely identical. And for that reason, we assign a specific transporter operator to each transporter. Because if I'm operating transporter number one, and all of a sudden I find myself on transporter number two, I might find I don't have the right touch for that transporter. So this is why we have dedicated operators for each transporter. And yes, we also have a third operator who is the lead, who is adept at operating both transporters. These require quite a bit of maintenance, as you can imagine. As I said earlier, you can't just go out and buy a new one. You have to keep these running. And so we do. Approximately three or four times a year, they undergo a very substantive preventive maintenance. And occasionally, yes, they will break down, in which case, we do have to fabricate a part, probably using our own machine shop and repair the transporter. But that fortunately doesn't happen very often. And here's a couple of nice pictures of them in action. You can see one of the transporters in the first picture is underneath one antenna. It takes a minimum of six staff to perform this operation. Usually we like to have eight or nine people on hand, but six can do the job. And then the second picture, you see a close up of one of the antenna mechanics measuring the distance from one wheel to the track so that uh, he can make sure that transporter is centered, those two wheels are centered just right before turning them and resting them on the, resting them on the track that's running behind him. We have a lot of railway at the VLA. We have our own railroad company. It's called the Track Crew. But here's a couple of statistics. We've got 900,000 feet of mainline rail. Now look at the picture. You see the two gentlemen and they're looking at what looks like a regular set of railroad tracks. And, you know, that's an accurate statement. It looks a lot like a freight train railroad track and it is a lot like a freight, a freight train railroad track. But there's a big difference. Look behind what, what's behind the two gentlemen? And I'm not talking about the big piece of equipment. There's another set of railroad tracks. These antennas are so heavy. And when you add the weight of the transporter, a single freight train style railroad track would buckle. And believe me, if that happened and I lost an antenna off a transporter or we derailed, that would probably be the worst day of my life. So I'm very grateful that what we have is a double set of tracks so that we can use both tracks to hold up the transporter and the antenna as it moves along. And that way I don't have to worry about an antenna falling off a transporter. There are almost a quarter of a million railroad ties in the VLA track. And just a trivial point, the original track built in the 1970s used surplus ties from a railroad that was decommissioned, I believe in Louisiana or Alabama or some or somewhere around there, maybe both states. Some of these ties had date stamps of 1911 on them. 
and they were great. They were these massive oak ties. And you know what? Some of them are still in the array today. The new ties you buy, they're not worth anything compared to those old ties. But at any rate, that's how we originally built the VLA with surplus rail. And it's fine. It worked very well. There are 24,000 connections between the pieces of rail, so that's why we need 24,000 joint bar sets. We need almost half a million uh, tie plates and 800,000 spikes to complete this rail. In addition, underneath the rail requires ballast. Ballast is basically crushed up rock, although it's there are standards. You can't just put any rock under there. It has to be a certain size and have a certain number of facets around the stone. And it takes over a quarter of a million cubic yards of ballast to create the VLA rail system. So to put things in perspective, the first picture is one of our many, many deliveries we've received of spare railroad ties. And why do we have spares? Because Railroad ties fail every year, and we have to consistently replace them to keep the track in good order. So you can see a giant stack there, and that's just, that's a year's worth, maybe even less than a year's worth right there. The second picture, the second large picture, is a pile of ballast. Now, it takes about a ton of ballast underneath each railroad tie to keep it stable, and you can see that pile is pretty good size. The antenna gives it a little bit perspective in the picture there, but I want you to look at the dot to the right of the ballast inside the ballast. That is a large front end loader, and I've included the picture of the front end loader right there in the, in the uh, circular photo. So that gives you some perspective how much ballast we can go through. How often do we, uh, do we need this much ballast? Well, I would say that right there might last us about two years. The track crew, uh, they're busy all the time and they have a huge job to do, not only replacing the ballast under ties and the ties themselves, but the occasional rail, the occasional intersection or, or crossing over a highway. To do that, they really need fine, large, heavy equipment. The problem is we can't afford the million dollars plus for each piece of equipment that, frankly, we ride hard. So <clears throat> what we rely on is surplus equipment from the government when we can get it, which uh, these days really isn't as often as we'd like, or we buy used equipment. But at any rate, virtually all of our heavy equipment is purchased used or off of surplus. And I've given you a few um, examples of what we have. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, railroads, you'll recognize the names ballast regulator, tie inserter, tie plate inserter, etc. A lot of huge equipment, all of which was purchased, used, or obtained, as I said, off of government surplus. As a result of that, the equipment will break down. It's used, uh, the, the job it does is very hard on it. There's really no way of helping that. So our track crew and our auto mechanics have to be adept at not only maintaining, but repairing this equipment. And the photograph you see there is one example of a piece of equipment that the track crew has, has they just rebuilt it. I mean, look at it. Uh, you can't really see the detail of the engine or anything, but that's a fresh coat of paint and uh, looks like the wheels aren't on it yet. Uh, but at any rate, this is the kind of work the track crew does. They don't just fix the railroad, they rebuild equipment. So the track crew is responsible for replacing five intersections every year. Now intersections are required not only to cross highways, but also to park an antenna on a particular pad. Think about the configuration again. We have the close in configuration and we have the far out configuration for the 27 antennas. To accomplish that, we have 72 antenna pads alone just to put the 27 antennas on. And to get the antennas onto those pads, you can't just go to a specific spot on the rail and drop the antenna. 
ooh, drop, that's a bad word, sorry, set down an antenna. You have to turn off of the, end, the, the main rail and set the antenna on its own spur, its own pad, of which you know, there's 72 of those. So each one requires an intersection. Look at that first picture. That's a, a very clear picture of, an, ant of a, an intersection coming off of the main line and going towards a pad that is not in the picture. Notice the intersection has massive concrete blocks underneath the rail. This is a relatively new design. We found that the original intersections, which had railroad ties, just didn't last that long. And so we redesigned using a concrete interface instead, and the results have just been fantastic. Quite a success story. No intersection that we have replaced so far with concrete has given us any trouble, which is great. And there's a close-up view, uh, the second picture of uh, some of the track guys at work. <clears throat> we also have a carpentry and grounds shop. This is just an example of some of the work they do. There's always something at the VLA. Uh, they may be burying a giant manhole for fiber communications, for example, the first picture. Uh, the upper picture shows uh, preparation for a slab being poured. And finally, there's some stucco work being done in the third picture. And this is just a little bit of what these guys do. Okay. Um, we have an auto shop, well well-stocked auto shop. There's a brand new lift you see there in the last picture. That just came with some infrastructure funds we received last year. This allows us to safely lift up even the heaviest equipment at the VLA to work underneath it. We have a state-of-the-art machine shop. Uh, recently restocked with new CNC mills and lathes. And these are extremely valuable, extremely expensive, very nice pieces of equipment. Uh, the work required of the VLA machine shop is very precise. Our front end systems, these are the receivers that capture the astronomical data, the very, very faint astronomical data, have to be built to extremely tight tolerances. If we had to order out of house, uh, it would bust our budget, frankly. But we can do the work ourselves. So we have a three person machine shop and uh, they get the job done. We also have site electricians. These are the, the people that not only change out your light bulbs, but they can change out a transformer. And they're responsible for an awful lot. We have uh, over 100 transformers at the VLA that require constant maintenance and or replacement. We have high voltage line switches, switch gears. These are basically where the high power goes in and, the, uh, and is distributed around the site or in a building. Uh, we have a very nice backup power system because given the weather conditions in the central part of New Mexico, sometimes we lose power and we just can't have that. We have to keep observing. So we have a 3.1 megawatt diesel generator that's a few years old now, again, bought with infrastructure funds, located at the site that will kick in should we experience power failures. Uh, the electrical group not only maintain all of this equipment, but they are responsible for most of the upgrades at the site, the changing out of the transformers, the running of the power lines, things like that as well. We have an HVAC shop, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. It's uh, extremely busy for the true man, two man crew of this shop to keep up with all of their responsibilities at the BLA. It's not just the air conditioners and the heaters that keep us, us comfortable, but it's the cooling in the antennas for the electronic racks, not the front end systems. I'll talk about that later, but also all of our fire suppression systems, every bit of plumbing at the site, the site water well, yes, we have our own water and the wastewater and sewage systems. So really, in reality, at the BLA, it really does take a village. It really does take a village. Uh, we have crews to handle just about any situation that you can imagine would come up in a, in a small community. Here's an aerial picture of our sewage lagoon. And uh, this was taken at the time of uh, really shortly after construction of the VLA. It was actually very large at the time. We used to have more than 200 staff at the VLA. 
But now we have uh, quite a bit less on the order of 70 to 85 per day. There we go. And uh, so recently it has undergone a bit of a refurbishment by a person, uh, well, the person who led it was an HVAC person, okay? I mean, the crew gets around. And uh, it is really better suited now for the size of the staff at the site. And also it's much more environmentally friendly these days. Okay. Getting into the antenna itself, front end receiver maintenance is something that goes on at the VLA that not many people think about. The, the gentleman you see in the picture here actually came in from Socorro to do the job maintaining this L-band receiver, but we do have one full-time front-end person located at the VLA itself. And, uh, um, but usually it does take somebody coming in from the outside. We observe from the one to 50 gigahertz frequency range over eight channels. So they're not all as big as this L-band receiver that you see, but there are eight other systems that look a lot like this one, only they increasingly get smaller in size. These front end receivers have to be kept extremely cold. And I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. The Socorro engineers design these and the maintenance of these is largely the, the VLBA base staff, but also the people coming in from Socorro. Cryogenics. Cryogenics is super air conditioning. We have to cool the front end receivers down to incredible levels. We aim for 15 degrees Kelvin. Now, if you're not sure exactly what that is, imagine walking outside at negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 250 degrees Celsius. That's, uh, that's cold. And you can imagine it not only takes a lot of specialized equipment to achieve those numbers, but it takes a lot of electricity as well. Care to guess what our electricity bill is at the VLA every year? Well, it's not quite a very large number starting with a one with a bunch of zeros after it, but it's awfully close. Uh, it's uh, probably the number one expense as far as keeping the VLA operational besides uh, paying everybody's salaries, not only at the VLA, but uh, in RAO in New Mexico in general. So um, we, we aim to keep it cool. The vast amount of power is used to cool down receivers. Once they're cool, it takes less power to keep them that way. So it, it, we are highly motivated not to let these fail. And uh, so um, uh, if we do that, you know, obviously we have to warm them up work on them, cool them down again. And that not only takes money, but it takes time. It'll take over a day just to accomplish that, that task. So the cryogenics group, their job is to maintain their systems in such a way that that happens as little as possible. And you see a couple of pictures there. The first one, uh, Linda there is uh, doing some research for components, uh, getting ready to uh, outfit some what we refer to as cold heads with new parts. And the second picture there, that's Michael. He's actually rebuilding one of these cold heads. And you don't want any dirt getting in to those systems. Uh, dirt equals insulation equals a failed cool system. So he has to work under what are essentially clean room conditions. We have a servo shop. Servo are the folks that keep your antenna Pointing. So if the antenna is moving, if the dish is moving up and down or side to side, azimuth and elevation, remember those words, uh, then you can bet the servo group has been on the job and maintaining their systems so that they are operating within specified parameters, which actually can be quite, quite severe. These are very, very precise movements that are required to zoom in on a celestial object. So this requires four of those 300 pound motors per antenna, two for azimuth, two for elevation, with an accuracy of 10 arc seconds. What's an arc second? Well, an arc second times 10 is one 360th of a degree or 
0.0028 of a degree. I can't even think that small, okay, seriously. But at any rate, you can see these, these have to be very, very precise in their pointing and the servo shop. Those are the people that keep our systems operating to that level. Now, the main system they deal with is referred to as the ACU or the antenna control unit. The ACUs on half of the VLA antennas are still the original units that were built with the array back in the 70s. And these are getting old and starting to fail and it's hard to find parts to repair them. So what the servo group has done with a little help from engineering is they have redesigned the ACU with modern electronics and architecture. And to, to date, they have replaced half of these systems on the VLA antennas. So the group not only maintains the old systems, they build and install the new systems as well. We take safety very, very seriously at the VLA. The ES&S group, Environment, Safety, and Security, has a permanent presence at the VLA. There are two full-time safety officers, and there is one full-time fire chief. And these folks have their fingers in the everything to, to keep us not only safe, but to keep us compliant with regulations. They uh, prepare the staff in the areas of emergency services and preparedness. They work with the fire brigade. So if a fire ever breaks out, yeah, you know, we have a fire engine. We, we actually have people trained that can go and put the fire out safely. We work at high elevations. The top of the antenna is a formidable place to be. And so we are prepared in that we know how to do high elevation rescue if necessary. And there's a volunteer group of staff for that as well. The ESNS group, they, aside from their day jobs, their daily duties going around and making sure that everybody's acting in a safe way, they have all these other responsibilities as well. And uh, it's really a feather in the cap of the organization that we are so well defined in this group. We have a warehouse. There's a lot of shipping and receiving from the VLA and not only the VLA, but the VLBA, the very large baseline array, uh, which you may have heard about 10 antennas scattered from St. Croix to Hawaii. Anyways, they break down to, they need attention to, and their parts come through the VLA warehouse. And so uh, they keep on the ball and get a lot of visitors every day to check parts out for routine as well as pretty esoteric repairs on the array. And last and certainly not least at the VLA, we have a visitor center. And these are the, the, the people who man the visitor center are the fine folks that are hosting our event today. You can see here, we have uh, the outside of the building. We have one of the guided tours of which under normal times they'll do a couple of months. And also uh, we have sites um, around the site that they will take people to, to explain how things work and uh, just all the little nuances and the history of the VLA. You can see one of the tour groups there is actually in operations, the center picture at the bottom. And uh, there uh, we have one of our operators explaining all of the multitasking he does to keep the array running smoothly every day. And I, I wasn't there when the picture was taken, but I would uh, venture to bet that at some time during that talk, his radio went off or the phone rang or both at the same time. Finally, the VLA does host extracurricular activities. Occasionally there may be a truck company that wants to film a commercial with the cool antennas in the background or a movie will film at the VLA. Uh, the first picture you see should be familiar to many of you who have seen the movie Contact. Jodie Foster in the picture there, uh, I just want to give a shout out. She, uh, I, I jokingly refer to her as the patron saint of the VLA. Uh, Jody is a person who not only was extremely easy to get along with when she was filming Contact at the VLA, for example, she would take her brown bag lunch and she would eat with the rank and file staff at the site. You know, there wasn't any kind of uh, star treatment going on there. Not only that, but recently in the last few years when the new movie was filmed for the visitor center, she was approached to ask if she was available to do the narration of that movie. And not only did she do the narration, 
she didn't charge us for it. So that's just kind of the kind of person she is. And normally I wouldn't go off on that, but when you see that kind of example, uh, you like to give it a shout out. Uh, there's some other pictures there. Maybe you've recognized some of the, the album cover or 2010. The only thing I want to say about 2010, if you've seen that movie, it's a great movie. The first 10 minutes, uh, the actor is on one of our antennas. He essentially is playing the part of the site director, even though it's not quite the same role as depicted in the movie. And he is, he has a rag in his hand and it looks like he's polishing the antenna. Well, I can tell you, I never did that when I was site director, but anyways, and I know I didn't have people for that either. Okay. Um, the last picture in there shows, I believe it's from Terminator, and I don't know why people like to blow up our stuff. It makes me sad, but at any rate, we do get a lot of visitors, some pretty high profile ones at the VLA. With that, I conclude my talk, and we'll move now into the question and answer session. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. That was awesome. I love hearing about, I feel like people hear a lot about astronomers, but hearing about the like entire village of people, engineers, warehouse workers, tour guides, everything is awesome. So we have a ton of really great questions. And I think one of the most popular ones that was asked in a bunch of different ways is about solar energy. So people phrase it a lot of different ways. So I would just ask you to speak on why not solar energy or talk about that a little bit? Okay. Well, the idea of powering the array or portions of the array using alternative energy sources such as solar and wind energy has come up from time to time. We do not do that right now. And there's a simple reason, infrastructure. Uh, we've looked at it. It's cost prohibitive. Even though we're very solvent in our budget, we don't have that much money and, uh, and getting it would be a real, a real uh, challenge. However, okay, there's always a however, with the next generation VLA, we are currently undergoing a solar study to do just this, uh, to either power a great portion of the array or perhaps just the DC uh, requirements. For example, the correlator, the supercomputer runs on DC power. It doesn't run on AC power. So why not use a solar array just for the correlator? These are the kind of questions that we're asking ourselves and doing the research on even right now. Very cool. So how long does it take to lift the dish off and secure it for maintenance? <laughs> well, the whole job takes about two and a half weeks if things go well, but to actually physically lift the dish off, set it on a red iron structure and remove the bottom of the antenna away takes a morning maybe two and a half, three hours. Okay. It's the preparation that's the key. That's what takes longer, but the actual physical act doesn't take that long. I think if I was in charge of that, I would be nervous just the whole time. So process it's, people who do that. It can be nerve wracking, but this is why we have very, uh, very good procedures and practice sessions. And we have the, the older, more experienced staff training the younger staff. And uh, it's really quite the event. It's an all hands on deck activity. Virtually every shop is involved. Absolutely. So we have a couple people curious about um, how the VLA has been affected by um, the situation with COVID and uh, what, how that's affected daily operations and things like that. Okay. Well, I, I'm not just saying this. I have to tell you, I am extremely proud to work for NRAO and for our director, Tony Beasley. When COVID hit, and the nation started going into lockdown. Our director was extremely proactive. The first thing he did was send our staff home. So we operated the VLA, we continued observing because it was running fine, but we didn't allow anybody at the site until we could get a handle on the situation and develop procedures. Our, our safety people stepped up, They. Uh, they started writing procedures with our engineers and we cross-checked them several times. And at any rate, what we've now done is we have most of the people back at work at the VLA, but we have social distancing. Everybody wears a mask. We test everybody every day when they come into work. And uh, basically we've learned how to do our job a little bit differently. We can't be in each other's faces when we're turning a wrench anymore. 
We have to find alternate ways of doing things and we've succeeded. Awesome. Um, so what are some of the greatest sources of RF interference that you have to deal with? Well, that's a, there are two ways to answer that question. First of all, you know, the VLA observes essentially from the one to 50 gigahertz uh, frequency spectrum. And at 2.35 gigahertz, this is in, the, in S band, what we refer to as S band, one of our eight bands, you have your satellite entertainment channels, uh, dish network, things like that. Um, and they just totally blast radio signals out of the air. There is nothing we can do to see past those satellites because of the RFI coming from those satellites. So I'm telling any, any invasion force from outer space right now, if you wanna hide from us, you wanna make sure you're broadcasting in that range because we won't see you, okay? <laughs> but um, but that's, that we can deal with. It's a, it, it's a limitation and we just accept it. What really is a problem are cell phones. And this is why when visitors come out to the site, we ask you to put your cell phone in airplane mode or turn it off altogether. Another huge problem are all these wonderful new gadgets we have on our automobiles, all the Bluetooth connections. So this uh, is becoming an ever increasing problem. And uh, it's something that the NGVLA is very concerned about when, when planning their visitor experience, for example. So I think speaking on your tangent of hazardous things coming from elsewhere, are there precautions taken at the VLA if they predicted hazardous solar storm were to reach planet Earth? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's the first time uh, I've been asked that question. Uh, I can <laughs> tell you we have nothing built in to our electronics that would, uh, that would protect us from such an onslaught from the sun. We do have attenuations, uh, that we, attenuators that we can put into our front end system so we can observe the sun. But if it started going crazy on us, uh, that, our, our best defense there would be to point the dishes away from the sun and then they would be protected. Uh, front end electronics is extremely sensitive as you can well imagine. And uh, if we were to actually look straight at the sun during a catastrophic event like that, we would probably blow our systems up. Yeah. Figuratively speaking. All right, I'm gonna ask you one more question um, before we give people a break before the next talk. Are there any spare antennas or dishes kept on hand for when ones have technical problems? Um, and what would happen if several were damaged by a storm? And I think related, if you can answer all these in one go, um, do you keep the equipment in certain conditions while the antennas are being moved from pad to pad? Yes. <laughs> okay, we have one spare antenna. That's the 28th antenna I mentioned in the talk. So we're always rotating one into the barn so that it can be completely overhauled to, uh, so that we can avoid catastrophic breakdowns. Uh, good maintenance is the key to everything. Now, do we have spare parts? Yes, we do. We have uh, spare cryogenic systems, spare electronics. We have some spare mechanical parts. We certainly have spare motors. Uh, we have spare dish panels, but as far as a spare dish, no, we don't have that. And we, we just have to repair what goes on. Now, one of the things that uh, we do, and this is dictated by science, is we have what's called the three antenna rule. The three antenna rule states that we can continue with observations, scientific observations, as long as at least, uh, what is it, 24 antennas, 25, 26, 27, yeah, that's right. Okay, are fully operational. And uh, if we get down to one more antenna failure though, then the data is suspect, would become suspect, and we cease operations, generally speaking. So we do everything we can to maintain the array at a minimum of that number of antennas, but the truth is we're usually much higher. We're always observing at 26 or 27 antennas. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. This was super interesting. Um, we are going to have a six-minute break before the next speaker, which is Amy Kimball. Um, so I hope everybody uh, gets a chance to stretch, grab a drink, get some snacks, come back here uh, for three or nope, I'm going to say the wrong time again. So I'm just going to say, come back in five minutes and we'll have our next guest speaker. And thank you again, Chris. Okay. Thank you all very much.
After a 10-year effort, the reinvention of the VLA is finally complete. To integrate the newly upgraded antenna with the rest of the array, the telescope's maintenance crew must perform another vital task high on the desert plains in an intricate dance between man and machine. Not only do the VLA's antennas move to track objects in the sky, they also move throughout the array itself on the backs of custom-built antenna transporters. Engineers maneuver these 90-ton flatbed locomotives underneath the antenna's triangular base. 230 tons of steel and sensitive electronics is hoisted into the air and the 94-foot tall structure is slowly unveiled. The antenna's sheer size makes transporting it a potential hazard. The crew cannot move antennas in winds of more than 20 miles per hour. And maximum speed is just under 5 miles an hour. The array is crisscrossed by more than 40 miles of railway lines. The antennas are moved along tracks that lead 13 miles out from the center of the array to 72 separate antenna stations. These stations are connected to the main track by perpendicular spurs. When the transporter reaches the desired station, engineers use hydraulic jacks to pick up its wheel trucks independently and rotate them 90 degrees to make the turn. They carefully set the structure down and the upgraded antenna makes its new home in the vast array. About every four months, the antennas are moved into one of four different configurations, A through D. Each configuration changes the depth and detail the telescope sees. Combining data from all four configurations delivers the best image quality. When the antennas are packed together in the D configuration, the telescope can see faintly glowing clouds of gas. When they are at their farthest distance from each other in the A configuration, they reveal the finest details of the radio universe. Now, with antennas fully spread out, the VLA is finally ready to observe the dwarf galaxy Henais 210. The world's most storied radio telescope prepares to once again open its eyes on the universe. Copy that, we're getting ready to run the C-band observation. The antennas turn toward the southern sky. In the darkness above, the light that left Henais 210 some 30 million years ago finally approaches our Earth. It has traveled more than 150 quintillion miles and persevered through gas and dust to share its secret. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed our quick break there. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the 40th anniversary VLA celebration. We're gonna move along to our next speaker. Before we do, let me just remind you, if you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A. That helps us figure out uh, which are questions and wishes this just discussion um, in the chat. You can put any technical problems you're having or just general discussion that you want to have. Um, also, if you have a question that's already been asked in the Q&A, please upvote it so that we know that it's a popular question and we make sure to get to it first. 
that being said, let me introduce our next speaker, Amy. Can you turn your video on and wave so we can say hello? Amy Kimball is gonna give our next talk. Let me introduce her. Uh, Amy is originally from Ann Arbor where she earned her bachelor's degree in math and physics at the University of Michigan. Her interest in astronomy began with an undergraduate research project on satellite galaxies using data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Amy, I got one of those SDSS plates. They're pretty cool. Um, <laughs> she landed a postdoc at the NRAO in Charlottesville, Virginia, where she supported users of the Alma telescope and continued to pursue her own research on quasars, which are supermassive black holes at the center of other galaxies. Moving to the other side of the planet, to Sydney, Australia, for a postdoc, she rejoined the NRAO team as a full member of their scientific staff. Her main focus is to support users of the VLA, developing the VLA Sky Survey, and continuing to pursue her own research on radio quasars. Amy, take it away. Thank you, Melissa. So today I'm going to talk to you about mapping the radio sky. So talking about uh, radio surveys and in particular, the very exciting uh, radio survey that we're we're undertaking right now, which is the VLA Sky Survey. So let me share my screen with everyone. And can you confirm that you see my title slide that says mapping the radio sky? Yes, we do. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, so, um, so this is an image, which is a composite image of on the bottom, a, you know, an optical picture basically from a camera and then a view of what the radio sky would look like if we actually had eyes that could see in the radio. So there's some really crazy stuff out there. You can see, you know, sort of different weird shapes. Not everything looks like a, a point of light. Um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in the radio. And it's really important that we observe in the radio as well as in the optical and in other um, wavelengths as well, because we learn different information from what we see at the different wavelengths. So here is a graphic showing what the Whirlpool galaxy would look like with, you know, different filters. So an optical one in the middle, that's what we would see with our eyes. Um, and then the furthest one to the left is how it would look in the, in the radio. And this is an image of um, where cold gas is found. So we can see that cold gas sort of lives in the spiral arms and that's where uh, stars tend to form. And I wanna point out that um, sometimes images like this are referred to as false color images. And I want to just um, fix a, a misconception. I think it's, it's more um, accurate to refer to them as representative color images. So this is a color scale where the, the different color shows us the, how much radio uh, is coming from, from different areas. And since our eyes don't see in the radio, that's basically how all, all radio images that, that astronomers make, we use some sort of color scale to represent uh, how much emission is, is coming from, from different areas. Um, so there's another misconception I want to, uh, to um, talk about before I, before I move on, and that is what an astronomer does day to day. So here are two graphics showing what, um, what folks might think that astronomers do. So um, one is a picture of a, an astronomer looking through a telescope with, um, with her own eyes. And the other one is a picture from uh, the movie Contact with um, Jodie Foster's character uh, listening to, um, to the VLA, to the radio telescope. So um, we neither look with our eyes through telescopes directly um, for our science, nor do we, do we listen to the, to the data. Everything is pretty much done by computers. So here's what, what it sort of really looks like. Um, we use a telescope to look at the sky and that could be um, a telescope that's in space like the, the Hubble Space Telescope, or it could be a telescope on, on the ground, which could be an optical telescope or a radio telescope. And we have um, a lot of electronics and very powerful computers that turn the raw information from, from the sky into, um, into little zeros and ones, bits and bytes, and sent, we get that data on our, on our computer. So um, although we do spend some time at a computer operating a telescope, most of our day-to-day -day work is done at a computer basically analyzing the data that we have um, taken at the telescope or that was provided by some uh, by, by a survey by a group that 
that uh, does a sky survey and, and provides that data to the astronomy community. So what sort of things do we see in the in the radio? So here's just a sort of zoo of various kinds of objects. So this is again a representative color image of a of a protoplanetary disk. You can actually see the the stripes showing where where um, you know where where planets are forming. They've sort of uh, you know gathered up all the material in those areas. Uh, we can use radio to study auroras around brown dwarfs. So just like the uh, the Earth has an aurora when energetic par particles enter our atmosphere at the magnetic poles, uh, brown dwarfs have auroras as well. And in fact, other, other planets as well, such as uh, planets in our own solar system. And um, those energetic particles interacting with magnetic fields produce, uh, produce radio emission. Um, so this is, a, this is a picture of um, a representative color image showing um, magnetic field strength uh, in, the, in the radiation belts around, around Jupiter. And there's two graphics showing that we can see it, uh, how it varies over time. Uh, we can use radio to measure the, the temperature of the moon. Uh, a very common use of radio among astronomers is to identify star forming regions in other galaxies. Uh, this is a, a color scale that shows um, how gas is rotating. So the, the blue colors show gas that is rotating towards us in this galaxy and the red shows, um, oh, sorry, there's two. <laughs> the one on the left is, um, shows where the gas is. So red is where there's more gas and blue is where there's less gas. And then the one on the right, um, the blue shows where the gas is rotating toward us and the red shows where the gas is rotating away from us. So we can actually measure rotation of gas in, in other galaxies. Uh, one of my personal, I guess my personal favorite, uh, radio quasars, since that's what I study for my own research. Um, so this is just an example of really a, a very um, sort of a fiducial source. This is, this is what a lot of radio quasars look like. They have um, a point of emission in the center where the host galaxy is and huge jets coming out way beyond the galaxy itself. And those jets interact with surrounding material and form these huge bubbles or lobes. And uh, we have a lot of folks, especially at, at NRAO, who study pulsars, which are uh, fast spinning neutron stars, and they emit in the, the radio because of interactions of particles with, the, with their magnetic fields. Okay, so these are all lots of very interesting objects, and I've shown you one of, of each of these types, but are these objects normal? Is that a normal star forming galaxy? Is it normal for brown dwarfs to have auroras? Uh, so the examples that I showed are, are just, um, you know, one of each, one of each type. So how would we, how would we learn what is, um, whether these, gal these objects are, are normal? To do that, we would like to have a really large data set where we can study all kinds of objects. And that is what uh, sky surveys are really good at, at producing. So I have a little Venn diagram showing the types of things that you might observe in if you have a large data set from, um, from a sky survey. So you have things that are known that you're studying and you have things that, you're, that are unknown. You observe things that are common and then uh, sometimes you find things that are, that are rare. And this helps us uh, study uh, popul uh, objects in lots of different ways. So for example, if we take something that's known and common, we already knew about it, it's very common, but if we have a very large data set with a lot of examples, then we can, we can do demographic studies of those objects. Um, if you have something that is common, but you never, uh, you never knew about it before, you, before um, observing it with a new sky survey, then you've revealed a new common population. Um, so, and then, of course, they're, they're outliers. They're the things that, you, that are rare and you would like to, to, know, to find more examples of them. And that would be a sort of the rare known things. And you kind of need to do a very large, um, a lot of observations in order to detect things that are, that are rare. Um, and then, of course, there's the very exciting rare and un unknown things, which are sort of the brand new, brand new discoveries. Uh, an example of that would be, um, you know, the very first fast radio burst that was that was ever that was ever discovered. Um, so, uh, so what I like I do in my research is to study the demographics of um, extragalactic radio sources, and I use not just radio surveys but also optical surveys. And um, this is a this is a really um, a really powerful approach I find to uh, to studying these these types of um, types of sources. So with optical, you can identify whether something is a, a star or a galaxy or, or a quasar. 
and then you can see in the radio whether things are you know powerful in the radio or weak in the radio. And what you end up with is sort of a, a multi-dimensional um, histogram. And this is how you do population demographics. So imagine this Rubik's cube is a is a um, is a, a three by nine cube where each individual tiny cube represents the intersection of one optical property, one radio property, and one some other property. Um, it could be size, it could be um, the shape, the morphology. And the way that I do uh, studies of population demographics is basically to see how um, a very large population of sources uh, populates the different individual um, individual sections, individual tiny cubes of that, uh, that multidimensional histogram. And then you can you can learn how different radio properties correlate with other other properties, um, other radio properties or other optical properties. And, uh, and I've been doing work like this since the very beginning of my astronomy career using uh, sky surveys. So we have, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the historic VLA radio surveys. There are two really um, important radio sky surveys that were performed with the VLA uh, back in the 90s. And I'm going to refer to them mostly by their acronyms. There's the NRAO VLA Sky Survey, the NVSS, and a cleverly named survey called the FIRST which stands for faint images of the radio sky at 20 centimeters. So both of these sky surveys actually observe the sky at the same frequency, and yet they, they provide very different information. Um, so I'll, I'll give more examples of this on the, the following slides, but the NVSS was a lower resolution survey and first was a higher resolution survey. NVSS observed the entire sky that the VLA could see, that's everything above minus 40 degrees declination. You can think of that as minus 40 degrees latitude. And first observed about a quarter of the, the entire sky. Um, and the reason that uh, they have such different um, aerial coverage is that because the NVSS was performed at a lower resolution, it could observe um, a much larger area of sky in the same amount of time. So hopefully everyone has been following along um, from earlier talks and, and knows about the different configurations of the VLA. We go through four different configurations. A is the most extended configuration and D is the most compact configuration. Um, and in A configuration, it's like ha sort of like having um, two eyes that are very far apart. You can see very fine structure much more easily. So in A configuration, we see the highest resolution, uh, most fine structure images. Uh, but the downside of that is that we actually, with A configuration, we lose the ability to detect some extended emission. Whereas D configuration is, is the opposite. D observes with the lowest resolution, um, but it, it's able to observe all the extended emission of, of objects. And so you get a, a complete brightness measurement. Um, and D configuration is certainly the most photogenic because you have all the antennas within about, um, about a kilometer of each other. Um, and here's a lovely image uh, demonstrating that. Uh, and here's an example of how the same source, Hercules A, would look in the four different configurations. Uh, and then I've labeled where um, the first survey actually observed in configuration B and the NVS survey in configuration D. Um, and then you can see there's A, a and C also. Astronomers make use of all the four different configurations very heavily. Um, so the, the example showing for, for B, um, you get much more fine structure. Uh, but um, D shows you that you can see really the, the more extended emission of this source. And when you put all four uh, observations from the four different configurations together, you really get a very good, um, you can do a very good analysis of prop radio properties of, of an object. And so here are some examples um, from the first survey and the NVSS survey uh, specifically that, that I found. So, the, so um, the one on the left, uh, or sorry, on the top, um, you can see that there's actually several different sources with very different um, different morphologies. And you can study those morphologies very easily with the first survey, the high resolution data. Um, but then with the NVSS survey, you do a much better job of, of measuring the full amount of emission um, from any of these any of these sources. Uh, and so here's just an example of um, something that I, I worked on for my, my dissertation um, oh, so many years ago. I combined data from the first survey and the NVSS survey and um, determined that if you use the, the data that was provided by these surveys, which included um, 
brightness or flux measurements on different, uh, different angular scales, you could make a, a really good estimate of the morphology of a source without even having to look at any images. And so that's very powerful because there are about uh, 10, million, <laughs> 10 million sources just in, the, just in the first survey. And so this little graphic shows, shows an example of that. So the first survey, the, the data that came from that sky survey that the astronomers who produced it um, provided to the community, it includes a measurement of the, the brightest pixel, how, how bright the brightest pixel is that covers that source. And so I have a graphic of just a little blue, um, a blue pentagon demonstrating, you know, the sort of size scale of that would be sort of one pixel. Uh, and then it also produced, um, provided a, a flux or brightness measurement on a, on a slightly larger um, angular scale. And then what NVSS did is it provided a, a flux density measurement on an even larger scale than that. And so here are sort of three examples of um, just, just imagine the different, uh, the different brightness measurements on these three different scales that you might um, measure for these three different sources. So the one on the left, um, it's basically just almost limited to just one pixel. And so the, the peak pixel has the same amount of um, emission in it as the larger first scale and the very large NVSS scale. So if you just compare those three quantitative measurements, you can already tell immediately that a source that where all those flux measurements are the same is a, is a compact source. Uh, a source that's you know, somewhat more extended, um, the larger first scale and the very large NVSS scale would have uh, the same flux measurement overall. Um, but then the, the, the brightest pixel would have only a, only a fraction of, of that, um, that flux density. And then on the right, these are the ones that are very exciting to look at, a, a really complex source where you would, you would have three different flux measurements on these three different scales. Um, and so I, I sort of quantified that in my, as part of my dissertation, but it's really, it's just an example of how incredibly powerful a quantitative measurement is um, from surveys. And you can determine things like, uh, like a qualitative measurement of morphology. Um, and then you can sort of identify what sources you wanna go and look at that are the interesting ones to look at. Okay, so that's um, the, oh, oh yes. And I, I wanna point out actually that um, these, these surveys which were performed in the nineties, you know, many decades ago are still incredibly useful to astronomers today. And so it's just, this is, these are showing uh, the number of citations over time of the main, uh, the main papers that of the, that that um, that introduced the the two surveys, and so uh, I just want to stress that um, uh, data from a from a sky survey. So where you're not just looking at individual sources, but you're looking at a huge chunk of of the sky, um, has a really powerful legacy for research. Um, okay, so now I wanted to jump forward and. Um, tell folks that, uh, you know, about 20 years after the, um, uh, I guess 30 years after the birth of the, the VLA, there was a major upgrade. Um, so most of the hardware, um, so the, the antennas remain the same, but they were sort of um, rebuilt uh, inside with all new receivers and all new um, software. And we switched to, uh, to fiber optics. So we switched from analog to, to digital. And um, what this, this graphic on the left is showing is a, is a comparison of what we could do with the VLA before this upgrade and what we could do after the upgrade. So each of the little green um, squares shows the area of, um, of the frequency range, which I forgot to label. It's um, from one gigahertz to the farthest left um, to 50 gigahertz to the, to the furthest on the right. And we only had those green chunks available to us before the upgrade. And then that white bar shows the amount of instantaneous bandwidth that we could record data for. After the upgrade, um, we now can, can access um, data in, in that entire frequency range, um, not all at the same time, <laughs> but um, certainly in, in, different, in different chunks with different receivers. And we actually can observe um, eight gigahertz of, of bandwidth at any one time, which is represented here with that, that yellow bar. Uh, this is a lot more data than was available before, and so we needed a brand new uh, supercomputer, um, which is shown in this graphic on the on the bottom right, um, to to help us uh, to help us uh, put put all that data into a form that that astronomers um, that astronomers can use. And um, another thing that was uh, done. That, that the upgrade allowed us to do is a, is a brand new observing mode. And the reason I'm gonna tell you about this is because this is the observing mode that we are doing our brand new sky survey in uh, as, we, as we speak. 
So instead of your sort of typical, you know, point and, and shoot, you, you, you point to an object you want to look at, and then you sit there and take data, and then you move to the next object. This is a new observing mode called on-the-fly mosaicing or on-the-fly imaging. The antennas are constantly moving and are recording data the whole time. Um, it, you, could, you could do uh, various speeds, but the speed that we're using for this sky survey we're doing now is that we'll scan about 10 degrees in about three minutes. Now you can imagine if you, were, if you had your, your, your handheld camera and you were moving the camera while you took a photo, um, you would see things smeared out. Or you know, if someone moves while you're taking a photo, it gets smeared out. And we don't wanna do that. We don't want our, our survey to be, to be smeared out. So what we do is we do very fast shutter clicks as we're constantly moving the antennas. So this little graphic on the bottom shows um, shows a sort of how that how that works. Um, so the the field of view is uh, the instantaneous field of view is shown in the in the green, and what the antennas do is raster about ten degrees in about three minutes, and the little X's represent the individual shutter clicks. So while the antennas are constantly in, mo in motion, we're doing shutter clicks fast enough that we get you know a pretty clear um, image in each of those uh, 0.45 second shutter clicks. And then we do a raster in the other direction and we will slowly do the entire sky. And because there's, there's some overlap um, of the different uh, shutter clicks that's you know, by design, um, the, the equivalent time on source is five seconds. So basically we, if we wanted to do the same survey of the entire sky um, without this constant motion, we would spend five seconds on every individual um, point. And uh, and here's a movie just showing showing how that how that looks if you're watching uh, a VLA antenna antenna do this. So you can see it's 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 sped up clearly, um, but the antenna is sort of going back and forth, back and forth, and it's doing a, a VLA sky survey observation. Um, so it's using this on the fly mosaicing mode um, to do this. And this is over uh, I think about three and a half or four hours of observation. Oh, so. Um, uh, something else I, I want to talk about that makes um, <laughs> survey observations and VLA observations in general um, fairly difficult. So a big challenge to us is that there's a lot of radio frequency interference, which we refer to as, as RFI. So um, this is data that is coming from something other than the sky that is emitting in radio waves. Um, so especially that might be satellites, such as the satellites that send um, satellite radio signals, which are, are really great when you're driving in your car. Um, and really, really sad for me when I, when I walk through the doors of work and I have to then analyze data that has um, these satellite signals in it. Uh, and cell phones, of course. Um, and so this is why cell phones are not allowed uh, to be used um, on, the, on the site near, near the VLA. And I want to show an example of what happens to data if it actually gets um, uh, gets interfered with um, by this other interference. So this um, inset is showing the uh, radio image of a of a star um, that emits strongly in the radio. And the upper left, this is what um, it would normally look like. And then on the bottom right is the is the same part of the sky when there was radio interference. So we um, we observe, happened to observe near a satellite that was emitting at the same frequency that, that we were, not, not me, I didn't actually do the, the observations, but you can see that can be really damaging um, to our data. So we have uh, tricks and tools of how to, how to deal with that. And um, for, the survey, for the survey that I'm, I'm about to, to tell you details about, um, we just try very hard not to observe anywhere near a satellite that's emitting at the frequencies that we are observing. <clears throat> Okay, um, so the VLA Sky Survey, because I don't think I had a, a, a specific intro slide about uh, the Sky Survey. Um, so this is a, a survey that we're doing with this new on-the-fly mosaicing mode. And here's how the, the um, images compare to um, images of the same source with the historical uh, first Sky Survey. So there's an image from the NVSS on the left that had a 45 arc second resolution from the first survey in the middle that had a four and a half arc second resolution. And now with the VLA sky survey, we have a two and a half arc second um, resolution. And in case folks are wondering what I mean by an arc second, um, so I think everyone knows that there's 360 degrees in a circle. 
Um, and if you divide each of those degrees into 60, then you get what we call an arc minute. Um, so the names sort of follow the names that we use for minutes, uh, seconds, minutes, and, and hours. Um, and then if you take one of those arc minutes and you divide it into 60, that is what one arc second is. So um, if you were to look at a soccer ball from um, all, over 750 meters away, so that is something like 2,200 feet away, um, the amount of the amount of uh, that that the width of that soccer ball in your view that is equivalent to one arc second. Um, and so here's oh this is actually Im images of the same source. So going back for a second, so so this source you can see that um, you can't really tell what's going on in the NVSS image. You get a better idea with the first image, and then you can see really clearly in the VLA Sky Survey image that there are these um, these sort of two jets coming out. Uh, from some source. And so here is that same image again with um, overlaid on, on optical images. So on the, on the left is um, in contours, we see the first uh, survey detection of this source. And um, there's, it seems like there's emission coming from uh, you know, different areas and it's hard to really tell what's going on. On the right, you can see a, um, a different color scale um, image. And then the blue shows the, where the radio emission is coming from. And that's from a, a VLA sky survey um, observation. And you can see there's two jets coming out um, from, this, from this galaxy here. So that's very cool. Um, so here's another example. Uh, on the right is a, is a VLA sky survey image. On the left is a, an NVSS image. So that was the, the, that, the one on the left is basically the information that we had about, um, about this area of sky uh, in the radio. And you can see that there are two sources as we can see in the, the center image, which is an optical image, um, but the, 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 um, the radio from those two sources is sort of like merged together. Uh, in the VLA sky survey image, we can not only resolve the two radio emission from the two different objects, but this is very exciting. These are actually two different objects that both have huge radio jets um, coming out from, the, from their host galaxies. Um, so we, you can see there's very, very high resolution. Uh, and so here's another example where the, this representative color image shows basically the magnetic field um, strength of of uh, of these sources, so these are the two same sources again, and again in um, so the the NVSS survey, which was a, a really excellent survey, um, but it just was not at very high resolution, and so um, you can see with the the VLA sky survey image, we can actually learn information about um, the magnetic fields in these sources on on you know on different on, as a function of uh, location in the in the jet. So that was very exciting. Okay, um, so here, now I wanna just show you sort of a, a generic um, VLA sky survey image. So we observe, um, we're observing the whole sky. Um, we're actually observing the whole sky three times. So we'll get information about, um, about how the sky changes. And we create images of the sky in one square degree at a time. This was actually the very first VLA sky survey image that was ever um, provided uh, to the, to the astronomy community. Um, and you, you can't see a whole lot because it's, it's pretty zoomed out. You can see some things, but I just wanna point out that um, the individual, you know, sort of the instantaneous field of view as we're scanning over, over the sky is represented by that blue circle. Um, and that little white dot down in the, um, in the left of this image, that's not a, that's not a speck of dust on your, on your screen, that is actually the resolution element. So that's basically one, one pixel basically of, um, of, the, of the survey. And if we just pick some random locations where to zoom in, we can see that we get really, um, we see that there's a lot of really interesting and, and complicated um, emission going on. And this is just from one image of the sky, one square degree of the sky um, in this image. Uh, and there are ways that you can um, you can get different images uh, images of the sky from uh, different areas from the VLA Sky Survey uh, online yourself if you are so inclined. Um, so we are working closely with um, the Canadian Initiative for Radio Astronomy Data Analysis in uh, in Toronto, and they have produced this really excellent image cutout web service. And so if you have a um, some area of your sky and you want to see what it looks like, you can go ahead and, and you know, enter the coordinates there and see what, see what comes up. Um, so here I, I grabbed um, a location and looked at the VLAS image and the NVSS image. 
Um, here's a really nice mosaic of, of radio jets uh, from, from radio galaxies that was compiled from, um, from data from the VLA Sky Survey. So I just think this is a really cool one um, to look at. And of course, it's really nice to look at, but we can actually, uh, if we, we can in detail study these individual, individual sources. Um, so here's some other interesting science that has come out of the, the VLA Sky Survey already. Um, so this is from a, 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 a paper from a, from a friend of mine where the, she did a comparison of um, sources that were detected in the VLA Sky Survey images and looked for sources in those same locations from um, the historical survey data from the, from the first survey and identified that there were a lot of sources that uh, were not there in first and now are actually quite noticeable in the VLA Sky Survey. So our, um, are, are quite bright. And with further follow-up, uh, she identified that these, these have um, other properties which, ma which make it clear that these are, um, these are radio jets and these seem to indicate newly born uh, radio quasars. So they're actually a, a couple dozen and I'm just showing a, um, an example about half of them here. Um, so, and this is another uh, really exciting discovery that was made with, um, with VLA Sky Survey data in comparison to other historical data. Um, and I want to point out this, this science was done by, um, by an undergraduate student at uh, the University of Guanajuato. Uh, so the, the image on the left um, show the grayscale is uh, the VLA Sky Survey image and the inset is an, is an optical image. And before the VLA Sky Survey um, was performed, uh, the radio information was known, but the positions were not known very accurately. And so that little white galaxy, which is pointed out with the, the red line, um, was thought to be the host galaxy of this, uh, this emission. Then with uh, the VLA Sky Survey data um, and the high resolution and the very accurate positions, um, she was able to determine that the, the host galaxy was actually a different galaxy. Uh, and that became very obvious when, when comparing these images at high resolution. And so in fact, this host galaxy was much further away than the galaxy shown in white. And this is actually a really enormous um, set of radio jets. Uh, it's five and a half million light years across. And then on, on the right is, a, is just another, another example. So this is one that, um, that really, you know, sometimes uh, we just need to, to look at images to discover new things. And that is what this, um, this undergraduate student did was she did uh, took I think it was about about four thousand square degrees of data and and looked through a lot of them visually and identified new giant sources that had never been um, that were not known previously. Um, and so I'm going to um, to stop there, but I want to point out that if you want to learn more, we have some really excellent. Um, web pages that talk about the VLA Sky Survey. So we have um, the uh, one that if you is the the links are given up top. So public.nrea.edu slash slash VLAS. You can go there and see the the progress of the survey over time. So this graphic shows actually the amount of sky that we observed um, uh, the when we observed the first half of the sky the first time. And then uh, we also have some really nice uh, images in, a, in an image gallery as well. Um, that you can find online. So I encourage you to go to those to go to those websites and uh, learn more about about the VLA Sky Survey. And I'm going to stop. And I hope that there are some questions. Melissa, I will pass it back to you. Oh, we have lots of questions. Um, so let me just pull up. First of all, we have the I'm going to say elephant in the sky, which is Starlink, because a lot of people have questions about how that's going to affect things given everything you talked about with um, RFI. Right, so um, so Starlink, uh, to be honest, I don't know all uh, the details, um, but my understanding is that, uh, well, it depends on what the exact frequency is that the Starlink um, is going to be, uh, to be emitting at. And I admit, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, it's certainly already affecting um, optical observations because we can, you know, see those those satellites as they as they go across the sky. So this is, in general, um, this is something that radio astronomers are. We we realize that that uh, 
you know, this, this is, this is happening. You know, we, we don't, we're people too. We don't want to not have good internet and not have cell phones and not have satellite radio. We want all those things. Um, what we would like is to find a way to, to work um, with technology companies to allow us to still um, take observations, useful observations, um, you know, while, while those technologies are in place. So, you know, there's actually, you know, we have, there's a, there's a committee that discusses these sort of things and, um, and has uh, communication with the various technology companies. And we're, you know, some, some things that they talk about is maybe, you know, maybe we have, you know, um, ha have different radio quiet zones. So people may be aware there's a radio quiet zone in, um, in West Virginia located centrally in, or uh, the central location of it is, is West Virginia, but it, it extends pretty far. Um, and that's an area where uh, radio emissions in a certain frequency range are not permitted without, um, without permission. So there's, there's a discussion of doing things like that or um, communicating and letting, you know, determining when, you know, certain satellites will pass over a head that emit at certain frequencies and radio astronomers will just observe at different frequencies at, at those times. Uh, and then there's a lot of al uh, algorithm uh, research to how do we, how do we save data if um, if we do happen to observe and there is that RFI? Um, how can we uh, how can we still retain useful data? And there's actually some pretty promising um, some some pretty promising algorithms. So we're we're taking you know a, a full court press approach, I would say. Yeah, and for people who are not keeping an eye on the chat, um, Tyler, our um, tour guide from before, said he thinks Starlink is KU band at 15 gigahertz. We can't remember the source, but we'll try to find something for you guys and post it in the chat. Um, but speaking of algorithms, um, there've been a couple of different questions, but I'm gonna try to lump them kind of into one about um, the fact that you are working with a lot of data. So one question was about using big data analysis to identify if an area needs further research and kind of related to that, somebody asked if um, AI is being used um, to, or what other algorithms are being used to help identify things. Okay, so um, I think that was a two part. Yes. And what was the first part? So the first part was about um, big data ana analysis, which I don't know a lot of, and probably the person asking this might have something more specific in mind, but I guess if you could just speak on the general analysis techniques used for working with these enormous data sets. Okay, so um, what I can say is that there are many different groups taking many um, different approaches. So there's definitely, and, and related to the second part of the, the question too, is um, there's a lot of interest in, in machine learning. So some algorithms are, are like clustering algorithms. Um, and what they do is they, they take, you know, a, an N dimensional data set where N is very large. You know, every dimension is some description of some property of all the sources. Um, and so they take some n-dimensional data set and they ba and um, basically machine learning can um, can cluster uh, can, or can identify clusters of um, sources that share very similar properties. And so there's you know algorithms that that do that sort of thing that have been trained to do that sort of thing. And so you can identify you know groups that way and outliers that way as well. Um, there are algorithms that um, do uh, basically um, a morphology analysis. So, so basically look at the shape of all the sources and, um, and identify, you know, properties uh, in, in that way. So the kind of thing that you might do with your eyes, if you were to look at something and label it as, you know, a quasar with jets um, and two lobes or a single point, which might be a radio galaxy or a radio star. Um, and they're, they're, you know, algorithms that basically do, do that analysis. Um, analysis for you. And as I said, but you know, what I sort of did, it was, it, um, <laughs> it, uh, it seems a little <laughs> simple to me now, to be honest, but like I said, I, I, I spent a lot of time making um, basically multi-dimensional histograms. And so what I did was I would see where, where um, one cell of that histogram was very populated. I could see which, hey, you know, you what- just what a histogram is for people unfamiliar? Oh, yes, of course. A histogram is basically like a, like a bar plot. So it's, it's basically a, an accounting of how many sources are in any individual bin, right? So, um, so how many sources have a, a, block, a brightness between, you know, two and three? Um, units, uh, something like that. And so, um, 
So a, a, an n-dimensional histogram is would be something like where you'd have um, flux density on one axis, and so you would count the number of sources in different bins where you bin up by flux density, and then on some other axis you would you would count up the number of sources that had been split into bins by some other other property, uh, and so if there's you know one bin that happens to have a lot of sources in it, then you can see you know which which property along you know the the brightness axis and which property along the other axis say the shape axis um, tend to have a lot of sources and that means that those two properties then are are um, tend to be tend to show up in the same in the same sources yeah I hope that helps yeah I think that answered a lot um all right so uh you mentioned earlier about a fly's eye survey can you please describe why this technique was chosen rather than fast imaging? Um, or is this survey being done with a VLA single dish? And maybe you could just remind everybody um, about the fly's eye survey really quick. I did, I and fast imaging. Did, did not mention fly's eye imaging. Maybe. I am not sure what that is. All right. I was going to say I didn't catch it either. So maybe we'll have to answer that question offline. <laughs> But what I can say is, um, we, so we are using this mode where, where all the antennas are looking in the same location. So maybe, maybe that was related to the fly's eye question. So, but all the antennas are looking at the same location, yeah. but they're all moving together. So, you know, doing a, doing a roster. Um, and yeah, let me say a little bit about why, why that allows us to observe a large part of the sky in a short amount of time. So the, each individual antenna weighs something like 220 tons. So anytime you move an antenna from one location, pointing in one location in the sky to another location, you are moving a huge amount of material, 220 tons. And this is like a behemoth of, of metal. And so every time you move it, it you, have to, you have to spend a little bit of time getting it moving. And then once you get it pointing in the, in the place you want, it sort of takes a little bit of time to settle down. It sort of oscillates back and forth a little bit and, 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 and settles down. And that takes you know some number of some number of seconds, and so that produces an additional I would say time overhead when you're observing that you you don't have useful data when you're moving and when you're waiting for the antennas to settle down. But in the the type of observing that we are doing for the sky survey, since we we get the antennas up to speed and then move them at a constant speed, we actually don't have any of that additional overhead except just on the on the edges where we turn around. Um, and that actually basically reduces the amount of, 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 of overhead time uh, and allows us to observe the sky much, much faster than if we did just individual individual pointings. I feel like I can relate to the having to settle in after things, like after I was 25 every year since I have to settle in as well. So I can relate to the telescopes <laughs> in that sense. Um, so I think this is a great question because I think I have an answer in my head for what I would say, but how can you tell apart a signal from a cell phone from a signal from a radio source? And my answer is that's what science is, but I would love to hear what you have to say on that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, some other folks um, who are answering questions might have a more quantitative answer. I'm going to provide a, a qualitative answer. Yeah. What I can say is that basically any, um, any cell phone it emits much, much more strongly than any signal from a radio source in the sky. Actually, I have heard an, uh, a nice example that if, if you took your cell phone and you placed it on the moon and you were to look at it with the VLA, that would be by far absolutely the brightest thing in the sky. So, um, and that would basically saturate um, the, the receivers that we get. So we would basically, they would just be saturated. Like if you, you know, when you take a picture with like a digital camera and just everything appears, you know, it's like, like if you, you had a flash and you were pointing like right at a white screen or something, you know, it'd be completely saturated. Um, so basically what we do is we, we you know, carefully point um, up at the sky and the way the antennas are shaped uh, and the the receivers help to make sure that we're just getting signals from a from a certain direction, usually. But um, if a, if there was a cell phone nearby, um, you know, close enough to to the antennas, it would basically saturate um, everything. So it's not that we can, it's not that a, a cell phone a cell phone signal masquerades as an as an object from the sky. It's that it just completely saturates uh, the receivers to or saturates that to, to some to some extent 
Um, we had somebody follow up with, so you can't have a microwave oven in your break room, which is a throwback to a very famous radio astronomy story that I actually uh, went to school with Tyler Cohen, uh, who was your tour guide earlier, and he gave a talk that talked about that. So maybe he'll indulge us uh, mm -hmm. in the second tour of the day, because that's a very fun radio astronomy story. Um, but I want to keep asking you questions as the survey woman. So how is VLAS being coordinated with other sky surveys collecting optical x-ray and other data, if at all? Oh, yes, that's a that's a very good question. So um, one, one uh, optical survey that is that is coming up that is um, going to be done with a dedicated telescope is um, the LSST, the Legacy Sur Legacy Sky. Uh, oh, I don't. Oh, shoot. I don't. I don't remember. But it's being done with the Vera C. Rubin Telescope um, in Chile, and that is sort of the next big exciting um, optical survey. And when the VLA Sky Survey was being um, designed, basically choices were being made about what frequency to use, which I don't think I actually mentioned, which is a terrible oversight. We're observing at three gigahertz. Um, so what frequency to use and what configuration to use and how deep to observe. Um, we basically had information about, you know, what what the opt what the LSST survey would would be like. So we knew, you know, what the resolution was and sort of the depth. And so um, certainly that, that uh, informed some of the decision-making about what would be the, 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 the best, um, the best uh, combination of, of factors in, in deciding what, you know, what, what to, to make the, what to have the VLA sky survey look like. Um, we are also doing, you know, we have various test fields uh, and, and fields that we, you know, so we observe more times as, as a sort of test. And we choose those fields based on what fields have been observed many times by other by other surveys, uh, for example. Awesome, um, LSST, Large Synoptic Synoptic Survey Telescope. Well, that's the old uh, meaning yeah. of the acronym. <laughs> I was just going to say that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, it's Legacy Survey of Space and Time. That is. There what we LSST go. Is yes. For. Yes. Renaming things. Um, okay, uh, let's see. We still have a couple more that are getting a little in the weeds technically, but let's do it. Um, what factor limits the VLA to 50 gigahertz is the top frequency? Um, and then a lot of follow-up is it to do with the precision of the dishes, the electronics? Um, ah, well, all those things actually are, are part of it. Um, so, uh, 50 gigahertz is the is the currently the highest frequency that um, that the VLA will will observe at, and that uh, so let's see. Um, so we have we have receivers for different frequency ranges. So the highest frequency receiver um, I think goes 40 for around 40 gigahertz to to 50 gigahertz, um, and so the receiver is designed in a certain way such that it um, it uh, retains those signals and then you know frequencies outside that range are are are, um, are basically filtered out um, and then we want to have the antennas then are designed so that they will reflect into the receiver the frequency range that we are that we are sensitive to so you know the the very large size of the dishes um, allows us to reach a, a minimum frequency of one gigahertz um, and then the very high frequencies, 50 gigahertz, which corresponds to, um, to uh, the shortest wavelength. Uh, basically, we wanna have the dishes be as smooth as possible so that when they reflect wavelength of that light, you know, basically in, into, the, into the receiver, um, it stays nicely focused. Awesome. All right, and then a very not so technical question and our last one is the poster behind you a photo of Seattle, Washington? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I, um, I got my astronomy PhD from the University of Washington. So I lived in Seattle um, while I was doing that. And so I, I like to have this, um, this poster. I'm in, my, I'm in my office right now, um, actually. So that's, that's up in my office. Awesome. All right, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Um, if anybody else, we do have a little bit of extra time. So if anybody comes in with one at the... Um, last minute. I have one other one. Oh, wait, actually, somebody else does. Um, oh, okay. Well, yeah. Are you a telescope operator or are there folks under you with other educational backgrounds supporting operations? 
Ah, okay. Um, so I am uh, an associate uh, scientist. So I'm a, I'm a staff scientist. Um, so I'm not actually a telescope operator. Um, what I do for my work um, primarily is to support users of the VLA. So individual astronomers or groups of astronomers who are using the VLA for their own science. And I am the head of operations for the Sky Survey. So I basically oversee the progress of the, of the Sky Survey in all areas. So um, the observing and then the calibration of data and the, the imaging of, of data. Um, and I do work with a team of other scientists. So those are, are folks who um, generally have PhDs in astronomy. I work with a lot of software developers. And so those are people who would have degrees in um, computer science, and some of them also have a, you know, a background in astronomy as well. Um, and then a lot of the, a lot of the, the work for the, for the VLA Sky Survey and the VLA in general is done by, um, by data analysts. So that is, that is the job title, data analyst. Mm -hmm. And these are, uh, <laughs> and so um, our data analysts are, are, it's a team of people who, who um, come from, from different backgrounds and generally have a, have a bachelor's degree in a related field or, or a master's degree um, in a related field. So that might be someone who has a physics background or, um, or an engineering background or an astronomy background or a mathematics background. And uh, um, certainly there are jobs at, uh, at NRAO um, that, are, that are marketed to a wide range of, a wide range of, of folks. I can speak from personal experience. I came in with a master's in physics and astronomy um, as a data analyst. I primarily work with Alma, not VLA, but um, yeah. So I think uh, I think we can give people a longer break now. Um, I did. I mean, if you want to stick around for one more question, I had one of curiosity. I can't. It's not so much a science question, but more. Uh, I've never thought about this question. When you're planning out these uh, big surveys. What's the time scale from the point when somebody says, hey, we should look at the whole Southern Hemisphere sky to actually executing it and getting that data? What kind of timelines do you look at as a scientist and how do you like wrap that around your head? That's a very good question. I think so. Um, so a little bit more background about about the VLA Sky Survey that I, I can I can sneak in while I answer your question. <laughs> Um, so basically, the, the VLA Sky Survey has, is um, being done with, uh, in concert with the community. Um, and basically, the astronomy community got to, so I think what happened was um, NRAO said, look, we have all this new um, capabilities. Uh, and the, the surveys that we did in the 90s have a huge legacy, but it's time to do another one. We can do another one um, with all these new capabilities. Uh, and so what, what sort of survey do you think would be useful to do? And there was a call to the community um, who, who answered with, you know, a series of, of um, basically proposals of what, what the different, of, of what, what a survey um, might look like. And I think that was, um, that sort of call to the community was done, I think, around 20, 12 or 2013 or so. Um, and then there was a, a committee that read all these proposals and made a decision on what they what they thought would be the most useful for the astronomy community based on all the the um, the the information they had from the from the, the community. Um, and then uh, so an idea was chosen and then um, then basically there was a, a lot of administrative work done on how to uh, how to fit in the sky survey observations um, while still allowing the VLA to be used uh, for astronomers who are doing other types of, of observations. Um, and then we had a, a, a set of um, an observing period where we did basically a, you know, a te test observations as well. Um, and that was 2016 when we, we started those observations. Um, and so now um, sort of day to day, if we observe, uh, so we have a new observation that was done last uh, two nights ago for the, the VLA Sky Survey. Um, and it, it's gonna take several days to send that data through our, our software pipeline that calibrates the data. Um, and then we will, you know, look at that, look, look at, make sure the calibration is okay. And if it is, then we will start imaging that data. Um, and that may take another, another few days. So I think the shortest time scale from when we observe on the telescope to when, um, images might be available would be about a week or two. Um, and that's because we make our, we make our data from the sky survey available um, to the community and to the public instantly as soon as it's available to us. 
Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you for indulging us in lots and lots of questions. Um, I'm going to stop us here so everybody has time for a little break before we move on to, I think, our last or second to last panelist, but that's going to be in, or speaker, it, that's going to be in another five minutes. So I hope to see you all back in five minutes. Take a break, stretch your legs, and meet back here for some more VLA celebrating. Thanks, Amy. Bye.
All right, everyone. We have our next special guest for the event. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to the VLA 40th anniversary celebration. For those who have been with us, welcome back. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I just wanna remind everybody to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, because that makes it easier for us to find them and answer them. Try to use the chat for either technical problems or just general discussion, sharing interesting facts. Um, additionally, if you have a question and you see that it's already been asked in the Q&A, please upvote it. That helps us know that the question is popular and should be prioritized. Um, so first, I'm going to get our next speaker, Rob, to turn on his camera and mic and wave hello before I introduce him. Hi, everybody. All right, let me tell you about Rob real quick. Rob Salina is the project engineer for the Next Generation Very Large Array, a large facility concept presently under evaluation in the 2020 Decadal Survey of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And Rob, I want you to know that I was NGVLA for Halloween last year. <laughs> I got Star Trek Next Generation t-shirts and me and my friends made VLA antennas, it was pretty cool. That was a fantastic photo, I enjoyed Thank it. Thank you, I'm pretty excited. Um, more about Rob, prior to joining the NGVLA project, Rob was the lead of the systems group within the New Mexico Electronics Division. The systems group are responsible for systems performance studies and the design of improvements to the VLA. So let's hear what Rob has to say about NGVLA, take it away. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about future radio telescopes and the next generation very large array in particular. As a national observatory, we have a need to plan for future facilities and telescopes to support our user scientists and their investigations over the coming decades. We're celebrating the VLA's 40th anniversary today. I think it's appropriate to think about what comes next, you know, what continues that legacy. But we need to do so in the context of other leading edge facilities that are either available today or under construction will be available in the near future. So what does that suite of instruments look like? Well, uh, the VLA would still be on that list today. It's still the premier centimeter wavelength telescope in the world, uh, built in the 70s, operational since 1980, uh, but it went through a major sensitivity upgrade in the early 2000s that increased its capabilities. So recent discoveries from the VLA include localizing fast radio bursts, these very energetic phenomena that are an active area of research, and following up on gravitational wave detections from the LIGO interferometer, giving us an understanding of those events uh, that generated the waves. So those are some recent highlights, but there, there are other facilities that have come online since. So an example is ALMA. ALMA is the leading millimeter submillimeter array in the world. Uh, it was a collaboration between the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, along with our European and Japanese counterparts. And this facility uh, completed construction in the early 2010s, full science operations since 2013, and it will be a leading instrument at high frequencies well into the 2030s and beyond. There's nothing else quite like it um, in, in the works today. So this, this facility has a long uh, life in front of it. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we've got the Square Kilometer Array. This is an international collaboration uh, for a telescope hosted in South Africa as well as in Australia, and it's focusing on low frequencies. So it'll be a fantastic instrument from kind of the 100 megahertz range to maybe 5, 10 gigahertz range. And um, looking then at the 2030s, we have this new high frequency and new low frequency instruments. So what would a next generation VLA look like bridging these two facilities? Before delving into the facility, I think we need to think about, well, what do we actually want it to do? What sort of science uh, should a next generation VLA be focused on? So we went to the scientific community through a series of workshops and asked them that very question. And they identified five goals for a new facility. And I'm gonna to focus today on the first two. Um, they didn't, not enough time, I'm afraid to go into all five. But the first one being looking at the formation of solar system analogs on terrestrial scales. So this means looking at uh, exoplanets as they're forming and not just very large ones, but looking at kind of earth analogs, earth equivalents. Or, in, or planets that are orbiting at similar distances to the Earth. We also want to look then at those same protoplanetary systems and probe the astrochemistry that's present and see if 
the initial conditions for life as we understand it are present. And so we'll delve into each one of these in turn. So this is an image of the protoplanetary system HL Tau. It's an image taken with ALMA. Uh, you can see credit to Crystal Brogan, a scientist at uh, NRAO here on the bottom right hand corner. And this represents the state of the art in imaging protoplanetary systems today. What you're seeing in this image is dust emission. So these are cleared rings you can make out in the dust that suggest the presence of planets clearing their orbit. And I want to emphasize that the center of this image is not the star at the center of the system. It's a, the star is obscured by the dust. What you're seeing here is the thermal emission coming off the dust. The other thing we should talk about is a sense of scale. So you might not be able to make out this figure in the upper left, but the key point is that if you imagine our solar system, everything through Neptune fits in the first ring. So Earth, Jupiter, Mars, we're all in that first um, um, dot at the middle of this figure. So we want a telescope that can peer through this dust cloud and give us an indication of what's actually happening inside on sort of the same scales as our solar system. So that requires an instrument that one, operates at lower frequency, that lets you see through the dust. Two, we need a higher resolution so that we can actually make out the, the possible planets that will be inside there. Um, and then three, uh, an improvement in sensitivity so that we can detect the fainter signals that be coming from the planets and, and these larger asteroids and, and rotating um, objects. So what might that look like? So this is a simulation of what we would like to do. It's a simulation of um, the real sort of images we'll be able to capture with the next generation VLA showing a Jupiter scale planet. You can see it on the right hand side of this figure right now, um, orbiting around its host, host star. And by imaging something like this on monthly scales, you can actually make movies, that's the idea. So you could actually see the planetary motions in, in near real time and see the accretion process as these planets possibly clear their disks. Um, and by resolving distances comparable to the distance from Earth to the sun in our solar system, we can see that evolution for Earth-like planets over time. Now, if you had an instrument that sensitive that can image the center of these protoplanetary systems, it can also do other things. So in particular, you could look at the spectrum of emission coming from uh, these, these systems and look for the presence of complex molecules that are necessary building blocks for life on Earth or life as we understand it. So here's a chart showing three prebiotic molecules that are undetectable with present instruments, but that could be observed with an NGVLA. And if we observed a number of these protoplanetary systems, it would provide us evidence whether these sort of building blocks for life are commonly available in the universe are relatively rare. So what you're seeing here is the spectrum emission of these three compounds, uh, glycine and, and so forth, that are a couple of amino acids and a simple sugar. So these are uh, the, the molecular building blocks for things like proteins. And so if they were very common, that would give us an indication that the building blocks of life are common and therefore maybe life is as well. And the converse would also be equivalently interesting. So imagine if a telescope um, had a headline result in the New York Times tomorrow of detection of biosignatures, you know, the indications of life on, on an exoplanet, or even more tantalizingly, technosignatures, the indications of something technologically built. Um, you would need context to know whether that result is likely real or spurious. And studying these protoplanetary systems as they're forming gives us a really strong indication of how common life might be in the universe and what our place within it is too. So shifting to the instrument, what would the telescope that can perform this science look like? Uh, well, for starters, we would need a significant sensitivity improvement. So we would need about 10 times the sensitivity of the VLA. So instead of 27, 28 antennas, we need about 250 of them. We would also need improvements in resolution, kind of a, an improved zoom lens. And that involves taking the antennas and spreading them out over a much larger area, so hundreds to thousands of miles. And then we need to increase the frequency range, so from the 1 to 50 gigahertz range of the VLA today to about 1 to 116 gigahertz, bridging that gap between the square kilometer array on the low frequency side and ALMA on the high frequency side. 
and I have an animation for you here of what such an array might look like. So we're looking at the center of VNG VLA uh, located at the VLA site. We have two antenna designs. We have a six meter design that's in the forefront of this video, uh, which is sort of the wide field camera. And then you can see the 18 meter antenna in the background, which kind of gives us the, the, the zoom lens feature, the detailed views. We're scanning around the VLA site. Uh, the antennas are randomly distributed in the center of the array. Um, we would reuse a lot of the existing VLA infrastructure represented by uh, these building envelopes here. And as we get out onto larger scales, we go to a spiral arm structure. And so you'll start to see the spiral arms come about. And then on the scale of New Mexico, um, you can see we go to a more random distribution based on the availability of infrastructure. And similarly, on a national scale, we would have far out antennas um, spread across the continental United States to give us the, the highest resolution possible for such an instrument. So how do you make such a facility a reality? We have a prioritization process in the United States where the National Academies of Sciences runs a survey every 10 years um, and asks scientists what they believe the priorities ought to be for research and facility construction over the coming decade. And so this is a process presently underway. It started last year and it'll conclude in early 2021. And we hope that uh, NGVLA will rank highly and that would give us the necessary momentum to continue the construction. So a lot of the project um, activities are focused on, on this decadal survey lately. The first thing we did was um, ask our scientific community what they wanted to investigate, what the major science use cases would be for such a facility. And we were overwhelmed with support. So we had 88 different science cases contributed from 286 different authors. And that's very comparable to what other successful facilities have, have received. So the large synoptic survey telescope nowadays called the Rubin Observatory was as an example, the 2010 priority and uh, is now approaching construction, uh, end of construction and commissioning. And they had a very similar uh, turnout from the scientific community. Um, so we're on the right sort of scale in terms of uh, community support. The next part is to prepare a design that can support that science. And it needs to be done in sufficient detail that you can accurately cost what the construction operations effort will be. And that these are always, of course, um, best value questions. So how do you get the most scientific return out of a, a fixed research budget? And so this is where myself and the engineering team have spent most of our time is working on this reference design. Uh, the key features are shown on the left. So the frequency coverage that we spoke about, and then the array split into these sort of three pieces that focus on the, the, the main sensitivity coming from the main array, the short baseline array providing wide field of view, and the long baseline array providing the highest level of detail, consistent with the video you just saw. So having completed the reference design, we're now pivoting and focusing our efforts on advancing the design towards the known design reviews we'll be uh, conducting with the National Science Foundation and towards construction eventually. So we'll focus on some of the pieces of the system. Um, the antenna may be the single most important part of the array design. It's uh, certainly the most cost, costly piece of the system. And so instead of designing just one, as shown in the video, we've actually designed four. These are all collaborations with industry, four different design firms, uh, looking at different technologies and how they, they enable antenna designs. And we're in the process of, of evaluating these four designs today and picking one to advance towards final design and prototype for eventual construction in the array. This is a major part of our, the work we're doing at the moment. The antenna um, focuses the signals into a receiving a piece of electronics, we call it the receiver. And so you can see a prototype receiver here uh, developed by our colleagues at uh, Arizona State University and Caltech. So this is a one to three-ish gigahertz receiver and um, is current candidate for what we call our band one uh, receiver, so our low frequency design. Moving up into higher frequencies, we've been working with our central development laboratory in Charlottesville, Virginia, as well as some of our international collaborators, and you can see two of the, the feed receiver designs on the left. These are very small structures. Um, these are about the size of a quarter. 
So the, the zoomed in images here. And you can see a scaled up version in a test uh, chamber at Green Bank, uh, West Virginia, in the middle of the picture. But given that we have these very small, precise machine work requirements, we're investigating whether things like 3D printing and, uh, and other technologies might improve manufacturability of such designs. There's a lot of work going into miniaturization in general. And you can see that in electronics as well. So here we are building what we call our integrated receiver digitizers. So these take the signals off the receiver and digitize them so that we can put them on a fiber optic network and send the signals from each antenna back to a central signal processor. We're working very hard at miniaturization as part of a process of reducing cost. So you can get a sense of scale of um, this uh, conversion digitization module by the scale of the quarter. You can see the quarter for the full package on the upper right and uh, lower center for the actual digitizer chip, which is uh, something we've also been developing in-house. And by doing this, we've taken equipment that fills an entire room in the VLA antenna today um, and two large electronics racks, top to bottom. And we hope to be able to fit into a package that would fit on your kitchen table. And there's appropriate cost reduction that goes with doing so. Now, assuming you, you have all of these antennas distributed over the Southwest United States produced with these digitizers integrated into them, now you've got a large amount of data that you have to push back to a central signal processor. Each antenna outputs, depending upon the mode it's working in, between 400 gigabits a second to 800 gigabits a second. To put that in perspective, the NGVLA uh, data rates are equivalent to about 15 to 20% of global internet traffic. That's about the same size as Netflix. So we need IT infrastructure to support you know, a Netflix in New Mexico. Um, and so we're gonna need new fiber optic networks um, distributed across the Southwest, uh, working with internet service providers to provide the most distant stations connections. And this actually extends across the US because our, our long baseline uh, antenna sites are distributed over the full continental United States and North America. And so this is gonna be a major infrastructure improvement uh, for the country. And it'll be really important to us that these don't just serve the antennas, but also neighboring communities, right? There's a lot of opportunities for rural broadband connections and things like that that could have uh, important benefits to nearby communities. Now, at the other end of all of this fiber infrastructure is a central signal processor. So you've got terabytes, actually petabytes of data coming in on one side of this. And this produces our kind of fundamental basic data product, what we call the visibility. And it's the combinations of the antennas um, and in, for aperture synthesis, the method that the, the VLA today and NGVLA will both use for building an image. The, the best way of thinking about this is this is the real time part of the signal processing. So you've got petabytes coming in and only gigabytes going out. So you're now getting into a, a data rate that you could possibly record to disk, and that is our intention. And then you can do the final stages of imaging later. So that final stage is all a software-based system that runs in a computing cluster, and you can get a sense of the architecture of it from this figure. The key points, though, is that this builds upon existing software that we and our international collaborators have developed for uh, both the VLA, Alma, and other international projects, including the SKA. But what's different about it for NGVLA is the scale of it all. So we need a large amount of computing power. About 60 petaflops per second is the computing need. And that's supercomputer scale. If you built that today, that would be the fifth largest supercomputer in the world. Um, so it's a tractable problem, but I don't want to make it sound easy. And because you need such large amounts of computing, we've kind of changed our operational model. today. A user of the VLA will actually perform a lot of these final computing steps themselves on their own workstations. That's obviously not feasible for this. So we're changing our operational model so that we actually deliver calibrated, verified images directly to our user scientists using our own resources. And they have to, of course, engage in that. So there's interfaces to allow them to um, participate in the data reduction and uh, ensure they get the result that they want. So what about risks, right? We're talking about a, a large facility on, on using cutting edge technology. 
um, there are some risks. The, the, the natural ones, speaking about this computing uh, power needs and the fiber optic infrastructure, is that we do need the cost of this infrastructure to continue to drop. So we don't need Moore's law in the traditional sense to continue. So we don't need faster and faster chips, but we do need the cost to continue to drop. And we have good reason to believe that will continue to do so based on, on recent history. The other thing that's changing is the radio frequency interference environment. So we're moving from third gen and fourth generation uh, cell phone networks to 5G technologies, right? And these move up into higher parts of the spectrum. We're also seeing a proliferation nowadays of low Earth orbit satellite constellations. So this image on the right is of 60 Starlink satellites um, before deployment last year on the uh, on SpaceX launch. And uh, SpaceX is a similar constellation. OneWeb has one. Amazon is launching one. So this is really a new part of, of spectrum usage that's, that's unfamiliar to us today. And it will present some challenges for ground-based radio astronomy facilities. But we've done the analysis and we think we're, we're all happily co can coexist. But it does need some new signal processing techniques. We have to build it into NGPLA. So timeline. What's... What kind of timeline are we talking about here? Well, we established our project office in 2016, really focused on that decadal survey submission. And uh, we completed that last year in 2019. And um, we're now waiting for that report out. So the decadal survey has been ongoing. It will, uh, the, the panels will report their findings in early 2021. And assuming we have a positive recommendation from the scientific community to, to build this facility, we'll be requesting that the National Science Foundation do that, that they give us uh, large facility funding. And so that's a very big day for us, right? That's the that's day that this becomes a real reality. And based on that, we would uh, be progressing towards construction in 2025, early science operations, first observations in 2028, and full operations by the mid 2030s, figure 2034. So I want to thank you for joining us today to celebrate the VLA's 40th anniversary and to dream a little bit about what the future might hold for radio astronomy and radio astronomy facilities. So thank you for your time, and I'll hand it back to the moderator for any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. So we have quite a few questions here. Um, let's start with, if all goes well, how soon would the NGVLA produce its first scientific output? Because I think you just talked about that in your last slide. So maybe if you want to elaborate a little more. And how long would you expect it to operate for? Yeah, so we're looking at our ambitious model, you know, at the, at the moment, we to be on sky in eight years. That's our goal. And it, it really depends on, on how things unfold in this decadal survey and, and funding for construction. But on that kind of scale, eight, 10 years from now, you could have NGVLA on sky. And as to how long it might operate for, we're designing it to, um, all the equipment's designed for a 30 year life. And so that can carries us through the construction phase and about 20 years of operation. And the idea isn't necessarily that you would turn it off at that point, but then you would you would consider an improvement to the, to the array, much like we did for the, EV, the VLA, right? So the VLA operated for 20 years. And then there was the VLA expansion project, the large upgrade that Amy and, and others have spoken about today. Um, and then it had an extra 20 years of life thereafter. And so we would very much like to follow a similar model uh, for NGVLA. That would be, a, I think, a really good outcome. Yeah. Um, another question about the timeline is, why is there such a gap between requesting and getting funding and starting construction? Oh, we have to finish the design. So while I've been showing you prototype work, um, the, there's still a lot of detailed design work to do. Uh, we wanna make sure we build it once and build it right. And um, you also need to go through a series of reviews with uh, the National Science Foundation. So they wanna make sure that if you're spending um, federal taxpayer dollars, that you're spending them wisely and, and as efficiently as you can. And so we wanna make sure we do that as well. And uh, that, that four years allows us to complete the design and then start the construction activities in earnest, um, knowing that we've got the everything button down and correct in the design at that point. So speaking of the design, a lot of people have different questions about the design. Um, first of all, would the new antennas be portable as well or will they mostly be fixed locations? So we, we looked into that early on and the, 
the big change that kind of influences this is the resolution required. So the VLA makes um, really efficient use of its 28 dishes by having the four configurations, but it only has to go out to roughly 30 miles, right, is, is kind of the extent of the, the VLA, give or take. We would need to go 300 to 1,000 miles. And so moving antennas 30 miles is one problem. Moving them 300 miles is, is a bit of a different one. And so the reconfiguration may still have had value, we thought, on kind of the VLA um, scales, but we'd have to have fixed antennas outside that. And as we explored that in more detail, we decided that a fixed configuration was actually the preferred option for NVVLA. Um, and then the antennas look similar to the Paul Allen array in California, which I've not seen, so I did not know. Is this a preferred design or coincidental? So the what the person's referring to here is if you look behind Melissa, you'll see a VLA antenna and you can see that it's symmetric. So the whole support structure that holds the secondary reflector is all in the middle of the dish. The NGVLA design has this sort of um, low hanging system, right? And all the electronics are hanging down on the bottom side. So that's called an offset um, optical geometry. And uh, indeed the Paul Allen array does the same thing. So the, the reason for this is that it's structurally harder to do, but you gain efficiencies because the Oh, you froze on my end, Rob, but maybe that's just me. Oh, no, I think that's other people too. I think Rob might be frozen for a second. Um, our apologies. Our, our internet in New Mexico out here is really not very good. So this sometimes happens. Just bear with us. Oh. Um, ah, it looks like I see Rob again. Sorry. He's I was talking to a dying computer apparently. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> Um, so I think you were talking about the arrays. So you have an offset antenna, um, which is what the NGVLA will be use, using, and then you can continue. Yes. So the, the, the offset geometry you can compare to the, to the symmetric and the VLA antenna, again, looking at, at the background behind Melissa, you can see that not all the signal that would come from your radio source will make it to your receiver because the, the legs that support the sub reflector would block part of it and the subreflector itself would too. And so by moving all of that off to the side, you now have an unblocked main reflector. And so the antenna is more efficient. And so we actually get kind of the, the signal gathering capability of a VLA 25 meter dish with an 18 meter NGVLA dish. So we can make them smaller and more efficient and hopefully have more of them that way for the same, same price. And actually, I, I can't find this question. So maybe somebody answered it in text, but somebody did ask why 18 meters specifically is selected. Yeah, we, we thought a lot about the size. So at the end of the day, it's all about collecting area. So you could have, um, instead, of, instead of 250, 18 meters, you could maybe have 412 meter antennas um, or a smaller number of very large dishes. And it's, there are some trade-offs though, in, in terms of how the image reconstruction works, the, the signal processing side of things. Uh, there are some benefits to lots of smaller dishes, but operationally, it becomes very expensive to maintain a lot of small dishes. And so there's, it kind of becomes a, a, a trade-off decision. Do you wanna have very expensive operations and construction costs, but more dishes, or can you go for a few large ones? And uh, we found the sweet spot to be the 18 meter design. Awesome. Um, and then let me see if there's any other antenna ones. Oh, well, this actually kind of relates, I think, to the design. From an engineering perspective, is the design mainly scaling up existing technologies or are there new things being introduced? It's a, it's a bit of both. So we've tried to come up with what we call our reference design, most of the design details I just presented, that are all with available technologies today. So a lot of improvement, of course, in the last 40 years um, since the VLA was first constructed and we've reflected that, uh, but we tried not to include things in a design that didn't exist today or, or couldn't be assured to be there with a high uh, probability. So new computers that are faster than today, things like that. Um, but that's not to say that we're not researching things that could make the array work better or make it cheaper. So the, 
uh, antenna design, for example, that was shown in the video, that's a, um, a design by our Canadian colleagues um, in Penticton, Canada, and they use uh, composite materials, carbon fiber, to build the reflectors in the backup structure, and it makes the antennas very light that way. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of something that would be new and novel that we're exploring um, and we're considering for the design. We're also making some new chips in the uh, antenna electronics system that allows us to miniaturize all of that antenna electronics and the receiving electronics. And again, mostly for cost and performance reasons. Um, and then kind of speaking to that, um, one person asks, how do you future proof uh, what you design, which I think is fair given how quickly technology changes. Um, yeah, that's, that's really hard. Um, one of the things I learned to really appreciate about the VLA as I started working on NGVLA was how flexible the VLA architecture is. And that's one of the reasons why it's worked for 40 years rather than uh, is that it's been able to adapt to new science use cases. And it's also been able to incorporate new technologies into the design. And I, we try and take that philosophy to heart for <laughs> NGVLA as well. So really think hard about how could this thing grow and be maintained over 20 or 40 years and how are the scientific use cases that we, we might use the array for, how are they gonna change over the next 20 or 40 years? And let's make sure that, that we build in all the necessary flexibility to support those changes. Awesome. Um, so in terms of the project, how many new jobs do you expect a new facility such as NGVLA to create, particularly in the science sector, such as data analysts, engineers, et cetera? Great question. So we're in, in, in steady state operations, uh, we're thinking we're going to be roughly three times larger than the VLA and NRAO is today. So that would be uh, of order six, seven hundred people working on the maintenance and operation and data analysis side of, of the array. And in the construction phase, those 10 years of construction, of course, there would be thousands of people who uh, would be employed working on, on the construction effort. So the, these, these projects have, um, have significant impacts in that way and really um, provide uh, career growth for, for junior scientists and junior engineers and, and give them uh, um, something that they can build an, an entire career around. It's really interesting working at the VLA and meeting people who still work here who helped build it right, in the early 70s. And um, it, I think a very rewarding experience for many of us too. Really cool. Um, are there any special considerations when you're working in different states and then also in different countries, given that you'll be in the US and Mexico? Yeah, exactly. And we also have a couple of antennas in, Cal in Cal California, no, in uh, um, Canada as well. So uh, it is a concern. We have to consider all the, the legal challenges as well, as well as sort of environmental changes. So um, simple things, all the labels on, on the antennas will be in English and Spanish, right? Because we're gonna have antennas in the US and in Mexico. Um, uh, but yes, you have to consider all the, the regulatory approvals for all, all the various states and then some of the logistics because we have to be able to send spare parts from a repair center in the US to an antenna site in Mexico and so forth. Um, and then a question coming from, uh, I, I think we talked about this earlier, I forget with which speaker, but it probably is worth repeating because um, we have people coming and going. Um, is the prospect of an array on the backside of the mean purely speculative at this point, or is there any serious planning going on? So if you could speak to that. Yeah, there actually is a press release out um, about a NASA project that wants to do exactly that. Um, the, because of the changes in, in radio frequency environment, there is there are some value in being in a very quiet place like the backside of the moon. Um, you wouldn't, I think building something of this size is a non-starter, right? But you could absolutely have a small array for um, very specific purposes um, on the backside of the moon and people at JPL and other colleagues are certainly looking into that. That'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, you guys have so many questions coming in. Um, faster than I can read them. Okay. Um, why is it, why is ALMA not capable of peering through the dust around newly forming planets, whereas the NGVLA will be better at this? Yeah, it's, it has to do with the observing frequencies. So the, the analogy is if a car goes down the street, you're probably going to hear the bass notes from the car. You're not necessarily going to hear the symbols, right? So the short wavelengths coming out of the stereo 
won't travel through the walls of your home, but the bass notes, the long frequencies will. And so a similar effect happens in the radio. The, the short wavelengths that Alma observes get absorbed and re-radiated by the dust emission, but the long wavelengths that NGVLA would observe uh, will actually travel through the dust. And so you're, that's how you peer through the dust. Awesome. Um, so we have quite a few questions asking, um, I'm gonna try to kind of combine a couple cause I think they're related um, about um, the cost, how, how does project, how do politics play into project and program funding um, and kind of how to navigate that. And then, and then I'll ask another right after that I think is related. So the, these are very large projects, right? From the perspective of, of science funding. So the, the NGVLA will, will cost our current estimates about $2.3 billion. Um, that is not um, unusual for a large facility like this. So ALMA was between one and two. Uh, LSST, the Rubin Observatory was in the same range. The 30 meter telescopes are currently under construction, same range. Um, so it's normal in that sense, but we realize this is a lot of money. And um, so therefore you don't just get it through um, the blank check for a good idea. There's, so there has to be a prioritization process and that's how the decadal works. And then um, a little bit of luck too. So it's, but it's not obvious. The connections to politics aren't as obvious as some people think necessarily. And, and my example is both VLA's expansion project and ALMA were both funded in the middle of a recession. So. They were funded in a very strenuous time when federal funding was generally decreasing and um, yet they were still successful. And so it's really hard to tell long-term um, how the political wind changing affects uh, a project like ours, but we'll do everything in our control to make it happen. Awesome. And the other question I was gonna ask got answered it looked like, so let me find another good one. Um, um, what are the expected repair and maintenance required requirements and loads for the antenna? So in, we're, we're modeling that today. And this is something we're paying a lot of attention to. So most of us that are working on NGVLA design uh, worked or still work on VLA maintenance and enhancements. And so these are the people that know that piece on the VLA breaks every six months and I don't wanna build it that way again. Um, and so the, that sort of lesson gets incorporated. The other thing is that we know that the, the operational cost is something we really have to consider too, right? Not just the construction costs for these facilities, but how, long, how much is it cost every year to keep them running? Um, and we wanna make sure we keep those costs as low as possible. So we're designing it to be very maintainable, but also much more reliable or as reliable as we can reasonably make it. Um, the idea would be that we would go to an antenna about once every three to four months at most, and hopefully only once per year. That's kind of the, the maintenance level we want to get to. And I think kind of speaking on the same train of cost, um, we have some questions related to, um, I wonder if you could speak on the cost um, versus benefits of having ground-based telescopes in the case of radio. And part of that is of course, we can see through the atmosphere pretty easily, but can you talk about kind of the cost and benefit versus space-based, land-based, et cetera? Absolutely. So it really depends upon uh, the wavelengths as, as, as Melissa is suggesting. So the, the infrared, um, you have lots of emission from everything on the ground and the atmosphere itself. So things like the James Webb Space Telescope, that's the only way to build um, a telescope working at the, the, the longer side of the infrared. The, the radio, while we do have an increasing radio frequency interference environment, the techniques we've developed for aperture synthesis, so this, this ability to combine multiple telescopes into a, multiple antennas into a single telescope, it provides us some natural immunity to interference sources. And, when, and because we've gotten so, uh, we've kind of hit the state of the art in terms of receiver technology, um, the only way you make a more sensitive array today is with more area. So even if you built it on the backside of the moon or orbiting um, far from earth, you would need a lot of collecting area. And it's such that it's only really practical to build them on the ground. Um, and when you, uh, how do you evaluate and decide which design you'll choose for the new antenna? So I know you spoke about this a little bit, but if you could maybe refresh on. Sure. 
So we have the four designs and um, the, there's actually a, the four uh, designers who developed them are preparing packages for us right now that show the performance of the antenna against a set of requirements that we've told them um, we'd like them to evaluate it against. And they're also giving us the cost um, for building a prototype and building up the, the production antennas. And we're, we're not just asking for their word on it, but we're also asking for a lot of design artifacts. So um, CAD models of the antenna then being subjected to um, um, by analysis loads. So Can you what, uh, a CAD model is right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So computer computer models of the antenna, um, you can you can subject them to to simulated loads. So you can say, based on your design, how would this behave if we applied a wind to it? How would this behave if um, we heated it from one side with the sun? And we can try and tell which one's going to work best based on that analysis in our real environment. And so then it becomes a cost benefit proposal. You might pick the, the best one or you might pick the best one relative to its construction cost. And so we're gonna go through that trade, um, a trade study that analysis of that space. Um, and people wanna know, is it Europe cooperating here in NGVLA or is this strictly a NRAO United States endeavor? So we, we started it as a US project um, in that we wanted to, to have a leadership role. Um, for, for US radio astronomy community in this project, but everything of this size gets built by international consortiums. And so now having got the decadal submission um, kind of squared away, and that being our demonstration of whether the US community is behind building it, we're now talking to our international partners. So um, Canada has been involved from pretty much from day one, um, helping us on the design. Uh, since last year, our Japanese colleagues who work with us on Alma are also working with us. And so they're actually working on antenna designs and receivers with us. Um, they're even writing a, a new science book with new science cases in Japanese. So um, yeah, just an example of the international participation. And uh, also more recently with our Taiwanese colleagues and Mexican colleagues. So it, it'll become a, a large international project here in the very near future, if it isn't already in a sense. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, are there any planned overlap with the SETI project other than the similarities we discussed before? Yeah, so um, SETI has the, the Breakthrough Listen initiative and they're building this new signal processor to go on the VLA. And they actually gave us use cases for how to use an NG VLA for, for, for SETI research as well. And so we've tried to incorporate those lessons, what they asked for into the, uh, the design of the signal processor uh, as well as um, additional sort of outputs that could go to a dedicated SETI instrument. And the idea being that while NGVLA is observing, it could always be looking for SETI signatures. And so that would be kind of a, a long-term concurrent observation mode. Cool. And then we still have a little time. So um, we have a couple, I guess, a little more technical questions. Um, one is asking about um, new technologies being, are there new technologies being considered that could more efficiently conserve liquid helium? And maybe if you could talk about um, why liquid helium is used for electronics cooling um, for folks who don't know. Right, so when we talk about these receiving um, electronics, the receivers, they're cryogenically cooled to very, very low temperatures, um, 15 Kelvin, so that's about you know, in centigrade, that's what 260 degrees ish below zero compared to what it is in Fahrenheit off the top of my head. Um, and the reason we do that is that the, the little transistors and receivers that make up the amplifiers put out noise that is proportionate to their, to their temperature. So you basically want to cool them as close to absolute zero as you can to keep their noise background down. And the, the signals that are coming from the radio sources that we're looking at are all smaller actually, even than the noise of those cryogenically cooled amplifiers. Um, and it's only through the signal processing that we recover them. So keeping those amplifiers really cold is central to any radio interferometer, the VLA today and for NGVLA. Um, liquid helium is still the best way to do that. So um, nitrogen is used in the optical. We'll continue using helium-based uh, compressor um, cryogenic systems for NGVLA. But we're, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to use that really efficiently, not just in terms of using the helium efficiently, but using the power very efficiently as well. So this makes us more, uh, more practical to say, run remote antennas on solar power by keeping their electrical 
uh, load small, um, they could then run on solar or wind and things like that, and not necessarily the grid connection. So the sort of things we're looking at. I think this kind of piggybacks onto that and um, is a question that I would ask is yeah. I always like to know about environmental impacts of projects that given this has such a large footprint, um, what kind of planning has happened that has included factors like climate change and other? No, it's, it's a great question. So the National Science Foundation changed their guidance to projects like ours about, I think about 10 years ago now. And they've asked us to consider sustainability in all of our designs. So they already told us we had to look at total life cycle cost, as they put it. So that's you know, cradle to grave, including not just constructing it, but operating it and eventually decommissioning it. So that says don't use toxic materials that are going to be very hard and expensive and have ecological impacts when you, you decommission a facility. Right. Uh, think about that now is what they're asking us to do. And then when you think about the operations phase, if you're going to be running in a facility like this for 20, 40 years, where your power comes from has a big impact on, on what your impact is on the environment. So we've built the array to be supportable by the grid as plan A, and the grid is changing. So in New Mexico, it's about 20% solar and photovoltaic today, um, and it'll, it's quickly rising uh, to be more renewables. But we are considering, especially for the remote antennas, having um, sort of solar photovoltaic standalone and lastly, we're looking at uh, working with a commercial power supplier to make the whole array run on solar. And so that would be a way of minimizing our impact. Very cool. Um, I think a very good question that I had not thought about before is um, where would the control center be? Would that be where with the VLA in Socorro or whole new building? Yeah, so we're still gonna have the building in Socorro uh, for array operations. And so the operators would be located here in Socorro is the idea. But the science operations side of things, uh, the data analysts, um, they might be located elsewhere. We haven't quite figured out where that might be. So if you want to be a future, and the idea in terms of picking that side is where would people actually like to live um, as data analysts and scientists working on, on NGVLA? So if you want to have a career in radio astronomy um, and you have a place where you'd like to live, let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll keep that in mind. I mean, I will say having been to Socorro and having had green chilies and sopias, I do get the appeal and the desert is pretty beautiful, but <laughs> also there's a lot of cool places. So yeah. that's awesome. Um, all right, we still have some time. Let's see. Uh, you touched on this a little, but are you designing the system to be modular so that if new technology comes out, you can swap it out instead of having to replace the larger, more expensive segments? Absolutely, 100%. So we, uh, we, we designed the array into what we call line replaceable units. So every single part of the antenna is, is broken out into these LRUs, line replaceable units that are sort of modules that are sort of standalone and they have defined interfaces and then they could be replaced. So if you um, came up with a better receiver technology, you could slot in a new receiver. If you came up with a better digitizer or data transmission unit, again, they're kind of swappable in that sense. And then also building in all the hooks for future instruments. So not being constrained to only use the signal processor that comes with the array on, on day one, but having um, enough of the, the IT infrastructure to support a second one um, standalone. So in the SETI case, for example, so you can add new capabilities um, as time and uh, interest allows. And then this question, um, I think one of our staff answered it in text, but I'm going to ask it out loud because I think it's a good question um, for people thinking about this is um, how do you collect all the data from such large distances? How is everything connected like physically? It's, it's, it's hard because it's all fiber optic, um, which is good in the sense that it makes um, us able to use commercial technologies that are being developed by others for, for other reasons. But it's, it's hard in terms of the data rates. So at 400 gigabits to 800 gigabits per second per antenna, um, the, that today is sort of leading edge of what you can do on a fiber optic link um, between cities and municipalities, right? We, we basically want IT infrastructure for NGVLA that's equivalent to what um, a municipality like Los Angeles has today. So it's, it's it, I don't want to say that it's easy, but it does exist, right? LA can actually buy that equipment off the shelf um, or LA's uh, IT provider can. And so we, we really want that equipment to come, become more cost-effective though. So we're largely going to rely on 
the internet being the powerhouse that it is, all that IT technology will get cheaper over time. And um, yeah, we'll support connecting the antennas to the signal processor that way. Cool. Um, if you still have energy, I still have a few more questions because um, I think we can ask maybe two or three more before we take a break before our last speaker. Um, what kind of natural factors will affect the normal functioning of the antennas? For example, rain, snow, birds building nests, dust storms, and so on? All of them. Um, <laughs> no, the, we see through the atmosphere, right? We have an, we have an atmospheric window for radio, um, for the radio waves that we're looking at, but the, but it turns out the atmosphere does have an impact on us. Um, in particular, water vapor is a really important one. So the more water vapor that you have in, above an antenna, it actually slows down the radio waves traveling through them. And so a different um, amount of water or cloud cover above one antenna than another, we have to measure that and compensate for it. And so that is an effect that absolutely um, is something we have to, to calibrate out as we run the array. And what you do is, if, if the conditions are really good and stable, so it's really dry above the antennas, you look at high frequencies, which are harder. And as if you're dealing with stormy weather and the, the wind is buffeting the antenna around a little bit, then you go to lower frequencies. And uh, that's how we balance it out and make sure we're always doing the most important science we can at any given day. That's definitely something I learned working at Alma um, is talking about weather in terms of bands. Um, yes. You'd come into work and somebody would say, oh, band nine weather last night. Ooh, cool. <laughs> and it was definitely something to get used to. Looking at terahertz frequencies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so lots of people have more follow-up questions on um, keeping equipment cool. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually like three more questions about that. So I wonder if you could, like as a, for your last question, just talk yeah. a little bit more, bit more about the importance of cooling equipment and whether or not... Um, near future, somebody said, uh, say 20 years, um, will we still be constrained to keeping things cooled to 15K? Um, it does seem like a lot of energy to keep them cool. And uh, what are other options for that? Yeah, so it, it looks that way because it looks fundamental to, um, to our understanding today, at least of how quantum mechanics works. But that said, um, something could surprise us in materials and and that would be a game changer if it happened because suddenly you could have uh we think of superconductors today as being these these cooled uh, devices we're using for for our receivers um, but if you manage to come up with a superconductor that in fact had lower um, thermal noise at a much closer to room temperature that would change not just um, the world for radio astronomy but things like uh, quantum computing would suddenly become a lot more practical and suddenly you could have a quantum computer the size of your cell phone rather than um, this quirky laboratory that only Google and IBM can run. Um, so that would be a really big deal, but we don't see anything on the horizon that would lead us to think that that's gonna be soon. But you never know, there's always serendipitous discoveries. And maybe there's a postdoc working away at uh, some university right now that is, is smirking because he, he or she knows something I don't. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Um, and I hope if that's the case, they share. Well, thank you so much, Rob, for talking with us. Um, it, I'm going to cut us off now so that everybody has a chance to get a break before our final speaker. Um, I think if there's one lesson to be learned, it's that if you're in like third to fifth grade, it's a good time to start thinking about your dissertation that'll be on based on NGVLA science. So uh, third graders, Time to get on it. Let's uh, let's see what you guys got. But for now, everybody, go take a break, stretch your legs, get some snacks, get some drinks. We have one final speaker who will announce the winner of our image contest. Um, so stick around and be sure to come back for that. After that, there will be one final tour um, with our lovely tour guides. Uh, so be sure to come back in about five minutes. Thanks again, Rob.
All right, everyone, welcome back. We have our final special guest of uh, the event until we have the tour afterwards. Um, so before I introduce her, let me really quick one last time uh, go over a few things. First of all, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Um, save technical questions or general discussion or excited remarks for the chat. Um, and also, if in the Q&A you see your questions already been asked, please upvote it so that we know that it's a popular question and we will prioritize it. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is, which is Claire Chandler. Claire, would you turn your video on and say hi? Yeah, hi, Melissa. I'm, I'm very excited to be with everyone here today. Awesome. All right, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Claire before she gets started. Claire Chandler got her PhD in astronomy at the University of Edinburgh in 1991. After postdoctoral work at Caltech, NRAO, and the University of Cambridge, she joined the NRAO scientific staff in 2000. She is currently the deputy assistant director responsible for the operation of both the v VLA and the VLBA. She also uses the VLA and other telescopes to investigate how stars and planetary systems are born. So Claire, take it away with the last talk of the day. I am very excited to be able to bring you the results of the VLA 40th anniversary image contest here this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start out by saying a few words about the contest, then a few words about how we make our radio images, and then I'll dive into the results. So first of all, the contest. So the purpose of this contest was to really showcase and celebrate 40 years of radio images and coming from the VLA. And at the same time, we were hoping that the, we would also increase the number of high quality, compelling radio images that we can then use for education and outreach programs. The rules of the contest were basically that any type of database visuals can be submitted. Um, including radio Im emission images, composite radio emission with other wavelengths, animations, data visualizations, 3D models, etc. Um, the prize, the first prize is $1,000, second prize is $500, third prize is $250, and any images that obtain an honorable mention will get $100 each. NRAO put together a panel of judges uh, representing a wide range of backgrounds and areas of expertise, and they judged these images on uh, four criteria. First of these is aesthetics and originality. By that we mean, does the image show a unique way of presenting the radio data to the public? Is it appealing to look at? Is it impactful? Does it draw in the viewer to really want to learn more about the data that are being visualized? The second criterion was artistic merit. Does the image show an effective use of design elements to focus attention by a placement within the image, the use of color, tone, or line, contrast in the image, dynamics of form and shape, balance, unity of elements, and the use of space in the image? Now, the third criterion is scientific accuracy. How well does the image tell the story of the data? And are the data represented accurately? Is it effective at highlighting, in particular, the radio aspect of the data? And the fourth criterion was scientific significance. Does the image illustrate an important scientific aspect of astronomy in an effective way? Um, so before I show you the results of the contest, I uh, just wanted to say a couple of words about how we make images using radio telescopes. All telescopes basically focus electromagnetic waves to form an image of the sky at a detector. And that detector could be your eye, it could be a CCD camera, or in the case of radio, it could be a cryogenically cooled low noise amplifier. And that's what we use on the VLA. Um, the amount of detail that a telescope can see depends on the diameter of your primary collecting surface and the wavelength of the electromagnetic light that you're observing. And we refer to that amount of detail as the angular resolution, which I've denoted here as the Greek letter theta. And the angular resolution of a telescope is just the ratio of the observing wavelengths, lambda, I've called it here, 
and the diameter of your collecting mirror. So to give you an example of what kind of angular resolution the telescope will give you, if you're observing in the optical and you're observing uh, radiation with a wavelength of 500 nanometers, that's 500 billionths of a meter or half a micron, then you can get an angular resolution of one second of arc, which is one 3,600th of a degree, um, with a, a diameter, a mirror or a lens, that's a diameter of 10 centimeters. Now to achieve that same kind of resolution in the radio, where a typical wavelength might be five centimeters, you would need a mirror diameter of 10 kilometers. So in that case, how do we, how do we see fine detail on the sky with a radio telescope? Because it, re it really is not possible to make single dish telescopes accurate or not enough or steerable enough to achieve that kind of high resolution. So instead, we use arrays of smaller telescopes and we use a supercomputer to basically focus the signals digitally and simulate a much larger antenna. And um, in this case, the resolution is now given by the distance between the antennas, which we call the baseline length, rather than the uh, antenna diameter. And so bear in mind that all the radio images you will see today have been, have been obtained using this technique. It's called interferometry. And they've been processed in a way that now our human eye can see and that our brains can understand. So let's dive into the results of the image contest. And I'm going to go through these in reverse order. So I'm going to start with third place. Then we'll do second and first places. And then I will go and, and describe the images that obtained an honorable mention. So the third prize goes to Marie-Lou Gendron Marcelet and Chat Hull for a composite VLA and Sloan Digital Sky Survey image showing radio jets from the galaxy NGC 1272 in the Perseus cluster. Now the Perseus cluster is a cluster of several hundred galaxies located around 250 million light years from Earth. And in the optical background image here from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there you can see two bright, massive elliptical galaxies that really stand out. There's NGC 1275, which is at the center left, and NGC 1272, which is closer to the middle. And like many galaxies, NGC 1272 hides a powerful, supermassive black hole in its center. And this black hole acts as an engine powering jets of relativistic particles that propagate beyond the galaxy. Those particles spiral in the magnetic field between the galaxies and produce radio emission that then is detected by the VLA. And that is shown in red in this image. That radio emission can also be used to reveal the dynamics of the cluster and astronomers are actually investigating whether the particular shape of the radio emission um, from NGC 1272 is a result of that galaxy moving through the Perseus cluster or whether it's caused by particle diffusion in the superheated plasma that lies between the galaxies in the cluster. So that was third prize. Let's move on to the second prize. Second prize goes to Jayanne English, who provided a composite VLA and Hubble Space Telescope image revealing the extended magnetic field of the galaxy NGC 5775. NGC 5775 is an edge-on spiral galaxy in the Virgo galaxy cluster. And the fact that it's almost exactly edge-on provides a kind of unique unobstructed view of the areas above and below the spiral disk. Within the disk of the galaxy, the optical data from the Hubble Space Telescope show bubbles of hot ionized gas produced by newly born stars. And in those bubbles uh, created uh, really fast moving charged particles called cosmic rays. And they're transported away, emitting radio waves in the process and forming a so-called radio continuum halo that's shown here as a faint ghostly blue-gray glow. Now, if those cosmic rays interact with magnetic fields, they produce a special kind of radio emission that then traces the magnetic field structure. 
and the field lines start off parallel to the disk and curve away until they're vertical. In the uppermost region of, uh, of the uh, extended feature, um, you can see features that go as high as 26,000 light years away from the disk of the galaxy. And so radio observations of NGC 5775 and other galaxies are being used to understand the origins of magnetic fields in disk galaxies and how they influence the characteristics of spiral galaxies over time. So that was second place. Let's talk about the first place now. The so first prize goes to Gian Andrea Incingolo for a video combining VLA radio observations and computer simulations of collisions of clusters of galaxies. Now the video here has a soundtrack of data sonification, so I'm going to say just a few words about it before I start playing the video. Um, so some of the most energetic events in the universe are the collisions between clusters of galaxies, which force colossal amounts of intergalactic hot gas to mix. And these collisions take place on timescales of billions of years and generate shockwaves several million light years in extent. And this video show how sophisticated computer simulations can be used to understand the resulting radio emission from the hot gas, known as radio relics, which is then detected by the VLA. Both the radio observations and the simulations help improve our understanding of how such cosmic structures form and evolve. So let me now play the video. Or is our first place winner. So now I'd like to uh, mention four images that obtained honorable mentions. Ooh. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so the first honorable mention is for Yelena Stein for an image combining data from the VLA, the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Ceratololo International Observatory, revealing the magnetic field of the Starburst Galaxy NGC 4666. So the spiral galaxy NGC 4666 produces many more stars than our own Milky Way galaxy, and this kind of a galaxy is known as a starburst galaxy. And the high rate of star formation results in charged particles, dust, and gas being ejected from the disk of the galaxy and cause the galaxy's magnetic field to stretch into its upper atmosphere, called the halo. In this image, the optical view of the galaxy has been overlaid with the magnetic field lines derived from the radio emission detected by the VLA in green. Strong and extended magnetic fields are observed in other starbursting spiral galaxies as well, but because NGC 4666 is relatively nearby, it really provides us with a nice detailed view. It's also kind of special because besides the Milky Way, it is the only galaxy where scientists have found a changing direction of magnetic fields within the disk. No, that's not what 
So here we are. The second honourable mention goes to Chris Merkel for a set of animated GIFs of the rotating Jupiter as seen with the VLA, the Hubble Space Telescope and ALMA, revealing features at different depths inside the planet's atmosphere. Now, it turns out that radio telescopes are extremely important for planetary scientists because the radio waves are basically blind to surface clouds and therefore they can see many tens of miles deeper into the atmosphere of gas giants like Jupiter than you can see in the optical or the infrared. Um, so the image of Jupiter that's on the left was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope and shows the alternating pattern of zones and belts on the planet with storms ranging in size from the great red spot to smaller storms all over the planet. But really the secret of these storms lie hidden lower down in Jupiter's atmosphere. And the VLA and the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array open a window into the planet, revealing the subcloud atmosphere. And if you can recognize features on all three images, it means that these storms must originate somewhere very deep in the planet's atmosphere. And so these images hold clues for understanding what causes storms, not only on Jupiter, but on other planets like the Earth as well. The third honorable mention goes to Kamlesh Rajpurohit for a detailed image of the toothbrush radio relic. And this radio relic actually appeared in the video that won first place as well. And just to remind you, relics are regions of superheated plasma that trace shock waves that form as a result of clusters of galaxies merging. The radio emission originates from particles uh, being accelerated in the presence of magnetic fields, uh, which is then detected by the VLA. And so you can see filaments here that's been revealed by the VLA, and they're most likely caused by the distribution of the magnetic field in the outer parts of the cluster, and also probably projection effects along our line of sight. And these radio data help astronomers understand particle acceleration mechanisms, and also the strength of the cosmic magnetic fields and their possible origins. And the last honorable mention is for Melina Thévenot for an image combining data from the VLA and NASA's WISE orbiting infrared telescope, showing a variety of phenomena in a section of the Milky Way galaxy. And so in this image, the infrared emission is shown as, the, as a colored image in the background. And the VLA data from the VLA Galactic Plane Survey are shown in, an, in a violet overlay. And it shows part of the Milky Way in the constellation of Scutum. You can see three large bubbles of radio emission, and those are supernova remnants. And the brightest point-like source in the VLA data below the galactic plane at centre right is a pulsar, which is a very fast spinning neutron star. Um, the difference between the radio and infrared views really demonstrates the unique contribution made by the VLA um, to understanding the complexities of our galaxy. So those are all the images I have to show you today, and you can explore them all further at your leisure by visiting the website posted here and find out more about each of the images at that website. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Claire. That was awesome. The sonification of data was really cool, actually. Um, so we don't actually have any questions. Um, uh, I think our only question is, can we post the link somewhere? And I believe you can find the link to all the winning images in the chat. Um, Susie posted it, but I can post it again. Um, definitely worth a check out. Um, let me just repost these. Um, but if you guys have any other questions about imaging or the win winning images, now's your time to ask. Um, right after this, we will have another virtual tour with Tyler and Montana. Oh, this is a very good question because this is a not as simple as you'd think answer. Um, how long does it take to create an image? 
And I think that, I, I think what they're asking is probably more like in general, a radio astronomy image, not necessarily the ones for this contest. Right, so it depends very much on what, exactly what the image is going to be yeah. of. But Amy mentioned this earlier, um, for making images of the VLA Sky Survey, for example, it can take a couple of days to calibrate the data that we get from the VLA, and then it can take another day or so to convert um, those calibrated data into an image. And sometimes it can take much more. If you, we've, we've already heard today about the impact of interference and sometimes we have to go into the data in a lot of detail and try and take out the interference that's come from cell phones or satellites and that can take longer. I will say from experience at Alma, um, imaging can be anywhere from, sometimes it'll take me less than an hour to make an image and sometimes it will take me a month of running on a dedicated node because Alma has these mosaic setups. So it's a very non-trivial and smart question actually. And mm -hmm. a lot of people spend their careers thinking about it. Um, and then related to the um, contest, how many entries were there and from where, as in what countries, what parts of the world? Um, so there were 19 total entries and they were submitted from all over the world. Um, some of those images that I showed you for, came from people in Germany, uh, France, um, Italy. The, the winning uh, video was actually from a group from the University of Bologna in Italy and also from Chile and the United States. Very cool. And then um, how uh, do the colors used within these images indicate actual data or is the color choice aesthetic? And I think that kind of ties into a question we had at the very beginning of the day, which had to do with these false color images and is the choice of color arbitrary or is it selected for a specific reason? So I don't know if you could speak to that in general. It's largely arbitrary. So the various um, software packages that we use for processing the data and for visualizing the data usually come with a, a set of different color palettes that we can choose from. Um, because radio data themselves, you know, our eyes are not sensitive to radio, radio waves. So we have to basically convert a, a set of numbers into something that, that our eyes can understand. And so um, as, as a scientist, you will probably choose a particular color palette that makes the most sense to you and that can that you can you, you feel brings out the particular uh, scientific aspect of the image that you're trying to trying to display. I will say there are, I think, some uh, choices like uh, hydrogen alpha is a lot of times put in that pinky color. So there's certain things that will have a color associated with them, but it's definitely not scientific. It's just kind of people got in the habit and then... Well, in that particular case, Melissa... Well, um, yeah, that, sure. that, The H alpha is, is um, in the optical. Right. And so, because that's what the, that is... Part but of I mean, spectrum, even with false that color... That our eyes are, are used yeah. to. Yeah. And it's actually in the red part of the spectrum. And so, giving that a red color is, is, is actually more physical than many other ways of, uh, of displaying it. Okay. But in the radio, because our eyes are not sensitive to, <laughs> to radio waves, we kind of have to make something yeah. up so that we can, we can understand what that image is telling us. Like listening to dog whistles. You can't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. Um, is this like stacking images of astrophotography uh, in the visible to the human eye part of the spectrum or is the way the contest, contest entries were made completely different? Um, I am not so familiar with stacking images in, of astrophotography, but I think that a lot of the different, um, a, well, a lot of groups use different processes when they were coming up with these images. So typically, if you were going to, you know, take an optical image in the background, which you, you will notice a lot of the images had a, an optical background because that's that's a really good reference for, for most, most humans. <laughs> We're used to seeing the, the, the sky in the optical. Um, and so they would take that optical image just as the optical um, image was presented and then take a, a transparent 
image of the, of the radio data and overlay it so that you could actually see one through the other so, to, so that you could register. Um, but different groups did different things. And the video was obviously uh, something very different and they were actually doing three-dimensional uh, simulations that, that then had to be projected into the 2D space of the video and then mapped onto what the radio looked like. So there was a range of different techniques that we saw. And I think for our last question, um, uh, there's actually a follow-up on that first place video, which is, um, does the sonification, it is very cool, but does it have any scientific meaning? So we did not receive any information about the sonification. I think the only information that we knew to realize that it was the sonification was at the very last frame of the video there, which said that the data sonification was, was what, the, the, what we were hearing. Um, but beyond that, I actually don't know what the, how it was done or what it was um, representing. Awesome. All right, well, I think we do have some more questions, but I think I'm gonna end it here just so people have time to take a break if uh, before the next tour. Um, thank you so much, Claire, for sharing the results with us and for answering some questions. You're welcome. And thank you everybody for sticking around and hearing all of our awesome guest speakers. Um, it was really fun to hear all of your questions and to talk with all the speakers. Um, we're going to have one final tour of the day with Faith, Tyler, and Montana starting in three minutes. Um, so once again, if you need to stretch or get a snack, now's the time to do so um, and hang around. If you saw the talk or the tour in the morning and you'll be heading out, it was a pleasure to have you. Um, and I'll see you guys in a few minutes for the tour.
What's up, everybody? We are back for the last tour of the day. Thank you for sticking with us, uh, especially if you've been here since the morning. Uh, this is awesome. 218, 215 people still on. That's pretty cool. Um, Faith, if you want to go through the, uh, the couple housekeeping things first, um, then we can go through the tour. Hello, everyone. So my name is Faith Vowler. I'm the education specialist coming at you today here from Socorro, New Mexico. And also with us today, we have uh, Tyler Cohen, one of our tour guides. And we have Montana Williams, another one of our tour guides. And um, so Montana, feel free to turn on your screen. Oh, I think for some reason the screen share came undone. My bad. Here we go. And um, and then we also have uh, our operator, Sylvia, who will be joining us for later today. And so, um, well, so thank you so much for being here today. Actually, October 10th, 2020 is the VLA's 40th birthday. So 40 years ago on this date in 1980 was when we first dedicated the very large array and when it was officially open. And we've come a long way since then. And so Tyler's going to tell you a lot more details about uh, the VLA and how it works in a few moments. But first of all, some housekeeping things to get out of the way. So this webinar is going to last about an hour. And uh, for the, if you have any questions that you want to ask us throughout, we'll be doing a few Q&A uh, sessions at different times. We'll do one about any questions you may have about what Tyler talks about. And then we'll be doing a second Q&A session for uh, Sylvia, our operator. And so please submit your questions into the Q&A feature. Uh, we are going to be using the chat and um, throughout. And so we want to make sure that uh, your questions don't get buried in there. We're going to be posting links for things that uh, we'll have several websites throughout the presentation. And so we'll be posting the links in the chat and we don't want your questions to get buried. So please put them in the Q&A feature. And if you see that the question you want to have, ask has already been asked by somebody else, instead of resubmitting the same question another time, please uh, just uh, upvote the question. And that way uh, it'll go higher up in the Q&A and we'll be able to see uh, which questions have a lot of people who want to ask them and we'll be able to prioritize those. So please um, primarily use, if you have a comment rather than a question, that can go in the chat feature. And um, also if you are having any technical difficulties that you can't hear us or anything like that, you can put that in the chat feature as well. So we also have a poll that we want to ask you that will um, be popping up momentarily. So we want to know who uh, uh, here has visited the VLA before and who is not, and also where you're coming from today, what part of the world. So we'll give it a few uh, seconds to answer that. And as um, that poll continues to fill up, then, um, oops, there we go, sorry. Um, and so you can see, here's what the bottom of your Zoom window looks like. So the chat um, shows you where the chat and the Q&A are if you want to use those. Uh, here we go. And we'll, while we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can, it's pretty likely that we're not going to be able to answer all of them. And so if, you're, if you ask a question and it doesn't get answered during the tour, what you can do instead is go to our website and use our Ask an Astronomer feature. And so there's a whole list of archives of many other questions that people have asked before. So you can search the archives, see if your question's in there. And if it's not, then you can submit a new question and the answer to that question will be posted most likely within uh, 72 hours. And um, then 
we are going to, at a few different times during this presentation, hopefully if technology works out okay, we will be uh, showing you some videos from our VLA Explorer on our website. So this is a whole series of videos that are usually just a few minutes long that talk more about a lot of different features of the VLA. And um, so Montana ha uh, will post that in the chat. And um, so we're not going to have the chance to show you all of those VLA Explorer videos. So the link is there for if you would like to go check it out on your own. All right, so now we will end the poll here. So it looks like we've had, we have about 70% of people who have never been to the VLA before. So uh, that's great. And if you ever get, do get the chance to visit us, hopefully visit us sometime uh, in the future, once COVID is behind us, then we look forward to having you. And uh, for those of you who have visited before, welcome back virtually. Looks like we have a lot of people coming from North America today, but then we also have some folks from Europe and South America and uh, the Oceania region. So thanks so much for coming. So now I am going to hand this over to Tyler. Thanks, Faith. Wow, a lot of good questions in the chat already. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is the second tour of the day. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about has been talked about um, over the course of the day. But uh, if you're joining, if you've joined us late or you caught the tail end of some of the talks, this might give a little context to that. Um, so here at the VLA, astronomers are interested in studying radio frequency light from space. Uh, throughout this discussion and, and probably throughout, you know, if you've been here throughout the day, you've heard the word frequency a lot. Frequency is the word that astronomers use to refer to the energy that light has. High frequency means high energy. Ultraviolet light, the kind that comes from the sun and can give you skin cancer, it's high frequency, it's high energy. Radio frequency light, the kind we look at here at the VLA is low frequency, it's low energy. In fact, it is so low energy that if you were to add up all of the energy of the radio light collected by the VLA since it began taking data 40 years ago in 1980, it would amount to less than that of a snowflake hitting the ground. I'm not making that up, I've done the math. It is absolutely true. So low energy, but contains a wealth of information. And for thousands of years, humans only had access to a narrow range of full spectrum of energies that light can have. You know, we look only at visible light, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet with our puny human eyeballs. If you make the analogy between sound waves and electromagnetic light waves, um, you know, the, the, the range of frequencies um, on a standard piano keyboard in a single octave is, is comparable to the range of frequencies that are visible to the human eye, visible light. Um, and so, so the light that we can see with our eyes, if that takes up one octave on a piano keyboard, the entire spectrum of energies, of frequencies that light can have would fill more than 50 octaves on the piano keyboards, just to give you an idea of how limited our vision is. Um, in the scheme of you know what what is exists to be discovered and what is emitting light in the universe, um, and it wasn't until the early 20th century that the first radio astronomers began to understand this huge window onto the universe previously beyond our vision. So that's what the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, or NRAO, was established in 1956 to do: was to open our eyes to the lowest frequencies, the lowest energies of light that we couldn't see without radio telescopes. So the NRAO consists of three radio observatories. Obviously, one of them is our beloved VLA. Happy birthday, VLA. Our Southern Hemisphere sister observatory is called the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA. It's not ALMA. Go back. It'll catch up with me. Made up of 66 radio dishes located in the high desert of Chile, Alma picks up where the VLA leaves off, both in its coverage of the southern sky and in frequency coverage. 
while the VLA can observe light with frequencies of about 1 to 50 gigahertz, ALMA can observe radio light from 85 gigahertz to almost 1,000 gigahertz. Now, the third observatory that comprises the National Radio Astronomy Observatory is the Very Long Baseline Array, or VLBA, 10 VLA-sized dishes that span the North American continent from Hawaii to St. Croix and the Virgin Islands. And there is a lag for this presentation. There we go, that's the very long baseline array. Hawaii to St. Croix and the Virgin Islands. New Mexico is the only state to host two of them. We've got one in Pie Town, just west of the VLA and another one up north uh, in Los Alamos. But let's give the VLA the attention it deserves on its birthday. So why are we here? Why build one of the world's premier telescopes in the middle of the desert? Well, the plains of San Augustine were specifically chosen as the site of the VLA for a few reasons. Population density here is relatively low, which means fewer sources of radio frequency interference, which are unwanted radio rays from terrestrial sources like cell towers, Bluetooth and radar, or from other technology like satellites. And we're shielded by the surrounding mountains. Now, of course, we still have to contend with the, the radio world that we live in. You know, there's cell tower on the hills that's uh, just uh, above Magdalena. And people drive by on Route 60 with Bluetooth turned on in their cars, but there are far fewer sources of interference uh, out on the plains of San Augustine than if we were to build our array near a city like, say, Albuquerque. Um, also, the plains here are relatively flat. We are, after all, situated in a prehistoric lake bed, which makes it really easy to move your radio dishes to different locations, which is exactly what we do here. Now, while this wasn't a consideration when the VLA was first built, it's also a relatively arid environment and the lack of moisture in the atmosphere is great for high frequency observations where water molecules can actually change the path that light takes on its way to our telescopes. Now, the VLA wasn't originally designed to go up to these frequencies, but it turned out to be a great thing that we are in a dry climate here um, for those higher frequency observations. Now, the VLA began construction in 1972 and was completed uh, and began taking data in October of 1980. Yes, the VLA turns 40 years old this month. In the early 2000s, the VLA was in desperate need of an upgrade. In 2001, we received money from the National Science Foundation to upgrade the VLA to what we now call the expanded VLA or EVLA. The waveguides that carry the signal from the antennas to our correlating supercomputer were replaced with fiber optics and the correlator itself was upgraded. Uh, this expanded the computing power, expanded the bandwidth that we were capable of processing at, at a given time. And this was completed in 2012, and the telescope was rededicated for one of the founders of radio astronomy, Carl G. Jansky. Now, Dave Finley gave a much more detailed history of the VLA and its contributions to radio astronomy this morning, and that talk will be available on our Vimeo page in the next uh, couple weeks. And now astronomers at NRIO are looking forward to what's next for the VLA. And we are very excited about the prospect of a next generation VLA or NGVLA. It's a proposed instrument for which we received research and development funding from the National Science Foundation that has the potential to revolutionize the field of radio astronomy. This instrument would be comprised of over 200 stationary 18 meter dishes spread across the state of New Mexico and potentially into Arizona, Texas, and Mexico. It would almost double our frequency coverage and offer greater sensitivity to faint astronomical sources than any other radio telescope on the planet. Suffice to say, we're very excited and we will find out if the project will be funded sometime next year. Now, if it is funded, construction would begin around 2025 and be completed in 2034. And if you wanna learn more about the next big thing in radio astronomy, you should check out the recording of Rob Salina's talk from earlier in the day, which will also be available online if you missed it. Now the VLA is made up of 28 radio dishes that are 25 meters across and weigh over 200 tons each. These dishes are laid out in a Y configuration at discrete locations along over 80 miles of railroad track, which allows us to move the dishes to different locations. Now, there are four main configurations that the dishes can be placed into. In the D configuration, the dishes are darn close together. On presentation, there we go. D for darn close together. In this configuration, the furthest dish is only about a mile from the center of the array. 
and the next widest configuration is C, then B, and then A, where the dishes are A, long way away. In a configuration, the east and west arms are 13 miles long and the north arm is 11 miles long. Why are they different sizes? Well, there's a ravine at the top of the north arm that was too difficult to build over, so that's where it stops. And right now we are in the B configuration. For the next five years, we will have a special fifth configuration, which is a hybrid of the B and A configurations and which we will move into at the end of this month. We call it B North A. The east and west arms are in the B configuration while the north arm is in the A configuration, which gives us increased sensitivity toward the galactic plane on the southern horizon for a special project called the VLA Sky Survey or VLAS. This is a project to map the entire radio sky visible to the VLA at frequencies from two to three gigahertz in order to provide the astronomy community with a catalog of radio sources studies of the sky across the light spectrum. Now, if you visit the VLAS website, uh, which is right here, you can also post that in the chat. If you visit the VLAS website, you can view the regions of the sky that they've mapped so far. Now, Amy Kimball gave a great talk about VLAS earlier, and that'll be online as well if you want to know more. Now, before we added this hybrid configuration, we would normally change between configurations every four months so that each configuration would fall on a different part of the year every year, giving VLA users access to the greatest variety of targets. Now, depending on weather conditions, the current configuration, changing between configurations can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. In order to change between configurations, we have two big red diesel engines which have hydraulics to lift the antennas and move them at a blistering two miles per hour to carry them to their new location. They have to move slowly because the antennae are not bolted down during the move and the dishes can act as sails if wind speeds get too high. And we don't want to find our antenna tumbling across Route 60. So here's project scientist for the EVLA, Rick Purley, to explain a little bit more about the transporters. So now we're gonna go up into the end. So every four months, the array is reconfigured, which means that which uh, uh, transporters are used to pick up some of the antennas and move them to different pads. This is one of our two transporters. It's a unique machine. It uh, comprises four trucks of six wheels each. I'll explain in a moment how we actually turn corners with this. The basic idea of this, of this machine is pretty straightforward. You see the flat deck on there. The uh, transporter moves down the rails, slides underneath the antenna. Uh, the antenna is then unbolted from the uh, three concrete piers on which it normally sits. The transporter is raised up on hydraulic jacks, lifting the antenna up about six inches, enough to clear the bolts. And the transporter then backs up and takes the antenna to the main line. Now the way the antenna transporter turns a corner is quite unusual for a rail vehicle. The engineers invented this right angled turning system, uh, which uh, works in the following way. The transporter moves over the main line, and this is the main line heading down, uh, say, towards the center of the array. It's a double track. The transporter uh, trucks are each over the four intersections of the two uh, double tracks. A hydraulic jack lifts up one side of the transporter, three or four inches, just enough to clear the flanges of the, six, of the 12 wheels on one side. The two trucks of six wheels each on that one side are then rotated by 90 degrees and put back down again. The other side uh, of the transporter is then raised two or three inches. The other two trucks are rotated 90 degrees uh, and the whole assembly uh, rolls off in a 90 degree uh, different direction. So the Rick, are you there, Rick? Nope, it's back to you. Oh, was that was that was that the end, of Rick? Yeah, it's back. It's back to you. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah, it was just part of that video. I can't go back. I want to go back. All right, great, thanks. During a change in configuration, we are still observing. We have a rule which we call the three antenna rule, which means we can have as many as three antennae not doing science and still get the quality of data necessary to satisfy our astronomers. Now, the reason we change configurations is because it allows us to change our sensitivity to scale. It may seem counterintuitive, but in the D configuration, we have the lowest resolution and are sensitive to the most diffuse structures, like the woofily lobes of a jet from an active galaxy. And in the A configuration, we have the highest resolution and are sensitive to the supermassive black hole at the center of such a galaxy or the circumstellar disk of gas and dust in an infant solar system. And here at the VLA and at ALMA and the VLA, we are using a combination of smaller discrete dishes to synthesize a telescope bigger than one we could physically engineer. The way that we do that is by combining the data from the individual antennae using our correlating supercomputer. It's a supercomputer in the sense that it can do one thing very, very quickly, and that's multiplication. It can't play Fortnite, but it can do a trillion multiplications per second. And the way that it does this is by multiplying the signal from antenna one by the signal from antenna two, and the signal from antenna one by the signal from antenna three, four, five, six, all the way up to 27, and the signal from antenna two by the signal from antenna three, and four, five, six, all the way, you get it, so on and so forth. And that gives us 351 pairs of antennae that we call baselines. These baselines are what allow us to reconstruct an image of the sky as if we had a single 20 meter, uh, excuse me, 20 mile diameter telescope. Now, each VLA dish contains eight receivers at the vertex, which cover the frequency range from one to 50 gigahertz and two feed systems just below the prime focus on the apex of the antenna, which cover the really low frequencies from 58 megahertz to 470 megahertz. Now, each of the receivers at the uh, apex of the antenna has a feed horn to go along with it. And uh, I meant to show this on the earlier tour, but I forgot to, I have, a VLA feed horn here with me. Um, Dan Mertley, if you're watching, I promise I'm still using this for something. Actually, I'm not just holding on to it as a cool paperweight. Um, but this is really what we mean when we say antenna, when we talk about the VLA. Um, the dish is not so much of an antenna as this is really an antenna. And perhaps if I hold it close enough, you can see down here at the very bottom of this, there is a little needle and that is really the antenna. This is what couples the electromagnetic radiation that we are receiving from space to an actual transmission line, to an actual uh, uh, current in a waveguide or, uh, or in a fiber optic cable. Um, and these have to be designed very carefully because you don't want to be collecting radiation from unintended directions um, that can increase your sensitivity to RFI. Um, but, but those are a very vital component of the uh, observing system. And here is Rick Perley to tell us a little bit more about uh, the VLA receivers. Now we're going to go up into the antenna surface. It's, I've done that so many times, it's second nature. So in a cone to go. Nothing more that needs to be done for safety. And up we go. I've done that so many times, it's second nature. So this is a 25 meter paraboloid, and the paraboloid works the same way for all. The radiation comes in from the direction of the antenna is pointing, strikes the surface. In this case, it runs up to that subreflector, that conical shaped uh, asymmetric subreflector. And from there, the radiation is, is down in a cone to go in one of the eight feeds. We change our frequency by rotating the subreflector. So these feeds are not on the optical axis of the antenna, but they're arranged around a ring called the feed ring. 
and we can illuminate any one of them at a time. So that's the reason why we normally can observe only in one wave band or one receiver band at a time. So the eight horns that you can see there, you can see they're all different sizes. The larger the size, the longer the wavelength. So the big one is what we call L band, one to two gigahertz. That's 30 to 15 centimeters radiation, which goes into that horn by appropriate rotation of that subreflector. If we're interested in two to four gigahertz radiation, then the subreflector is rotated by 180 degrees and the radiation goes down that second largest feed horn called S band. And so on and so forth with the other six receiver bands by appropriate rotation of the subreflector, the radiation from the direction we're interested in will go down through the, through the horn and into the receivers. Each of these horns is covered with this white window material. This is for weather purposes. We don't, it's not necessary for the function of the horn. This is to keep rain and snow and dew bird droppings and everything else out of these horns. There's a little bit of loss associated with that, uh, but that's just something you have, to, you have to accept. The funny inverted shape objects that are above the smaller horns are all heat lamps. We don't want dew or frost forming on the surfaces, especially at the higher frequencies or the shorter wavelengths. So when the dew point and the temperature are close together and sufficiently low for, for us to determine that dew is forming, the computer recognizes these combination of conditions, turns on these heat lamps, which warms up the surface and prevents frost and dew from, from uh, condensing on top of these weather windows. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, somebody said in the chat that they couldn't see the antenna when I was holding it up. Maybe that's because we're in presentation mode and my, uh, my actual video panel is small. So I'll show it again in the Q&A uh, session. Um, All righty. So you might be wondering who can use this incredible telescope. So if you don't mind, take a moment to fill out uh, a quick poll on who it is you think can use the VLA. Have the results of the poll? No. So, do you think that you are eligible to observe with the VLA if you want to? The yeses are correct. You can. No joke. This is a taxpayer funded observatory, which means that anybody with any background in any country in the world can use the VLA. You just have to write a proposal. There's always a catch. You have to write a proposal where you demonstrate that you understand the capabilities of this instrument and the science that you want to do with the VLA uh, and that the science that you want to do has the potential to benefit the scientific community and advance our understanding of the universe. A panel of NRAO scientists review all of the proposals. I think it's twice a year for the VLA and once a year for the VLBA and award telescope time based on the merit of the proposals. And we've awarded high school students observing time with the VLA and every summer we have undergraduate college student interns. We're given directors discretionary time on both the VLA and VLBA. So you do not have to be a tenured professor in order to use the, and we typically oversubscribe the telescope because we don't want any downtime. 
So we'll, we'll award around four times the amount of telescope time that we actually have available. Now proposals are given a ranking where A priority is the highest and means we'll try as hard as we can to run your observation. And the lowest C is basically filler time if the conditions are too poor for a high priority or if there's gaps in the schedule. So if you are awarded time on the VLA, you'll then work with one of our data analysts to write a script, which is a set of computer instructions that automatically tells the dishes how to move and when and where. Then our script goes into queue and our schedulers and algorithms arrange the observations based on the time of day, and year, which targets are above the horizon uh, and by the configuration that we're currently in and by weather considerations like wind speed. This is called dynamic scheduling as opposed to fixed scheduling, which we did for roughly the first 30 years of VLA operation, where your observation is scheduled for a specific day at a specific time, and if something goes wrong, you're out of luck. But ultimately, the operators make the final decision on which observations get run, and you'll get a chance to ask Sylvia, one of our operators, questions in a few minutes. Once your data is taken, within minutes, it's sent to our offices in Socorro. Where it's checked by our data analysts who are our last line of defense to ensure that the data is of the highest quality before it gets sent to the astronomers who proposed for it. And once it's sent to the astronomers, they own those data. It's proprietary for one year. And those astronomers can do their analysis and write their journal papers without anyone else seeing. But after that one year, that data goes into a public archive. And it's fair game for anyone who wants to use it. So all of the data ever collected by the VLA that's older than one year is publicly available on our website. So even if you weren't awarded time on the VLA, you can still look in the archives and see if someone in the past observed what you're interested in and maybe they missed something. That's one of the great benefits of publicly funded science. So before we start the operator Q&A, uh, let's take a few minutes to answer some questions um, that you might have from this past presentation. Thanks, Tyler. And um, so one question that we have, and this is definitely one that we get a lot is, um, so the introduction, this person's introduction to the VLA was from watching Contact. And so is there anything during the film, like during the scenes at the VLA that the staff would like to set the record straight on? And the answer is definitely yes. So two uh, big misconceptions that that movie can uh, give you, it's a great movie, but um, for one thing, we don't uh, directly use VLA data here at NRAO for the purpose of SETI research. So we do have an arrangement with um, SETI where they can take data that our antennas receive and use that for their own research. But at the VLA specifically, we are not conducting SETI research. So. Um, our antennas are really good for zooming in on a particular object out in space and taking a really good look at it. When it comes to uh, searching for extraterrestrial life, we don't know where we're going to find that. So to do uh, those kinds of searches, we would want to, uh, telescopes that primarily just scan the sky most of the time, just pointing at lots of different things. Whereas when we use the VLA, the places that we point it, we are, have a specific reason for looking at that object. And then uh, the other major misconception that that gives you is there's the very famous scene where Jodie Foster is wearing those big uh, headphones over her ears because she's listening to the data that they're receiving from space. So we don't listen to the VLA data that we receive, we look at it. In theory, we could listen to it, but in practice, we don't because that's not really the most efficient way to understand the information we're receiving. So we, these dishes receive a radio light from space, and that's a type of light that our eyes are not able to see, as mentioned earlier. And so we instead convert that light into pictures using colors that our eyes are able to see. And so in the same way that the radio in your car converts radio light that it receives from a station into sound, we could do the same thing. But again, we're going to have a much better understanding of the data that we're getting from space if we 
look at it in the form of pictures as opposed to trying to listen to it. Okay, so. Um, Henry, uh, I, I got a good one. Henry Paul Kowalski, any relation to Sylvia? Asks, uh, again, did I see a J-pole antenna above the dish? What is its purpose? Um, that's a great question and an excellent buy, Henry. Uh, yes, so there are eight receivers um, at the vertex of the antennas, but we also have two feed systems uh, just below the prime focus um, underneath the uh, apex of the antennas where the fork arms meet. Um, we have our low frequency feed systems up there. Um, so I said before that the VLA goes from one to 50 gigahertz, but actually we can go a little bit lower than that. We can go down to uh, about 50 megahertz. Um, and so that's what, there's actually two feed systems there. There's that edge fed, uh, an end fed J pole feed system, which kind of goes around the, the corners of the fork arms. Um, and there's also just below the uh, secondary reflector, uh, which is underneath the fork arms, there is a, uh, a center fed dipole there as well. And so those are the two, uh, those are the two feed systems that, um, that we use to observe from uh, 50 to about 450 megahertz. And then another good question that we have where I'm going to save part of it um, until when we get into our operator Q&A, but to start on it now, so it's what kind of background do you need to understand how the VLA works? And that honestly depends on um, like what you're doing at the VLA as an employee, because we have people who work in all sorts of different areas. We have our cryogenics experts who like worry about the stuff that we put inside the antennas to keep the receivers cool. We have our electronics experts. We have the mechanics who uh, service the antennas and care, move, we have the track crew who moves the antennas up and down these railways, railways into the different configurations. We of course have the astronomers who do research. We have uh, the education folks like us and we need to, we don't have to have necessarily huge in-depth uh, ideas of a lot of things, but we need to have a general idea of many different aspects of the VLA. And then when we get into our Q&A session with, our, with Sylvia, then she can tell you the kinds of things that an operator needs to know. Okay. This so is kind of in line with, with uh, oh, uh, there's just another similar question that Andrew asked, uh, which is what types and levels of mathematics does an operator or astronomer at the VLA use on a regular basis? Um, and I can answer this a little bit for myself, but I'm sure Sylvia can answer this uh, as well. And it might be a different set of math skills. Um, I tend to use a lot of linear algebra, definitely a lot of statistics, really. Uh, if you're doing any kind of astronomy, you have to have a very, very, um, very strong command of uh, statistics concepts because that's what allows you to understand. I mean, the, the fundamentals of radio astronomy are based on um, principles in statistics, um, you know, things about probability distributions and and central limit theorem and things like that are fundamental to the, the fact that radio astronomy even works at all. Um, so maybe, maybe Sylvia has uh, some, some different answers to that, but I would say, at least for myself, certainly linear algebra and statistics. Okay, so with, um, yeah, with, I think with the rest of the questions we have, we can um, continue those into the operator Q&A. So now we are going to welcome our operator on duty, Sylvia Kowalski. So the operators out at the site do a lot of different things. And also, Sylvia, you're welcome to come on camera and say hi whenever you're ready to. So. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Faith. <laughs> I forgot that we were using that picture of me wearing an antenna hat. I really like it. <laughs> um, hello, world. Thank you so much for coming to celebrate the uh, 40th birthday of the VLA. Okay, go ahead, Faith. Yeah, so um, the operators, uh, as you can see here, they have a lot of different computers they have to monitor. Actually, I have um, another video I can show you that uh, shows the control room. So 
Bear with me just a second here. Luckily, the videos have been working better. The very large array is controlled from here in this room on the top floor of the back of the control building. As a radio telescope, the VLA works night and day. The array averages 5,000 hours of observing every year with maintenance and reconfiguration scheduled in between. All activities are directed, controlled, and monitored by staff in this control room. All right, so now back to our presentation here. Yes, yeah, so among so the, the operators are pretty much the VIPs when it comes to being on site because they kind of act as the site managers in a lot of different ways. So during our weekdays, we frequently have our antenna crews going out onto the antennas to perform maintenance on them. And when they're doing that, they have to coordinate with the operators before, during, and after that process. And they also look out for the safety of everybody on site. So if there's, for example, wildlife in places where it shouldn't be, they would call the proper person on site, depending on the time of day to have them come and relocate that wildlife to somewhere safer. <laughs> if there's um, a thunder lightning storm going on, then they'll let everyone know to please come inside for their own safety. If we're going to have a tour group uh, on our site, obviously during non-COVID times, we let the operators know about that. And um, we have security on site um, every day. And so the guards also coordinate with the operators as well. So they are very important people. And so we have somebody on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 363 days a year, or since this is a leap year, 364 days, all of the operators get Thanksgiving and Christmas off. So, right. <laughs> But then we do have somebody present um, at all times. So the day out at the site is split into three different eight hour shifts. There's the day shift of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., the evening shift of 4 p.m. to midnight, and the graveyard shift of midnight to 8 a.m. And Operators actually start their day here at our office building in Socorro, and then they drive an hour out to the VLA site, work there for eight hours or a little bit more, and then they spend another hour driving back. So they work 10-hour days, which also means that they only have to work four days a week, so they get more days off. So I've gathered that they do that pretty well. And... <laughs> And they generally cycle with who does what shifts, except for there's one fine gentleman out there who always does midnight shifts. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Sam. <laughs> All right, so Sylvia, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Yes, yes, of course. Um, I would love to. Um, also, Faith, I feel like every time I hear your spiel about my job, I like re-remember re something else that I do. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, but yeah, so my background, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, uh, a lot uh, cooler and a lot cloudier than New Mexico. Um, and I was first um, intrigued by astronomy from actually a high school course um, in astronomy that inspired me to pursue um, uh, a bachelor's degree at the University of Washington in astronomy and also physics. So I have a BS in astronomy and physics. Um, but I was and still am a theater nerd. So I also have a bachelor of arts degree in drama. Um, and during my time at the University of Washington, I learned that while I loved um using astronomical data um, to make discoveries, I really, really liked working with the telescopes and the instruments themselves even more. Um, so that's what I decided I wanted my path to explore more the instrumentation and the ingenuity that it takes um, for astronomers to collect this light from space, which really is like one of the only tools that we have to learn about the cosmos. Um, but at the same time, I also discovered while working at a science museum in Seattle, uh, the Pacific Science Center, that I really love science education and outreach. Um, so those have kind of been the two paths that I've been pursuing um, 
since I graduated. Um, I have worked at the VLA for about two and a half years now. Um, I, my official job title is Operations Specialist 2, <laughs> um, but we typically just call ourselves um, telescope operators. Um, like Faith said, our job is really, sometimes really all over the place. Um, it's really very varied. Um, so when we come into work, not only are we rotating between these shifts that can be very different, we really have no idea what's going to happen <laughs> on any given day. And I love that because I love it when my day is really exciting. Um, it could be maybe it's a midnight shift and all of the observations that I pick to run with the current weather conditions run perfectly and I just get to enjoy being a part of this amazing scientific process of learning about the cosmos or maybe it's a maintenance day and there's 50 million people calling me on the phone and the radio and I need to fix things on the telescope with my software and it's simply bananas. <laughs> so um, it really take to be an operator, I would say, we're looking for people who both have an excitement about a technical engineering instrumentation side, but are also really um, comfortable with dealing with a lot of people, managing situations that are maybe high stress, really time sensitive. Um, so that's kind of the skills uh, that we look for in candidates for uh, telescope operators. Awesome, thank you. So now we are going to move into our uh, Q&A with Sylvia. And so um, one of the questions from earlier was, so what kind of um, things do you need to know, like background do you need to have specifically for your job? And then there's also a pretty similar question, just like it can be educational and job background, like special skill sets, just that general thing. Yeah, those are really good questions. So, um, for an operator, a lot of what we're doing, we're monitoring, maybe not during like a maintenance day when we're doing a lot of people management, but uh, maybe it's a shift where we're entirely running science observations for astronomers from around the world. Um, a lot of what we're doing during that type of shift is that we're just, we're monitoring all of the antennas and their subsystems. Um, in order to do that correctly, we one, we have to know have a pretty um, in-depth knowledge of how each of the subsystems of the antenna works so that we can notice if something is going wrong, how it's going wrong, and maybe a potential solution for it. Um, and then we have a toolbox, you know, uh, not a physical toolbox, but an intellectual toolbox um, to solve a portion of these problems. But of course, it's a, if it's a really large problem that arises during a shift, we will probably be calling someone and waking them up at 3 a.m. to help us um, try and figure out, you know, what's going on. Um, but I would say that's one of the main things is understanding the electronics and the hardware of this system. Um, like Tyler said, a a lot of the theory that goes into making radio astronomy work is statistics. So we're using um, a fair amount of basic statistics. Um, and then when we are um, monitoring a lot of this data, we're looking at numbers and we're also looking at graphs. So the ability to read a graph that's expressed in different types of units and understanding enough of the physics and astronomy that's happening to really um, be able to take, you know, this data that we're seeing and kind of understand what could be going right or wrong during that time. Um, like I said, I have a, a bachelor's of science in physics and astronomy. Um, we have a fair amount of operators that also have bachelor's degrees in physics or math um, or astronomy. Uh, we also have some folks who have a background in electronics and engineering. Um, so that's kind of the, the background that we're looking for. Um, and I think there was a, oh, the follow-up question about maybe just some other skills that are important. Um, like I said, our job can sometimes be really chaotic. So having a personality where you're pretty comfortable with things getting really wild and um, staying calm even during chaos, I think is a really important uh, quality. Um, and then also maybe one more thing. <laughs> um, is that I think you have to be really passionate about 
um, what we're doing. Cause there's a lot of things that are strange about our job. You know, we're working all hours of the day. You never know what your day is going to be like. Um, there's a lot of driving involved. Um, so I think a passion for the science and this quest to learn about the universe, I think is really important. And all of our operators have that to such an incredible degree. So it's just an awesome team to work for. Yeah. And then someone asked, is Sylvia both operating the VLA and talking to us right now? See, <laughs> this is an advantage of the virtual format because if we Great were in question. person, the answer would be yes. That is true. <laughs> and, and if, um, and like Faith said, if it was a public tour, I would be talking to you, but every like five minutes, I'd be like, okay, let me just check all my stuff. Okay. Hello. <laughs> let me just check. <laughs> so, um, it is really, I will say it's really nice. I am not the operator on duty right now. Um, it is 421 New Mexico time. So right now we have an afternoon operator is working. I don't know who's operating right now. Hannah was the day shift operator, I think. Whoever's operating the VLA right now, thank you so much. <laughs> um, but no, I'm right now, I'm sitting in an office in our Socorro um, office building right now. Great. And okay, so what would, this is also kind of on a similar note, but what would be the next career steps for someone who's an operator? Like you're an operator now mm. in the future, what kind of careers might you move on to? That is a really good question. Um, it really depends on the person. We have had, <clears throat> excuse me, telescope operators who absolutely love everything that goes into being an operator. And they've worked at the VLA as an operator for over 15, 20 years. Um, there's some people that realize the rotating work shifts and some of the up-down stress, how it's so, so varied is not really their jam, but they're really still interested in working maybe with data um, that comes from the VLA. So we've had people who work for a while as an operator and then maybe shift into a position um, as maybe a data analyst or a scheduler, such as um, uh, Melissa is a data analyst. So working with the data after it's come through the telescopes. Um, I think one benefit of being an operator at any telescope is that you really have a pretty intimate understanding of the instrument so if you want to move around within the observatory you you are coming in with a pretty substantial um, body of knowledge about how this instrument works so um, again it's really up to the operator nice and then related to that how many years do operators typically stay at the vla i'm assuming that, that probably really, varies too. <laughs> it Definitely varies. Though I will say we we tend to see, it's kind of bimodal. We see people who stay like one to two years and then people who stay like five to 20 years. <laughs> so you, you try it out and you either love it or you try it out and you say, that was awesome, but I need something else. <laughs> um, so it's really varied. Um, yeah, again, like like I said, I've, I've been working here for about two and a half years and it's absolutely awesome. Um, we have a couple of operators who've been with us maybe about a year now and then some more than 10 years. Right. Yeah. And then examples of chaos up on the hill during your shift. This is kind of a two-parter, so that's the first one. Like, what's the, So what are some chaotic things that happen during your shift? That's a really good question. So I'd say probably the the most chaotic and things that maybe happen most often are any instances with power. So, you know, if you're in your house and there's like a little power glitch and the lights flicker, but everything comes back on. Um, if you're at the VLA and there's a power glitch like that, a lot of our subsystems, if there is a power glitch where they get turned off and then back on again, they're no longer synchronized with this very, very exact timing that we have to keep. So it can wreak a ton of havoc, even just a little glitch. Um, so things related to power are probably the biggest. Um, <laughs> I've kind of been trained emotionally, even if I'm just in my house and the lights flicker, I get a rush of adrenaline and inside my head I'm thinking, okay, what do I need to fix? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's probably the biggest. Um, and then of course, anything that's related to like an emergency situation, um, as we are, the control room is the only room that has someone in 24 seven. Um, we are in charge of managing both routine situations at the VLA, but also emergency situations, um, like Faith and Tyler said. So anytime we're dealing with 
you know, the health and safety of a person, um, the health and safety of a, a hardware component or antenna, that's really stressful. Um, and that can be really difficult. Um, and then sometimes just really, you know, bizarre things. We had, um, Faith reminded me earlier today, there was a day that was really windy. We had some gusts that were up to about 60 miles per hour. And one of the panels that's covering that main dish came off of the antenna. And that's not something that we'd ever seen before. So every single day at the VLA or night, there's going to be something new that happens. Um, <laughs> That yeah. was a great and I, game. <laughs> it was so bananas. And the picture kind of looked like the antenna had lost a tooth. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was super, super goofy. So yeah, I think those are probably the emergency situations and power are definitely like the wildest. And then um, as like the second part of that question, do you get full 30 minute lunch breaks and 15 minute coffee breaks? <laughs> Oh, that is such a good question. Um, not in the traditional sense where you're like, oh, it's been four hours. I'm going to go take a lunch. Um, we take our breaks and we rest our mind when the VLA is calm. <laughs> so if VLA is not having a good day and there's a lot happening, uh, your day is not very restful. Um, but if it's are calm, that's great. And you can leisurely enjoy your lunch while sitting in front of all of your monitors in the control room. Um, we, we try to ensure that the uh, longest break, so the long amount of time that an operator is away from the control room is four minutes and 59 seconds. So if you gotta go fill up your coffee cup or go to the bathroom, just make sure it's pretty speedy um, and take your you know allotted breaks when things are calm. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, makes sense. And then uh, what's the data rate for uh, the scanning functions? Do you know? Oh, I was, that's such a good question. And I will admit, we look at that and right now I cannot remember the number. <laughs> um, but I will say it really does change depending on the observation. So kind of related to that, uh, one of the components that's going to go into you know, the, the um, data rate and how much data we're storing for each observation is going to be the length of the observation. And that can vary tremendously. So if, let's say, Faith, you were awarded 20 hours of VLA observing time. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you can work with the data analyst to create a script that is either 20 hours long, or you could chunk it up into different amounts of time depending on the science um, that you're doing. Typically, we will observe what are called scheduling blocks, which are either components of an observation or the entirety of an observation. And they typically range from about one to like three hours um, in time. So after that, you know, after that one observation was run, we have to make sure to have the next one queued up and ready to go because at most we want to have one second between the time that one observation ends and the next one begins. We have so much science to get to. We have to be very, very speedy with that. And then someone asked that they have uh, pictures of the control room that we work in. So that's mainly the, the pictures that we have here. So I'll go back a, a couple of slides. So this basically is the control room. This is Sylvia in her natural habitat at work. <laughs> and, yes, I feel at home. <laughs> And then um, from the video too, that was basically, so this, what you're seeing here in these pictures is um, the control room out at the site. Yeah. And then um, a question, we're getting a lot of questions from uh, people named Kowalski today. So yeah. um, I, what kind that of- That is effect, definitely my dad. Hi dad. <laughs> what kind of effect does space junk have on your work? Oh. That's a really good question. Space junk. Well, I would say, at least as an operator, we're more interested in the stuff that humans put up in space that are working. So like, as we've been saying, um, satellites, things that are broadcasting radio light down to earth for all of the things that we need it for, you know, radio stations and entertainment and, and Wi-Fi and cell phone service. Um, those are really 
signal. Those are the buggers because they're blaring this really bright radio light. And we're trying to see through that and see the really, really dim sources of actual cosmic radio light. Um, so for the most part, the, the things that humans make that are still working, that's going to be the big problem. Um, other kind of junk and stuff floating in space. Um, maybe an astronomer wants to study that. That's a great question. Mm. And then um, I think we have time for one more. So is there anyone who's been there since the beginning? And <gasps> that is a great question. Yes. Yes. We have quite a few amazing people who have been with us since the beginning. Um, I feel like we should also give them some sort of mega award today for helping <laughs> VLA get to 40 years, which again, I just, I'm amazed that an instrument you know, because technology is evolving, but we've figured out ways to upgrade our instrument as technology evolves. So I think that's just, you know, a testament to these people who have been here for 40 plus years. They're part of the reason we are able to even celebrate today. Yeah, and it is 40 plus because they didn't just come here right when the VLA was dedicated in 1980. We had to start, we started building it in the 70s. So in terms of how long they would have been here, that's yeah. longer than 40 years. And for some of them, their various yeah. jobs have, have changed, but it's mm -hmm. it definitely is like, meanwhile, I've just been here three years. So <laughs> it's great to hear right. all sorts of really cool, interesting stories from people who have been here uh, for uh, e either the whole time or for a very long time, at least, and all the great stuff they have to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, Faith. Yeah, one of them, actually, one of the people who's been here the whole time was Rick Purley, who was the guy in those uh, vid couple of videos that I showed you early on in the presentation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Faith, I just had one thing that's not really related to anything technical that I just oh, yeah. I forgot to share in the first tour, and I really wanted to. Um, I don't know if other telescope operators experience this, but I dream about the telescopes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes they're like super stress dreams where like I realize that an antenna has fallen over or or the control room has been completely reconfigured and I don't know where any of my monitors are and it's really stressful. Um, but sometimes the dreams are amazing. Like there was this one time <laughs> where I dreamt that I found a 29th antenna somewhere in the woods. <laughs> that is awesome. It was so goofy. So uh, yes, the VLA is very powerful and it infiltrates my mind when I sleep. <laughs> I'd imagine, yeah, the stress dreams would be like kind of in the vein of the, oh my God, I forgot to do my whole work sort of thing. Yes, <laughs> yes it's level of stress. But that's yeah. great that you dream about things like finding a 29th antenna too. I love that. <laughs> it was so goofy. And I think in my dream, I remember thinking, I hope I get a really big raise for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you found a 29th antenna, I think you would deserve one at that point. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much <laughs> awesome all right well that we are um that's the end of our presentation today so everybody who wants to can come back on and say goodbye but thank you so so much for being here today and so if you want more vla we also on our website, we have the webcam that you can look at that shows you live uh, footage from the vla right now and the VLA mission control, which likewise shows you what uh, the VLA is currently observing. And uh, our next virtual tour is going to be in about a month on Saturday, November 7th, and that will be 1 to 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So if you can, please stick around to uh, complete a short survey. And so thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. This has been a great uh, 40th birthday for the VLA. And... Have a good one, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Happy birthday.